The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. For now, folks, you all, last Wednesday night, Clark Gable and Carol Lombard eloped to Kingman, Arizona, and were married. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you the man who held the ladder, Jack Benny. <laughs> Yes, sir. Hello again. This is Cupid's assistant talking. And, Don, I don't know where you got that information about my helping Clark and Carol. But you're right, and I was never so embarrassed in my life. There I was holding the ladder, all dressed up in a tuxedo like a big goof. <laughs> tuxedo, what was the big idea? Well, it's very silly, really. You see, Carol called up and asked me to hurry over because she was going to run away and get married. Yes? Well, I got so darn excited, I thought she meant to me. <laughs> God, when I saw Gable there, I almost fainted. Oh, my, that must have been quite a letdown for you, huh, Jack? Well, it was, but they were awfully nice about it, though. They let me keep the ladder. <laughs> I'm going to grow ivy on it, you know? <laughs> Well, Jack, now, what in the world made you think that Miss uh, Lombard would elope with you anyway? Oh, I don't know, Don. She's always so nice when we meet on the street. And then one time, during a dust storm, she winked at me. <laughs> <laughs> So, what was I to think? Oh, it's too bad, Jack, but you shouldn't jump at conclusions like that. I'll say I shouldn't. On the way over to her house, I tore up all my old phone numbers. <laughs> hmm. Now, if I want a date, I'll have to join the Lonesome Club. <laughs> but as I said before, Don, they were awfully sweet. You know, they even wanted me to go along with them, and... Pardon me. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. It is, eh? Oh, are you still mad at me, boy? Yes, Rochester, I'm not talking to you. Goodbye. Hmm. Can't get around me that easy. Now, what's the trouble, Jack? It's a personal matter, Don. I'd rather not discuss it. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh, uh, you said something about Clark and Carol wanting you to go along with them. Oh, yes. They needed the best man at their wedding, but I couldn't make it. You see, I'm pretty busy right now. I started making my new picture at Paramount. Paramount? Why, that's where you made your last one. I know, Don. Don't act so surprised. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, this is going to be my first legitimate picture. It's called uh, Man About Town. Oh, it's a very clever title. Uh, who's directing it? A fellow by the name of Sandridge, Mark Sandridge. And I'm having a lot of trouble with that guy, too. Jack, you're always having trouble with your directors. What's wrong this time? There's plenty wrong. You see, Don Sandridge directed most of the Astaire Rogers pictures, and he can't get away from that Fred Astaire treatment. It's too much for me. Well, now, what do you mean? Well, he has me jumping over furniture all the time. <laughs> Gee, I'm so tired at night, I can hardly rinse out my socks. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, but I can't imagine that director wanting you to work like Fred Astaire. It must be quite strenuous. You said it. Why, yesterday we shot a scene where I enter an English drawing room to talk to Edward Arnold. See, he plays the part of Lord Arlington. Oh, I see. Well, anyway, instead of just walking up to him and saying hello... Sandwich made me leap over two divans, a love seat, and the Duchess of Twiffledum. <laughs> My goodness. Did you clear everything? All but the Duchess. <laughs> Every time I tried it, I wound up piggyback. <laughs> I tell you, Don, I'm a wreck. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Leaping Lena. How are you? <laughs> there you are, Don. You see, Mary's been over to the studio. She knows. No kidding, Mary. Does Jack really have to do all that jumping? Does he? He's got a kangaroo for a stand-in. <laughs> now, Mary, he's not a real one. That happens to be the man's name, Barney Kangaroo. <laughs> well, he's got an awful big pocket. <laughs> now, you're just being silly. But you know, Don, there's one thing about this picture that is me. I think it's how agile I am. Why well, leap over that furniture just like Fred Astaire? Who couldn't with bed springs on their shoes? Well, I had to have some help. And those springs worked out fine. <laughs> You'll get the Academy Award from the Mercy Bed Company. <laughs> oh, I will. Well, let me tell you something, Don. If I don't break a leg, I think this is going to be my best picture. Oh, I'm glad to hear it, Jack. Uh, who's going to be in it besides yourself? Well, there's Dorothy L'Amour, Edward Arnold, Benny Barnes, E.E. E. Clive, 500 Extras, and Phil Harris. <laughs> By the way, uh, where is Phil? Oh, he'll be here in a little while. No kidding, Jack. Is Phil really going to be in your picture? Yes, I got him a small part. He, 
also hangs up my clothes and sees that they're pressed, you know. <laughs> That'll keep him busy. Those big glove scenes with Dorothy Lamour will keep him busy, too. <laughs> Listen, Mary, uh, Phil may hold Dorothy in his arms, but her heart belongs to Benny. <laughs> Don't worry about me. Say, Mary, how is Phil of the picture? Is he a good actor? I think he's going to be great in it. Great? What a show-off. Somebody told him he had beautiful hips, and he keeps backing into the camera. (laughs) (laughs) He looks like a crawfish with a Marcel. (laughs) Now, let's forget the picture. Oh, hello, Kenny. Hiya, Jack. Say, your shirt tail's sticking out. It is? Where? April Fool! <laughs> Boy, did you fall for that one. Danny, in the first place, yesterday was April Fool's Day, and in the second place, you didn't fool me because my shirt tail is out. Is that your shirt? I thought it was a Chinese newspaper. Well, it has been to the laundry a lot. Danny, I bet you were some cut up yesterday fooling everybody and carrying on like mad, huh? I'll say... Gee, I sure pulled a good April Fool gag on my girl. She falls for anything. What'd you do, Kenny? Well, I called her up and I said, uh, this is Robert Taylor speaking. Will you marry me? That's cute. What'd your girl say? She said, yes, just as soon as I get rid of that cluck I'm going with. <laughs> well, you certainly fooled her, all right. You ought to hear the gag I pulled on my boss, Mervyn Leroy. I sent him a bomb. <laughs> you sent him a bomb? Did he get it? Oh, I think so. I can't find him. <laughs> Why, Kenny, you're just making that up because I saw Mervyn Leroy on the street this afternoon. All of them? (laughs) Yes, all of them. Now, let's forget about April Fool's Day because it's over and done with. How about singing your song? Okay, I'm ready. Hold it a minute, Kenny. Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. Uh, Take it, Mary. Here you are, boy. Here's a tip for you. A tip? Yes. Hi-ho, nickel! (laughs) Fresh guy. Don't believe him, folks. It was a quarter. Must be cheap material. It shrunk. Never mind that. Who's the wire from? Oh, look, Jack. It's from Fred Allen. Oh, that Mongolian? What's he got to say? Uh, dear Screwball. Hmm. Understand you are starting a new picture called Man About Town. If you're the man, get out of town before it's released, my dear. <laughs> oh, he would have to put his two cents in. <laughs> That's a hot one. Sing your song, Kenny, or I'll put you back in the trunk. <laughs> That Allen's going too far. There we go. That was a little old hot dog stand sung by Kenny Baker. And very good, Kenny. I enjoyed it immensely. You're not the only one, sweetheart. (laughs) Modest little devil. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a rare treat in store for you. Mr. Don Wilson, that eminent American author, has written another... I can't get over that wire from Allen. You know, Don, that guy's got a lot of nerve taking up my time with those cheap gags of his. I agree with you, Jack. Did you hear him Wednesday night? Yes, him and that Maxwell Strauss stuff. He's about as clever as Simple Simon. Well, I think it's marvelous the way Fred makes up his gags as he goes along. Oh, you do, eh? Yes, he certainly knows how to ad lib. Ad lib? Sure he ad libs. He has to. He can't read a script. (laughs) Why, do you know, Don, he has nothing in his library but life, look, and click. I happen to know. Well, Jack, if Alan can't read, how does he order food from a menu in a restaurant? He goes to a cafeteria where he can point. (laughs) He took up juggling just so he wouldn't drop a tray. (laughs) Pardon me. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is me again. Rochester Van Jones, I'm not talking to you. You mean I'm still on the blacklist? (laughs) Certainly. Now, Goodbye. What's hmm. the matter with you and Rochester, Jack? Oh, it's nothing, Don. Forget it. I know. Quiet. Hey, Jack, look who just came in. Oh, yes, our new movie star. Hello, Mr. Harris. You're a little late, aren't you? I am a bit tardy, but by the time I selected my wardrobe and had my bath, time just fizzled away. <laughs> well, I can imagine. <laughs> Listen, Phil, because you're in the movies now is no excuse for being late. Well, I was home studying my part. I've got a big day before the camera tomorrow. Oh, you have. Hey, Phil, can I have your autograph? Later, son. (laughs) What a ham. I want to tell you something, Phil. I saw a a screen test. (laughs) (laughs) Phil, I saw a screen test of you the other day, and believe me, it broke my heart. 
Was it that good? I'm talking to Phil. And another thing, Phil, while you're working in my picture, I don't want you to go around giving all the girls at Paramount your phone number. My phone number? Yes, phone number. I saw you with that blonde in front of the commissary the other day. Now, wait a minute, Jack. She just asked me what time it was, and I told her. Well, she must have a poor memory. She wrote it down. (laughs) I can't see how you ever got into a suave, sophisticated picture like this one. You should talk. You used to be a comedian in a burlesque show. Sliding Sam Benny. (laughs) Now, that's what I call greening it up. Mary, have I ever been in a burlesque show? Only as a customer. There you are. (laughs) I just go in there once to get my father. (laughs) He's nearsighted and thought it was grand opera. Who is he waiting in the alley for, Gallicurchy? I didn't inquire. (laughs) And now, Phil, if you can forget you're a movie star for a couple of minutes, how about a band number? Okay, Jackson. The boys and myself are going to play a popular little ditty entitled... (laughs) Never mind the bread, Sonny. Pop will be home with a bun. <laughs> now, Phil, stop with those epigrams. Now, what are you going to play? All right. Mary and I have been rehearsing that new song, I Go For That, and we're going to sing it to each other. Oh, well, that's a novelty. Say, Mary, you're going to sing with Phil, eh? Uh-huh. That ought to be cute. Well, that's better not become a habit. <laughs> Penny, don't be so jealous. You're not the only singer in the world. Well, I'm the object of my affection. (laughs) Never mind that. Go ahead, Phil and Mary. Let's hear what you've cooked up. Okay. Okay. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Is your real name Maxwell Stroud? No, it isn't. I'm not Maxwell Stroud. Don't lie to me, Daddy. Come right home. (laughs) Get out of here! What a pest. I wonder if I could catch him on fly paper. (laughs) That was I Go For That, played by the orchestra with a special vocal chorus by Jeanette McLivingston and Nelson Harris. (laughs) The Nightingales of the Jell-O program. If you want the real... (laughs) Kenny, I don't recall anybody asking you. Now, keep still. More darn singers on this program. Don't be surprised if I'm not here next Sunday. You'll be here next Sunday and like it. Well, I'll be here, but I won't sing. You'll sing, too. Now, drop it. And now, folks... I won't sing good. (laughs) And you'll sing good. Not very. (laughs) Hand it. And now, folks, going from juvenile temperament to our feature attraction, tonight we are going to present... Pardon me, if that's Rochester again, I'll... Hello? Hello, boss, are you still looking down on me with scorn? (laughs) Rochester, I want you to stop with these telephone calls. Do you hear me? Well, boss, I said I was sorry. Rochester, what you did to me, only time will heal. (laughs) Goodbye. Hmm. As I was saying, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are going to present... What's all this mystery, Jack? What are you mad at Rochester for? Donna concerns only him and me. Oh, why don't you tell him, Jack? Yes, what did he do? Very well, Don. Rochester hocked my polar bear. (laughs) That's what he did. He what? You heard me. He pawned Carmichael for $30. Of all the low tricks. For heaven's sake, Jack, didn't you know the bear was missing? Of course I did, but Rochester told me he was playing the Orpheum. (laughs) Then when I was downtown last night, I happened to walk by a pawn shop, and there was Carmichael hanging in the window, right next to a slide trombone. (laughs) But, Jack, how'd you know it was your bear? He was wearing my new wristwatch. Don Roger, he could have got $12 on that alone. I know. (laughs) Well, we hadn't heard the last of this. Oh, well, let's get back to our play. Uh, Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to present a new and original comedy drama entitled Topper Takes an Aspirin. He's taken everything else. (laughs) Now, in this vehicle, I will naturally play the part of Topper, while Mary... Oh, more interruptions. Come in. What are you... 
Well, I'll be darned. Hey, fellas, look who's here. Hello, stranger. Slap him up. <laughs> Well, 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 this is indeed a surprise. It's good to see you again, Slepperman. And I'm happy to see you too, Jackie boy. Well, well, look, everybody's here. It's like old times. Hello, Mary. Hello, Slap. My, my, you're getting prettier every day. Thanks. How's your wife? Vice versa. Vice versa. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, good old Slep. Doggone, it's good to see you again. And Kenny and Phil, believe me, you're a sight for sore feet. Hello, Slapperman. Glad to see you, Slap. And Don Wilson, my, my, tell me, were you always so big or don't I remember? Well, Slap, to tell you the truth, I did put on a pound here and there. Here, I don't mind, but there, it's unbecoming. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, same old Slap. You know, I haven't seen you in over a year. What have you been doing with yourself? I've been all over the country, north, south, east, and uptown. I was playing in vaudeville. In vaudeville? Uh, what kind of an act did you do? I was a magician. Oh, a magician. Oh. Were you a good one? Sensational. You should see me pull the lining out of the hat. Say, hey, that's some trick. Uh, well, what are you doing out here in California, Schlepp? On a vacation? No, I'm in business here. I opened up a little nightclub. Schlepperman's Hawaii, Hacienda. Look, if you're here. Well, I'll sure be out there to see you. Tell me, Schlepp, have you got a floor show? Have I got a floor show? Mm. My son Tinkus plays the drums. I play the ukulele, oh. and for a feature, my wife wriggles. <laughs> Say, that sounds great. You know, I'd like to drop in and see your wife do the hula. Okay, if you're passing by, but don't make it a special trip, please. <laughs> oh, she can't be that bad. Well, I wish you a lot of luck in your new place, and we'll be over to see you very soon. Thank you, Well, I got to travel along now. Aloha, everybody. So long, Slab. Good afternoon, you, So long, Slab. I want to go back to my little dress, second to last and then third street around the corner. <laughs> Well, it was sure good seeing Schlepperman again. He's a nice little fellow. Well, kids, it's getting kind of late now. I don't think we'll have time to do our play. So how about saving it for next week? It's very long, and if that's who I think it is, he's in for a good bawling out. Hello? Hello, boss. This is your bad boy, Jogan. <laughs> Rochester, I told you before, I'm not making up with you until you unhock that polar bear. So goodbye. Goodbye. Wait a minute, boss. That's what I called you up about. I got called out of the pawn shop. He's back in the house. Oh, well, that's more like it. Now, don't you ever do a thing like that again. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, wait a minute. I just thought of something. Where did you get the $30 to get Carmichael out of the pawn shop? I thought you weren't speaking to me. <laughs> Rochester, where did you get that $30? The what? The $30. Where did you get it? It could have been a legacy, you know. <laughs> It could have, but it wasn't. Now, for the last time, where did you get the $30? I sold my AT&T. Rochester, you never had a share of stock in your life. Now, if you don't tell me where you got that $30, you're fired. Okay, boss. Your violin is now hanging where Carmichael was. <laughs> oh, my... Rochester, did you pawn my slight of variant? That ain't what the man said. So long, boss. Rochester, Rochester, can you match that, fellas? He pawned my violin. Hooray! Hooray! We're a little late, so good night, folks. The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. For now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a man who was the sensation of the Easter parade this morning in his frock coat, white spats, and beanie, Jack Benny. Hello again, this is Jack Benny, a page from Esquire talking. And Don, you're mistaken, I was not wearing a beanie. That was my derby hat, but the brim blew off. <laughs> I have more trouble with that hat. I think I'll grow geraniums in it. Uh, anyway, Don, uh, wasn't it grand today? Did you ever see so many people out promenading? It was a lovely sight, Jack, and I thought you looked quite dapper. Thanks. But I noticed you had your polar bear with you. What was the idea of taking Carmichael along? Well, I had to take him. You see, when I left the house this morning, he grabbed a hold of the seat of my pants and refused to let go. <laughs> what could I do? Well, Jack, supposing he did rip your pants, you could have put on another pair. Don, his grip was a little deeper than that. 
<laughs> so I took him along. And you know, Don, there was one time when he embarrassed me something awful. Here we were walking along Hollywood Boulevard. Oh, it was terrible. What happened? Well, just as we got to Grauman's Chinese Theater, Carmichael ran into the forecourt and put his footprints in the manager. <laughs> Oh, I nearly died. Oh, that must have been embarrassing. Was the manager sore about it? Don, where he told us to go is no place for a polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't let that bother us. Went right along with our stroll. Say, uh, Jack, did you see Phil Harris on the boulevard this morning? He had on the loudest suit I've ever seen in my life. It was really violent. Uh, no, I didn't see him, Don, but I can imagine what Phil's suit was like. You see, he and Rochester have the same tailor. <laughs> same tailor? Well, he isn't exactly a tailor. He specializes in beach umbrellas. <laughs> a fellow by the name of Neon Cohn. Uh, by the way, uh, where is Phil, our new movie star? Oh, he hasn't come in yet. Incidentally, Jack, how's Phil coming along in your picture? Oh, he's all right, Don, but he's getting so conceited. My, you, you see, it's awfully crowded at Paramount, and they're short of dressing rooms, so Phil has been changing his clothes in a barrel. You know? In a barrel? Well, what's conceited about that? Well, yesterday, he asked him to put a star on it. <laughs> Not only that, he's got lace curtains over the bunghole. <laughs> tell you, I tell you, Don, if he... If he doesn't... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Happy Easter. Thanks. Say, you look stunning in your new dress. Where'd you get it? Well, don't you remember, Jack? You told me to buy a dress for an Easter present and send you the bill. I said that? When did I ever say that? Two weeks ago when you were sick in bed with a bad cold. Oh. Well, I must have been delirious that night. <laughs> what else? <laughs> now, Mary, that's just taking an unfair advantage. How much did the dress cost? Eighty-two fifty. Wait! <laughs> Well, don't sit down on it. It's going back tomorrow. <laughs> Eighty-two fifty. I could buy four suits for that. Sure you could. Never mind. You walk up so high to buy a suit to close your ears, Pop. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. That's enough. Say, Mary, I saw you on the boulevard this morning. Who was that good-looking fellow you were with? Oh, wasn't he handsome, Don? Mm. You know, Jack, while I was strolling along, I met the cutest boy. Yeah. He's a doll. Oh, I'll bet. How'd you meet him? Well, it was all an accident, really. Mm. You see, I was walking down the street, and I just happened to drop my handkerchief, and he picked it up. Oh, you happened to drop that. Yeah. <laughs> then I got so nervous, I dropped my gloves. Oh, both of them? No, one at a time. <laughs> Oh, that was some accident, huh? Gee, he's cute. His name is Wendell. Well, that's an adorable name. Huh? And he's so smart, Jack. You know, he's a college boy. A college boy, eh? What's he taking up? A uh, chemistry and goldfish swallowing. <laughs> oh, that's a marvelous profession. You know, Mary, you meet the most interesting people. Wendell. What's his last name? Kendall. Oh. Wendell Kendall. The second. That's all he needs. <laughs> Anyway, Mary, I don't want you to go out with strangers. It isn't nice, and I don't like it. I'll bring him over sometime, Jack. He'll be crazy about it. I can hardly wait. Oh, everybody rise. Here comes His Majesty, the King of the Cinema. Hello, Phil. I say there, old fellow. Am I again the nucleus of your disparaging remarks? Isn't that awful? <laughs> <laughs> now look here, Twitch. <laughs> now get off your high horse. You're not the only guy that ever made a picture. Guy? My word. Your English is ghastly. Oh, it is all of this. <laughs> now listen, Phil, don't be so highbrow. I remember you when you led your orchestra with a rolled up racing form. <laughs> <laughs> now, while I think of it, I wish you wouldn't go around telling people that you're the star of my picture. You're nothing but a stooge, and you know it. Stooge? How can I be a stooge when I did a big love scene yesterday with Dorothy Lamour? Sure you did, but the minute you left the room, who do you think rushed in and kissed her? I did. That's like having stewed prunes after Crest Suzette. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking to Phil. I've been in pictures quite a while, Phil, and I don't like to say this, 
because you have absolutely no screen personality. No personality? What are you talking about? I'm grinning all the time. That's just it. All you can see is teeth. <laughs> Your mouth looks like an Elks convention. <laughs> Fine star. Sure, I'm a star. Now, Phil Harris, I'm the star of this picture, so let's forget it. You are not. I am, too. You are not. I am, too. Now, Phil, let's stop with our personal argument. You've still got a job to do here, so pick up your baton and play something. I'm not using a baton anymore. From now on, I'm going to conduct with my hands, like Stokowski. <laughs> Just keep time. That's all I ask. <laughs> Go ahead, genius. Hold it a second. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I'm a little Easter bunny. Each year I bring you greetings funny. But now I'm in a hurry, so I'll lay my egg and away I go. Get out of here! A fine rabbit with no fur. Play, please. That, uh... That was hold tight, conducted by Phil Harris with his hands. I'm just saying that so the orchestra boys will know. They never look at them, folks. <laughs> and, Phil, I must admit that it's more impressive when you conduct with your hands. Is it really? Yes, that phony diamond of yours shows up much better. <laughs> what do you mean, phony? This ring cost me $12 on a punch board. Well, if you didn't get a turkey with it, you got jit. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, as our play tonight is rather long, I think we ought to proceed with the casting without further ado. Are we all here? All but me. Oh, hello, Kenny. Why are you so late? Well, we had an Easter egg hunt at our house this morning. I just got through. Oh, an Easter egg hunt, eh? Say, that's fun. Yeah. And you know what, Jack? I found five eggs all by myself. Five eggs. That's marvelous. Where'd you find them? Well, I found one under the sofa, one in back of the clock, and three under a hen. <laughs> Well, that's some trick, finding three eggs under a hen. If I'd have waited, I'd have got four. <laughs> oh, that's amazing, huh? Anyway, Kenny, you got here just in time for our play. Uh, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the Benny Bagel Benders <laughs> will uh, present their version of that popular Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, that drama of life among the nurses in a big city hospital entitled Four Girls in White. Now, inasmuch as we are short of the fair sex on this program... Kenny Baker, Don Wilson, and Phil Harris will be nurses. You mean we got to be girls? You said it, sister. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mary, uh, you're going to be a girl, too. Okay, I'll talk in a high voice. That's the idea. <laughs> now, I'm going to play the part of Dr. DeSchnook, head of the hospital. Well, why don't you be a girl, too, you sissy? Kenny, I'm casting this play. So hush up, honey child, let's pappy slappy till you're happy. <laughs> Now, this play will go on... You would hit a woman. Quiet. <laughs> uh, now, this play will go on immediately after Kenny's song. Go ahead, Kenny. Wait a minute. Hello? Who? Miss Livingston? Yes, she's here. Who's calling, please? It is, too, some of my blank business. <laughs> Oh, yeah? Well, listen here, buddy. Tell me who you are. Oh, give me that phone, Jack. Fresh guy. Hello? Why, Wendell Kendall, of all people. I might have guessed it. Uh, what's that, Wendell? Oh, don't mind, Jack. He's got a toothache. I have not. You would if you could. Now, Mary. <laughs> see, it's nice of you to call Wendell. Yes, I'd love to see you tonight. Where will we go? Oh, my house? There's a spendthrift, if I ever saw one. Well, look, Wendell, all I've got to eat in the house is ketchup. Why don't you stop at the delicatessen and buy some sandwiches? Oh, you like ketchup. Why don't you ask him to bring his bagpipes? He can play while you're fixing dinner. Oh, shh. Uh, say, Wendell, after we eat, let's go and see Gunga Dean. He's playing right near my house. Oh, so he's going to take you to see Gunga Dean, eh? No, he's going to bring the poem over and read it to me. <laughs> oh, that'll be ducky. There's nothing like a poem with ketchup. <laughs> Wendell Kendall, what a name. Sing, Kenny. Uh, I'm building a sailboat of dreams sung by Kenny Baker. And Kenny, now that your number is over, I'd like to remind you that last Sunday when you were mad, you said you weren't going to sing at all today. I did not. I said I wasn't going to sing good. Well, you did sing good, so ha-ha. I could have done better, so ho-ho. 
And now, folks, leaving our childhood behind us, we will proceed with tonight's drama, Four Girls in White. Are you all dressed, girls? Yeah. Me too. I rolled my stockings. Is it all right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Don, but you've, you've got your skirt on upside down. How else could he get into it? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, Don, you don't wear a girdle on the outside. <laughs> now, the uh, scene of our play... Holy smoke, I feel like a sultan with these bloomers on. <laughs> well, pull them up a little, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> now, the, uh, the scene of our play... Hey, Jack, where does this go? Kenny, put that down. <laughs> Now, the uh, scene of our play is the General Hospital in a large American city, where Dr. DeSchnook is about to give a lecture to his class of student nurses. Curtain. Music. Good morning, students. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. DeSchnook. Now, girls, before we begin, you must realize that you are now embarking on a new and important career. It is not an easy one, girls. <laughs> But in two short years, you will graduate and become full-fledged nurses. Aren't you happy? Aren't you thrilled? Aren't you inspired? Well, as an average girl, I'd say no. <laughs> now, Phyllis, please. Uh, pay attention, girls. I will now call the roll. Marie Livingston. Marie, where are you? Here in the back, class. Oh. I didn't see you. Uh, Dolores Wilson. Here, doctor. Here, doctor. Dolores, even though you occupy two seats, just answer one. <laughs> uh, Phyllis Harris. Here, doctor, and I know my lessons like anything. That's fine, Phyllis. Now, if you'll just shave before you come to class, everything will be lovely. And pull up those bloomers. Okay. Uh, Peaches Baker. <laughs> Peaches Baker. Oh, this is silly. I don't want to play. Peaches, I'm going to can you if you don't behave. Oh, right there. Now, girls, we will take up our classwork. Peaches Baker. Yes, doctor. If you were in the clinic and a little boy came in with tiny red spots all over his face, what would he have? Freckles. <laughs> no, it's measles, but you were close. For me, that's perfect. Sit down. <laughs> Now, Phyllis. Yes, Doc? I want you to tell us the difference between a bunion and a corn. A bunion and a corn? Yes. Well, a bunion is a lump on your foot. Uh-huh. But I don't know what corn is. Not much, you <laughs> don't. <laughs> and pull up those bloomers. <laughs> You're... You're next, Marie. Yes, Dr. DeSchnook. Now tell me, who was Louis Pasteur? A very famous medical scientist. Very good. And where did he do most of his work? At Warner Brothers Studios. <laughs> That's right, under the name of Paul Muni. Now, Phyllis, uh, name three well-known anesthetics. What's that, Doc? I said name three well-known anesthetics. Gas, ether, and Joe Lewis. Correct. <laughs> Gin is good, too. <laughs> We're not interested in that, you naughty girl. And take that cigar out of your mouth. Now, Peaches Baker. Peaches yet. <laughs> now, Peaches, can you tell us what is the world's record for the itch? Seven years. And who recently broke this record? Fred Allen. Right. <laughs> That's very good, teacher. No kidding, Doc. Does Fred Allen really have the seven-year itch? That ain't gold he's digging for, Miss Harris. <laughs> well, that's all the questions for today, girls. I'm going to the supply room to get some gauze, and then I'm going to show you how to bandage a broken arm. I'll be back in a second. Has he gone? Yes. Gee, that doctor's an awful flirt. He keeps winking at me all the time. Me too. I get so embarrassed. What a masher. He's a masher. Last night, he asked me to go to Ocean Park with him. Ocean Park? Oh, I was there Tuesday. I met the cutest plumber. <laughs> Thomas Peaches, did you? <laughs> yeah. He wanted to marry me, but I told him I was a career girl. <laughs> uh, quiet, girls. He's coming back. Well, girls, here I am with the gauze. We will now take up bandaging, but first we need a broken arm. Dolores, break Phyllis's arm. Okay. <laughs> ah! Don't be a baby, Phyllis. 
Oh, Doctor, Doctor De Schnook. Yes, Miss Pasadena. What is it? There's a patient in your office and he has a sliver in his finger. A sliver? Rush him to the operating room immediately. Yes, sir. And by the way, Miss Pasadena, take off that bathing suit. You're a nurse now. Okay. Well, girls, I've got a real treat for you. I'm going to perform an operation. You can all watch. Follow me, girls. We're off to the surgery. Well, here we are, girls. Here's the operating room. Tickets, tickets, please. I'm the doctor. I get in for nothing. What about the dame? They're nurses. They look like the dead end kids. Hey, Curly Lock. What? Pull up your bloomers. If I was the lady, I'd slug you. <laughs> Phyllis, please. He has glasses on. Oh, Miss Pasadena, is the patient ready? Yes, he's right there on the table. Oh, yes, there he is. Uh, how do you do, sir? Hello, stranger. <laughs> Hmm, that boy sounds familiar. Now, just relax, old boy. Hey, wait a minute. What am I doing on the table? I'm going to operate on you. Well, take off the eight ball. I'm superstitious. Take it easy now. Be calm, and I'll have your tonsils out in a jiffy. What tonsils? I only got a sliver in my finger. I've got a special today. Sliver and tonsils, $75. I don't want my tonsils out. Why not? When I open my mouth, it wouldn't look sporty. Never mind that. Lay down. Now, gather around, girls, and watch closely. Say, hey, what is this, a preview? Now, Miss Livingston, administer the anesthetic. Okay. And it looks to me like I'm going to have a snappy Easter. Hmm. It's working fine. Now, how do you feel? When my dream boat comes in. It'll dock in a minute. Do you think the operation will be a success, Doctor? I never know, Miss Livingston. I never know. Oh, sweet mystery of life, I think you got me. A little more ether, Miss Livingston. Okay, Doctor. Pray the Pagliacci, the Spanjubili Cassi, Crossing Tado, Rakabadi Salamanca Tombo. Good night, everybody. There he goes out like a light. The operation. Marie, hand me the port test. Here you are, Doctor. Peaches, hand me the scalpel. Here you are, Doctor. Phyllis, pull up your blue. Okay, Doc. Now stand back, everybody. I need room. Peanuts, popcorns, and programs. You can't tell a tonsil from an adenoid without a program. Give me one of those. Dolores, stand by with the anesthetic. I'm going to whack out these tonsils, or my name ain't Dr. D. Snook. Don't forget the sliver, please. Two hours later, the operation is over, and Dr. DeSnook is at the bedside of his patient, who's just coming out of the ether. <laughs> well, there you are, sir. It's all over. That wasn't so bad, was it? Now, how do you feel? I'm feeling fine, Doc. And sure, I never felt better in my life, and I'm telling you the truth. That's right. Good heavens, I changed his dialect! Come on, girls, let's go! Then we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Well, folks, I hope you all liked our little play tonight, Four Girls in White. And oh, yes, uh, Don, Kenny, and Mary, I want to compliment you on your performance. You were very good. I was good, too, wasn't I, Jack? Yes, Phyllis, and pull up your bloomers. Good night, folks. The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. For now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you our sun-kissed master of ceremonies who has just returned from a week's vacation in Palm Springs. Yes, sir. Tell him how I look, Don. Ah, he's the picture of health, folks. Brown as a berry with a magnificent coat of tan. You know, I never freckle. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, that perfect specimen, that bronze Adonis, Jack Benny. <laughs> Uh, Jello again. This is Jack Benny coming to you, sunny side up. <laughs> and you know, Don, that week on the desert did me a world of good. I never felt better in my life. Uh, uh, don't you think I look ten years younger? Well, Jack... Uh, Five years? Well, I, uh... Three? Well, to tell you the truth, Jack... All right, Don, let's put it this way. I don't look any older. No, you don't, Jack. Thanks. <laughs> See, every time I fish for a compliment, I come up with a rubber boot. <laughs> now, Don, you know this tan on my face is very becoming. Oh, yes, you have a nice color, Jack. But what are those round white spots just above your eyebrows? Oh, those white spots? Oh, that's Rochester's fault. He's so careless. 
Why? What happened? Well, you see, I was taking a sun bath, and I gave Rochester a half a dollar to go out and buy me a cigar. Yes? And when he came back, I was asleep, so he laid the change on my forehead. <laughs> <laughs> that accounts for the polka dots. <laughs> oh, uh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Say, where have you been? Oh, I took a little trip. Uh, do you notice anything different? Yeah, you look ten years younger. You see, Don? Than George Arliss. <laughs> Now, you can kid about it, but I feel swell. Take it from me, Don, for a real healthy vacation, there's nothing like a week in Palm Springs. You're right, Jack. It's simply wonderful. And the hotels there are so swanky. Oh, they're the last word. They certainly are. Which one did you stop at? Well, I, uh, I didn't exactly stay in a hotel. You see, Don, I wanted to sort of rough it, you know, get close to nature. You know, be right out on the desert. Where'd you live, in a gopher hole? <laughs> No, I didn't live in a gopher hole. Don't tell me you went to that same dump you stopped at last time. Dump? Mary, if you can call the Bellevue Auto Court a dump, <laughs> then I give up. <laughs> in the first place, they cater to a very exclusive clientele. They don't take in everybody. Not much. They got a bear trap in front of the joint. <laughs> don't listen to her, Don. It's really one of the nicest <laughs> auto camps west of the Mississippi. There's such a quaint charm about it. Oh, it's a lovely spot. And it's right in Palm Springs, huh? Well, it's not right in Palm Springs. Uh, <laughs> uh, is it, Mary? No, it's closer to Boyle Heights. <laughs> it is not. Don, uh, you must have passed the Bellevue lots of time. Look, you know how you take Highway 90, 99 and you go through Beaumont and Banning? Yes. Well, when you leave Banning, you turn off on that side road where the barbecue stand is. You know, the one that has that little red-headed cashier. You mean Babette? Yes, yes. She's, uh... Well, anyway, you turn <laughs> off on that road. And on the left-hand side is the Bellevue Auto Court. Oh, you can't miss it. Oh, I know. It's the place right next to the goat farm. That's it. That's the place. That's it. When there's a west wind, you get a dollar off your rent. <laughs> I only had one lucky night. <laughs> and listen, Don, Mary can laugh, but if, you ever, if you're ever out that way and you want to live in a nice, homey atmosphere, you stop at the Bellevue. The beds are marvelous. But, Jack, isn't it a little too far from Palm Springs? Why, no, Don, it's only a ten-minute walk. Go on, it's 15 minutes to the bathroom. <laughs> Not if you know the shortcut. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you stop there, Don. You'll, you'll really thank me for it. I'll remember that, Jack. And uh, mention my name. It'll help us both, you know. Oh, uh, and by the way, they have a lunchroom there. And here's a little tip for you, Don. If you go in there to eat, don't order the number four breakfast. <laughs> Why not? Because it's a dime more than the number three, and the only difference is they trim the toast. <laughs> I found that out the first day. <laughs> Tell them about the waffles they served, Jack. Oh, well, that's just a novelty. Well, what about the waffles, Murray? They got numbers on them so you can play bingo till your eggs come. <laughs> Listen, Mary, it's those little touches that make the Bellevue unique among auto cars. It's a swell little place. Go on, you'd never stop there if they didn't have B on the towel. Oh, yeah? Well, if you're information smarty, the towel at the Bellevue was on a roller. <laughs> <laughs> they don't make up things. Oh, hello, Kenny. Hiya, Jack. Gee, look at you. Where have you been? Oh, I've been out in the desert, Kenny. I got a pretty swell tan, haven't I? Yeah, you look like a healthy poon. A healthy prune? Oh, well, you perhaps meant that for a compliment. Could be. <laughs> well, anyway, Kenny, that's what a week in Palm Springs will do for you. Have you ever been there? Oh, sure. I was there last year with my mother and father. But you know, Jack, I didn't get to see much of Palm Springs. Why not? I bought a cowboy hat that was too big for me. <laughs> Well, you should have peeked out once in a while. It's a lovely time. <laughs> Isn't it, Jim? <laughs> Say, Jack, uh, I just have to think of something. Uh, How could you go to Palm Springs when you and Phil are right in the middle of your new picture? Well, you see, Don, they stopped production on my picture for a week, 
And Mr. Hornbow, the producer, suggests that I go away for a rest. Huh? Oh, I see. By the way, how is Phil as an actor? Has he improved any? Don, I don't like to be catty. But he's got about as much acting ability as an unrehearsed sweepstake winner in a newsreel. <laughs> <laughs> and and what a ham. Conceited, huh? Conceited. Some silly girl told him he had a profile like a Greek god. And the next day he came to work with an olive branch in his hair. <laughs> and sandals yet. No kidding. <laughs> Not only that, he had a pedicure. <laughs> what a guy. Well, Phil hasn't got much to do with the picture, has he? No, Don. Fortunately, he has a very small role. You see, uh, Dorothy Lemour thinks she's in love with Phil, and Phil thinks so, too. So not realizing her dreadful mistake, Dorothy marries Phil. You see? Yes, but where do you come in? Jack the Stork. I am... <laughs> I'm Milford, the boy that's always waiting for her. And, Don, I think this picture will really bring out the new Benny. Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> Don't worry, it will. Now, how about singing, Kenny, while I'm in a romantic mood? Huh? Okay, Jack. Now, hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Do you really think Dorothy Lamour is beautiful? Yes, I do. Why? You ought to see me in a sarong. Goodbye. <laughs> well, there a beachcomber if I ever saw one. Sing. <laughs> that, uh, that was Heaven Can Wait, sung by Kenny Baker, who, in my humble opinion, is one of our finest young tenors. You know, Kenny, I oughtn't to tell you this, but people all over America are crazy about your voice. They're nuts about it in Brazil, too. <laughs> Brazil nuts! <laughs> oh, boy, that's a lulu! Brazil nuts. Kenny, where did you ever get that awful joke? Phil Harris sold it to me for ten dollars. <laughs> what? Ten dollars for that gag? I didn't know eggs were so high. <laughs> me neither. Of all the nerve. Listen, Kenny, Phil Harris has no business selling you jokes. He knows nothing about comedy. Oh, no? Anybody that can write Pygmalion is good enough for me. <laughs> Oh, so Phil told you he wrote Pygmalion, eh? Yeah, but he told me to keep it quiet or he'd punch me in the nose. <laughs> well, naturally, he's modest. However, for your information, Kenny, Pygmalion was written by George Bernard Shaw, a very famous Irish playwright. Take it easy, brother. I wasn't born yesterday. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> Phil Harris, an author. Harris is nothing but a bathed hillbilly. <laughs> Well, he can't write his own name without tracing it through a stencil. And Kenny, don't worry. I'll get that $10 back that you gave to Phil. Well, either way, I'm hooked. <laughs> don't be so cynical, Kenneth. And now, folks, if I may be permitted to pick up the loose ends of our program, our people will present their version. Huh. Oh, yes, our movie star has arrived. Hello, Stokes. I mean, folks, this is smiling Phil Harris, the old lady killer himself. Old lady killer is right. <laughs> Come here a minute, Phil. I want to talk to you. What's on your mind, my little dictator? Listen, Phil, Kenny Baker just told me that you sold him a joke and charged him $10 for it. Is that right? Sure, but I marked it down from 25 I don't care if it's a fire sale. <laughs> You're here to lead an orchestra, and there'll be no sidelines on this program. No sidelines, eh? No. You're a fine one to squawk. I've been buying my handkerchiefs from you ever since I came to work here. Well, they were satisfactory, weren't they? Yeah. Then shut up. <laughs> Those handkerchiefs are of the finest quality. I bought one of them and blew a hole right through it. <laughs> well, they're not nosies. They're for the pocket. <laughs> Anyway, I'm only selling them for an aunt of mine who weaves. Your uncle weaves, too. <laughs> That's different. <laughs> and now, folks, getting back to our play. Hey, Jack, if you'll stop being mad at me for a second, I'd like to tell you that you're looking swell. That's a marvelous coat of tan you've got. Well, thanks. I got it in Palm Springs last <laughs> week. Uh, by the way, where did you go? Where did I go? I've been working like a dog. Where? At Paramount on our picture. What? You've been working on the picture? There goes your tan, Jack. <laughs> 
Why, Mr. Hornblow told me to go away for a rest. He said they were holding up production. Holding up nothing. This week they shot all my important love scenes. Oh, I see. Oh, so do I. Keep still. <laughs> Mary, get me Paramount on the phone. I want to speak to Mr. Hornblow. Okay. Listen, Phil, if you think you're going to hog this picture, you have another thing coming. Well, don't blame me. It's not my fault. Not much, the way you're always trying to build up your part. What are you talking about? Yeah. Hello, Paramount? Mr. Hornblow, please. You know what I'm talking about. You take that scene in the drawing room that you did with Vinnie Barnes. All you were supposed to say was no. Just one word, no. And instead of that, you said, no, no. No, I tell you, a thousand times no. <laughs> well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong? You were only turning down a cup of tea. <laughs> 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 Lucky she didn't offer you a piece of pie. You'd have killed yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Some actor. Hello, Mr. Hornblow. Gee, you're going to get it. Mary, give me that phone. Hello, Mr. Hornblow. This is Jack Benny. Yes, yes, I got back today. I had a lovely time. Yes, I got tanned like anything. Now, look, Mr. Hornblow, there's just one thing I want to know. What's the big idea of shooting my picture behind my back? I know. But listen, Mr. Horn. Take it easy, Jack. You worked at every other studio. I have not. Republic is virgin territory. <laughs> now look, Mr. Hornblow. Look, I'm the. I I know. I know it's going to be a good picture. That's why I want to be in it. Yes. Yes. But if. But if. But if. But if. I know. But. 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 but but Try if again Why? <laughs> Mr. Hornblow, are you going to be in your office for a while? Good, I'll be right over Goodbye Listen, fellas, you'll have to do our play without me i got to rush right over to Paramount Studio Can I go with you? Yes, come on, Rochester's got the car downstairs Boy, Jack certainly burned up, isn't he? Yeah, but Mr. Hornblow will cool him off Hey, Phil, you got any more of those jokes you want to sell me? Sure, come here, kid. Here's a honey. Now, the next time Jack asks you what you're going to sing, you say you're going to sing a little ditty entitled, I Call My Dog Ginger Because He Always Snaps At Me. <laughs> Ginger Snaps, that's a good one. <laughs> That'll be $2, Kenny. <laughs> Here you are. Thanks. Play, boys. Please step on the gas. We're barely crawling. Can't help it, boys. You either got to get a new car or hoist the sail. <laughs> that won't be necessary. I'm going to have the motor overhauled. That ain't going to help any. What this car needs is glands. <laughs> well, if you took care of it like you should, everything would be all right. Oh, Jack, stop picking on Rochester. He's doing the best he can with this jalopy. Mary, if you call this car a jalopy once more, you can get right out and walk. All right, unstrap me. <laughs> Just stay where you are and don't be so fresh. <laughs> What's the matter, Rochester? The red light's against us. Well, you don't have to shut off the engine to stop. I do until you get braced. <laughs> Well, it's green. Now get going. Okay, boss. Oh, darn it. Oh, quiet, you Sunday drivers. All right, all right, we're going. Hurry up, Rocket. I'm trying, boss. He's embarrassing. Well, thank heaven. Gee whiz, Jack, why don't you trade this car in? Why should I? This car is all right. And besides, it's so easy on the gas. Gee, I get 27 miles to the gallon. 27 miles? With a little water, 32. <laughs> now, Rochester, don't exaggerate. And watch where you're going. I want to get to Paramount before Mr. Hornblow leaves his office. What's the matter, boss? Are you in a doghouse again? I hardly think that's any of your business, Rochester. Say, Mary, look at that sign. Joe Lewis and Jack Roper, Wrigley Field. 
Boy, that's going to be some fight tomorrow night. Are you going, Jack? I certainly am. Say, boss, who do you think is going to win that fight? Well, personally, I'd like to put a little bet on Roper. Mmm, tennis from him. <laughs> I can appreciate your loyalty, Rochester, but Jack Roper is a pretty tough guy. He's got a vicious right and a terrific left. What a pair of arms. Well, Lewis ain't exactly a Venus tomorrow. <laughs> oh, so you're pretty positive he'll win, eh? Well, how long do you think the fight will last? Well, boss, the main event goes on at 10 o'clock sharp, don't it? That's right. Well, at 10.15, Brother Lewis is scheduled to make a speech at our social club. <laughs> oh, he is? And in full dress. Now, don't get too enthusiastic, Rochester. Nobody's going to knock out Roper that fast. Man, you know what's going to happen tomorrow night? What? When the bell rings for the first round, Lewis and Roper are going to meet in the center of the ring. Yes. Then Roper's going to swing. Uh huh. Then Lewis is going to swing. Uh huh. That's all. Party's over. <laughs> Well, let me tell you something, Rochester. If you're so sure that Lewis is going to win, I'd just like to bet you $10 that you're wrong. Nothing doing, boss. You still owe me five from the Dempsey Purple fight. <laughs> oh, so you're trying to back out, eh? You know darn well Roper's going to win that fight, and you're afraid of that. What are you talking about, boss? I'm talking about Roper winning that fight tomorrow night. Why, man, I told you what's going to happen. Lewis is going to take his right hand like this. He's going to swing it right from the ground. Zowie! Now look what you did. You broke the windshield. I'm sorry, boss. I got excited. Mm, excited? Well, it's your own fault, Jack. You shouldn't argue with him when he's driving the car. I wasn't arguing. You were true. You told him Roper was sure to win. Well, he is. I don't think Lewis has got a chance against him. Why, boss, Joe Lewis is going to give that Roper a right and a left, a right and a left. Rochester, keep your hands on the wheel. A right and a left and a left. Look out. We're going to hit this driving set. Isn't this awful? Good evening, folks. What do you have? We don't want anything, miss. Are you all right, Mary? Mary, where are you? Here I am, up at the counter. I'm hungry. Uh, gee, look at this car. My, my, what a mess. Well, you're responsible for the whole thing. Look, the front fenders are knocked off, the headlights are slashed, and we got three flat tires. It's unanimous now. Well, get to work and fix it. I'm going to walk over to Paramount. It's only two blocks from here. Okay, boss. So long. So long. Come on with me, Mary. You can eat later. I'm coming. Man, this car sure is a wreck. Well, if I got to fix it, I got to. I hate to see that evening sun go down to the duty. I hate to see that evening sun go down. Oh, lady. Lady. What do you want? Would you mind bringing me a couple of pork chops to break the monotony? Two pork chops coming up. And don't forget the gravy with mashed potatoes all around. We'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Come on, Mary, walk a little faster. I don't want to keep Mr. Hornblow waiting. Well, how do you know he's going to be there? He'll be there all right. You know, I'm no small fry at Paramount. I have an appointment with him, and he'll keep it. Now, hurry up. Okay. Say, Jack, who's that fellow in that big car that just passed? Where? Right there. Oh. Hey, Mr. Hornblow! Mr. Hornblow, wait a minute. We have an appointment. Hey, Mr. Hornblow! Good night, folks. Mr. Hornblow! The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know... Jack Benny and Phil Harris are busy working on a new Paramount picture, Man About Town, and will not be here today. So in the meantime, Kenny and I are going to carry on and try to entertain you with songs and jokes. And I'm sure that we'll all have a good time. Now, first, ladies and gentlemen, I got a sweet little headache. I was out late last night. I've been out celebrating since Joe Lewis won that fight. <laughs> Rochester. I got a sweet little headache. Rochester, cut that out. This dressing room is no place for a serenade. And furthermore, I wish you'd help me get dressed. I'm chilly standing here in my underwear. You shouldn't be as long enough. <laughs> Rochester, the only reason I'm wearing this kind of underwear is to fill my legs out. So no comments. What are you going to wear today, boy? Well, the scene is a very formal dinner party in an English mansion. 
So, uh, give me my full dress suit. The one you bought outright? <laughs> yes, the new one. Get it for me. I want to try it on. Okay, here's the pants. Hold steady, boss. Careful now. Don't get them wrinkled. I won't have time to get them pressed. There you are. Yeah. Say, these trousers are beautiful, aren't they? Yeah, but they're too long. Shall I roll them up, tuck them in, or snip them a little? <laughs> Leave him alone. I'll pull him up. Now, let me try on the coat and see how that is. Yeah, you are, boss. Thanks. Mmm. Say, the coat's a little big, too. Mr. Benny? Mr. Benny, where are you? I'm right in here, Rochester. Don't get excited. <laughs> pull the collar down and give me some air. It'll be all right. Doggone it, I need a back collar button. I forgot to bring some. I'll go next door and borrow one from Phil Harris. Gee, here comes Claudette Colbert. Hello, Claudette. Who is it? Jack Benny, darn this suit. <laughs> well, here's Phil's dressing room. Look at that corny gold star on the door. <laughs> How do you do, sir? Oh, pardon me, I've got the wrong room. I'm looking for Phil Harris. These are his quarters. Whom shall I say is calling, please? Hmm. Jack Benny, I came to borrow a collar button. I'm very sorry, sir. I can't disturb Mr. Harris. He's in a mood. <laughs> He's in a what? In a mood. He's studying his pot. Well, I hate to break the spell, but tell him Prince Charming is here and he'd like to borrow a collar button. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, sir, but Mr. Harris is fiercely temperamental. And Elkins! Uh... Elkins, I say! Hmm, Elkins. Stop that dreadful chattering. Who is it anyway? It's a gentleman about a collar button, sir. Well, buy a couple and send him away. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Phil. It's me, Jack. Roper or Benny? Benny, Roper isn't up yet. <laughs> oh, hello, Jack. I didn't see you in that suit. No, you didn't. Well, if you want to know something, the suit was imported from England. Oh, heaven forbid. I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> hey, Phil, I need a collar button. Have you got one? I think so. Elkins, have we a collar button we can lend Mr. Benny? Well, uh, can he be trusted, sir? <laughs> Don't worry, I'll leave a deposit. <laughs> Say, Phil, this is a lovely dressing room. Well, gee whiz, have you got a shower bath? I sure have. Well, it's very ritzy, Phil. I don't know how you rate this. Tea is served, Mr. Harris. Thanks, Elkins, I'm famished. Tea? My goodness, what are those, crumpets? No, that's corn food. <laughs> Mr. Harris. <laughs> I say, Mr. Harris, don't on it. That I can understand. <laughs> tea and corn pone. What a combination. Mr. Benny, will you have your tea in a cup or in a saucer? Just bring it. How I drink it is my own business. <laughs> and where's my collar button? A collar button, sir? Oh, never mind. I'll use a thumbtack. I'm getting out of here. See you on the set, Lord Harris. Hmm. How do you ever get a dressing room like that? More politics around here. Well, here's my room. Ah! Oh, pardon me. I've got the wrong dressing room. <laughs> I wish they put my name on my door. Oh, here it is. Say, boss, I was just coming to get you. Miss Livingston's here. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. I thought I'd come down and watch you work. Have you got a big scene today? Well, it's not so big, Mary, but it's very emotional and calls for every dramatic trick at my command. You see, it's pathos, yet mingled with comedy. And at a certain point, I have to make a transition that will convince the audience of my sincerity and complete domination. Oh, brother. <laughs> well, just wait and you'll see some real acting. Say, Mary, how do you like my new full dress suit? I'm kind of dolled up, ain't I? Yes, top hat, white tie, and tent. Well, I'll grant you the suit is a little roomy, but I, I like freedom in my clothes. Well, you certainly got it. You could ring the Liberty Bell in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, Miss Livingston. You stay out of this, end man. <laughs> anyway, I got other things on my mind. I just came from Phil's dressing room, and I don't know why Paramount gives him a better one than mine. Why, well, there's no comparison. Oh, it's your own fault, Jack. Why don't you fight for things once in a while? This room is terrible. Yeah, I'm ashamed to invite my friends here. <laughs> well, that's too bad. I'm just worried sick about that. <laughs> why, there isn't a chair in the room with over three legs. And look at that big hole in the floor. That hole? Well, I'm really to blame for that. We thought there was oil under here. <laughs> All right, Rochester, just for telling, I'm going to kick you right out of the syndicate. 
But you're right, Mary. I'm going to do something about this. Rochester, get Mr. Hornblow on the phone. Okay, boss. Give me a nickel. Here. And that's another thing. Everybody else has a free telephone. This thing has gone just about far enough. Oh, you're always talking, but you never do anything. I don't, eh? I'll find out in a minute just how I stand around here. I can tell you now and save you a nickel. Is that so? Here you are, boss. Give me that phone. Hello, Mr. Hornblow. This is Jack Benny. Yes, it's me again. Now, look, Mr. Hornblow, I've been at Paramount for a long time, and I think I ought to have a new dressing room. I know, but how come Phil Harris has a shower bath, and I have to wash in the fire bucket? (laughs) Why, twice this week, the brigade snatched it right from under me. (laughs) I know, but... But Phil Harris... But Phil... But... 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 Here we go again, folks. Quiet. (laughs) What? But look, Mr. Hornblow, I don't want to stay in this dressing room. I haven't got anything to sit on. Oh, that's very funny. (laughs) Now, look, Mr. Hornblow, here's what I want. I want new chairs, a shower bath, Venetian blinds, a floor lamp... Roller skates. Roller skates. Mary, I'm not talking to Santa Claus. What's that? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hornblow. I'll appreciate that. Goodbye. Well, that's more like it. Gee, Jack, are you going to get all that stuff? Only the roller skates, but it's a beginning. <laughs> hey, Rochester, tune in the radio. I want to see what they're doing on our program. I can't. The dial's all rusty. Well, use the pliers like I do. <laughs> he never knows what to do. I got it. And now, folks, Kenny Baker, our popular young tenor, will sing... Uh, uh, what's it going to be, Kenny? I'm going to sing a number called Strange Enchantment from Paramount's new picture, Man About Town, starring Phil Harris. What? You heard me. Hmm, Wait till I get my hands on him. That was Strange Enchantment, sung by Kenny Baker. Turn off the radio, Mary. Okay. Hmm, Thinks he's cute. And I'm plenty burned up about Kenny Baker. Imagine him saying Man About Town, starring Phil Harris. Phil must have put him up to that. Yeah. You know, Mary's disgusting the way Phil tries to steal every scene in the picture. He's always doing something to draw attention away from me. Well, you don't have to worry today with that suit you've got on. (laughs) Yes, if I can remember to keep my head out. (laughs) Starring Phil Harris. I'm starring in that picture with Dorothy L'Amour. And another thing, if Phil doesn't stop telling Dorothy that I've got asthma, I'm going to have him thrown right off this lot. No kidding. Did he tell Dorothy you've got asthma? Yes. Now, every time I do a passionate love scene with her, she feels sorry for me. (laughs) I'll get even with that guy. Hey, boss, here's your makeup man. My makeup man? Oh, yes. Hello, Twinkle. Hello, Mr. Benny. Are we ready for our daily tussle with father time? I suppose so. Then tuck this towel around your neck and let's get going. Okay. And, Twink, uh, don't put so much makeup on my chin. Yesterday you buried my dimple. I did? Yes, and everybody was asking for it. (laughs) So be careful. Say, Jack, don't you think you ought to darken your hair a little bit at the temples? Mary, I'm not ashamed of the color of my hair. I'm prematurely gray. You've been saying that for 35 years. (laughs) Well, I was frightened when I was a baby. (laughs) Oh, Twinkle, I think you ought to pluck my eyebrows a little. They've been growing like mad lately. Okay. Say, boy. What is it, Rochester? Are you in the mood to reopen our monetary discussion? Rochester, if you're referring to that $10 I bet you on the Lewis Roper fight, I do not owe it to you. Well, Lewis knocked Roper out, didn't he? Not entirely. <laughs> Roper went down, but he started to get up. Man, can't you tell the difference between getting up and bouncing? <laughs> You can talk all you want, Rochester, but you're not getting the $10. Oh, why don't you pay him, Mr. Benny? You stay out of this. Who do you think you are, Chamberlain? (laughs) Just keep making me up. That's all you're supposed to do. I never saw anybody like you, Jack. You're always welching on bets. I am not. Anyway, Rochester will get his $10. I'm going to buy him that new vacuum cleaner he wants. Who wants? You wants and keep still. (laughs) More arguments about money around here. Ow! Twinkle, watch those tweezers. You're awfully nervous today, aren't you? Well, you'd be nervous, too, if your wife had twins last night. Oh, well, well, that's marvelous. Congratulations. Oh, it was nothing. (laughs) Well, that is news. (laughs) Hey, Jack, look in the mirror and get a load of your face. 
What's the matter with it? Oh, well, I'll be darned. Twinkle, what did you do before you became a makeup man? I used to decorate chinaware. Well, take those rosebuds off my cheeks. I'm not a teacup. <laughs> Why don't you concentrate on what you're doing, Twinkle? See, my face is a mess. <laughs> What are you laughing at? Twinkle stinkles. <laughs> That's what I say. Hiya, Jack. Hello, Mary. Hello, Kenny. Oh, it's you, Kenny. Why aren't you at NBC with Don? Oh, I got tired of his old nursery rhyme, so I thought I'd come and watch you shoot a scene. Is it all right? Sure, Kenny, but how'd you get through the gate? I told him I was your business manager. Oh, fine. So now you're my business manager. Mr. Baker, can I have a word with you? Rochester, forget about that $10. <laughs> my goodness. Say, Jack, are you going to shoot a big scene today? Well, it's not so big, Kenny, but it's very emotional and calls for every dramatic trick at my command. You see, it's pathos yet mingled with comedy. And at a certain point, I have to make a transition that will convince the audience of my sincerity and complete domination. Yes, sir. See, this is a crummy dressing room. <laughs> Kenny asked me a question, so I answered it. Incidentally, I heard that announcement you made of your song. What about it? You know what? I'm the star of the picture, not Bill Harris. Well, he told me you were playing the part of a janitor. Oh, he did, eh? Well, it so happens that I'm a lover in this picture, and I'm talking to Dorothy Lemour all the time. That you're leaning on a broom. Broom nothing. I'm carrying a cane. A beautiful ebony cane with a silver handle on one end. And a, and nail, a nail on, on the, the other. other. I knew you were going to say that. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> a janitor, eh? A janitor. Wait till I see Harris on the set. I'll give him a piece of my mind. They're all ready to be on the set, Mr. Benny. Okay, come on, kids. They're waiting for me. All ready to shoot the scene. I'm going to rush ahead. Rochester, you bring my cane. Okay. Don't stick yourself. Be on the set, kids. Shall I bring the dustpan? That belongs here. I'm not a janitor. So long. Gee, I hope I'm not late. Say, Jack, there's Phil. Oh, yes. Hey, pretty boy, I want to see you a minute. What's on your mind, Droopy? <laughs> Listen, Phil, did you tell Kenny that I was playing the part of a janitor in this picture? Yeah, but I just did that for a rib. That's all I want to know. You and I are through, Phil. I don't want to talk to you again. Now, wait a minute, Jack. It was just a gag. Who'd ever believe you were playing the part of a janitor? Plenty of people. <laughs> okay. From now on, we're no longer friends. Come on, Mary. I want to talk to Mr. Sandridge, the director. Where's Kenny? Over there on Dorothy Lamour's lap. Oh, yeah. And there's Edward Arnold. Now, look, there's Vinnie Barnes, too. She's beautiful, isn't she? Oh, you think every blonde is beautiful. I do not. Name one. Nelson Eddy. So there. <laughs> A blonde, if I ever saw one. Anyway, I think Vinnie Barnes is simply gorgeous. Hello, Vinnie. Hello, Vinnie. Gee, very witty, too. Hey, Rochester! Rochester! Quiet! Quiet on the set! That assistant director's always showing off. You can't even say boo around here. Boo! Hey, you quiet! <laughs> See? What a fresh guy. Did you call me, boss? Yes, where were you? I was over in the corner acclimating Mr. Harrison Butler. I'm teaching him Central Avenue ping pong. <laughs> Rochester, I told you not to bring those dice to this studio. Now throw them out. Not unless somebody feeds me. <laughs> Don't be so stubborn. Hey, Jack, look at Kenny. Where? Now he's on Vinnie Barnes's lap. Yeah, that kid sure gets around. Kenny, come here. Okay. Hey, you quiet on the set. Darn that guy. Look, Mary, here comes Mark Sandridge, the director. Hello, Jack. Uh, hello, Mr. Sandridge. Uh, say, I'd like you to meet uh, Mary Livingston. Oh, how do you do, Miss Livingston? I'm glad to see you. Then why don't you smile? Mary. And uh, Mr. Sandridge, uh, this is Kenny Baker. Hello. Well, young man, are you having a good time here on the set? Am I? I'm going to my third lap now. You'll stay right here with us Well, Jack, we're about ready to rehearse the scene in Lady Crumley's drawing room Oh, then Miss Barnes and Miss Lemoore aren't working today, huh? No, they just came for the laugh Oh, oh. And incidentally, Jack, uh, when you shoot the scene today, uh, don't look right into the camera You're not posing for a tin type Okay, I'll be careful Well, let's get started Lady Crumley, Theodore, and Milford Mary, uh, Phil is Theodore and I'm Milford I got a better name than he did. <laughs> All right, let's have one rehearsal, and then we'll shoot it. Why rehearse? I know my part. Quiet! Quiet on the set! Oh, shut up. That guy drives me nuts. <laughs> quiet, quiet. Now, Lady Crumley, you sit here on the divan. Yes, sir. And Theodore, you sit beside her. Okay, pal. Pal. You hear that, Mary? 
And Milford, uh, you sit over there on the ashtray. <laughs> Fine. I look like a Rube Goldberg cartoon. Yeah. Great place to sit. All right. Let's start the scene. Everybody ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Take it, Bill. <clears throat> <clears throat> You have a lovely place here, Lady Trumley. Oh, I'm glad you like it, Theodore. You know, Reggie used to visit here quite often. Ah, good old Reggie. I say, is he still at Monte Carlo? No, he's been at Biarritz since he and Evelyn split up. Split up? My word. But then Reggie always was a bounder. No, I think it was Evelyn's fault. She's a terribly stuffy person. Nonsense, my dear. Reggie's a cad, and you know it. Oh, how could you say that? Well, Reggie has been terribly abused. Don't you think so, Milford? You said it, sister. <laughs> Stop it! Stop it! Why, what's the matter? Jack, you don't call a titled English lady sister. You just have three words. You said it. Well, gee, Mr. Sandler, I was just trying to make it more emphatic, that's all. Well, don't be adding to your part. Film doesn't grow on bushes, you know. Oh, all right. Now, let's take it once more. And Theodore, I think it'd be a little better if you defend Reggie instead of Lady Trumley. It's more believable that way. Okay, Mark. Say, why can't I defend Reggie? Quiet! Quiet on the set! Oh, sure! <laughs> say a word here, anyway. Oh, get out of here, Mary. Stop laughing. Now, let's run through it once more. Remember the chain? Okay, let's go. You have a lovely place here, Lady Trumley. I'm glad you like it, Theodore. You know, Reggie used to visit here quite often. <clears throat> Jack! My throat was dry, for goodness sake! <laughs> Good old Reggie. I say, is he still at Monte Carlo? Oh, no. He's been at Biarritz since he and Evelyn split up. Split up? My word! Jeepers creepers. <laughs> Jack! Jack, what's the matter with you? Well, I want to say something. I'm an actor, not a sphinx. Now, you, you've got enough to do, so be satisfied. Continue, Lady Trumley. I don't blame yes. Evelyn. Reggie always was a bounder. No, I think it was Evelyn's fault. She's a terribly stuffy person. Nonsense, my dear. Reggie's a cad, and you know it. Oh, how can you say that? Poor Reggie's been a terribly abused boy. Don't you think so, Milford? <laughs> don't you think so, Milford? Yeah. Oh, heaven's sake, Jack. Uh, why don't you answer, Phil? We're not speaking, that's why. Jack, we're trying to make a picture. I can't be annoyed with your personal affairs. Well, I can't be annoyed with answering Phil Harris. Whose picture is this, anyway? Quiet, quiet on the set. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm going to punch you right in the nose. You would, you brute. <laughs> Fine cooperation I'm getting on this picture. Come on, Mary, I'm going home. No, wait a minute, Jack. Don't get excited. Excited? Now, look, Mr. Sandler. I've been studying this scene for days. Thank you. I, I know it isn't a big part, but it's very emotional. It calls for every dramatic trick I know. You see, it's pathos, yet mingled with comedy. And a certain point, point, I must make a transition that will convince the audience of my sincerity and complete domination. Now, if you think you can get somebody else to do that, go ahead and get Barrymore. I'm leaving. Rochester, give me my top hat and cane. Sorry, right, boss. The dice will against me. Oh, that's all I need. You said it. That's my line. Come on, let's get out of here. Quiet, quiet on the set. Oh, nuts. And we will be with you again next Sunday night. But I'd like to announce, folks, that daylight saving time goes into effect over some of these stations next week. So if your community is affected, don't forget the change. Say, Jack, what's daylight saving time? Well, you see, Mary... I know. It's pathos yet mingled with comedy and call for every dramatic trick at your command. That's not it at all. Good night, folks. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. For now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that this occasion is a gaily event on our Jell-O program. <laughs> Today marks the seventh radio anniversary of our illustrious and beloved Master of Ceremonies. Is it that long? Tempest Fugit. Exactly seven years ago today, a young man walked into a small New York broadcasting studio and spoke into a microphone for the first time. I was as nervous as a goldfish in a fraternity house. <laughs> Gee. There he stood, ladies and gentlemen, wearing a brown suit, cloth top shoes, a straw hat, and a cane. I finished with a dance in those days, folks. <laughs> so now, without further ado... We bring you that same young man in that same brown suit, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Well, 
Yes, hello again. This is Old Faithful, still spouting after all these years. And thanks, Don. It was awfully nice of you to remember my anniversary. But how did you ever happen to think of it? Well, I'll tell you, Jack. Last Wednesday, I received an anonymous letter stating all the details. Oh. And Thursday, I got a telegram saying, what are you going to do about it? Uh Uh-huh. So when you called up Friday and asked me how I liked my job, I just put two and two together. (laughs) I see. Well, believe me, it was just a coincidence. Anyway, that was a swell introduction, Don, but you're wrong about one thing. This is not the same suit I wore at my first broadcast. Oh, it isn't? No, this is a brand new one. And if you don't believe it, you can call up my tailors, the Campus Cut Tog Shop. (laughs) Open all night. (laughs) They'll tell you. Then I must apologize, Jack. Really, I thought you were wearing the same suit you wore seven years ago for sentimental reasons. What is that, Don? I said I thought you were wearing the same suit for sentimental reasons. No, Don, my father's carrying the torch now. (laughs) We're the same size, you know. But, Don, when you mentioned my first broadcast seven years ago, it sure brought back memories. I'll never forget how nervous I was that night. I was shaking like a leaf. Well, you must be nervous tonight, too, Jack. You're still shaking. No, and that's what worries me. Now I shake, but I'm not nervous. (laughs) (laughs) Gee, I can't be that old. Anyway, Don, this has been a great day for me. I got telegrams and flowers, and I got the grandest present from our sponsor... He sent me a lovely box of saltwater taffy. <laughs> Wasn't that nice? Oh, it certainly was. Have you eaten any yet? No, Don. I misplaced my heavy-duty tea. <laughs> I hope I find them, because corn on the cob will be along any day now. <laughs> I... <laughs> I must write and thank him, though. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Congratulations on your anniversary. Well, thanks. But gosh, Mary, how'd you happen to know about it? I've been trying to keep it a secret. Oh, stop. I saw that big ad of yours in the Hollywood Citizen News. Oh, that. Well, I was just advertising for a gardener. I need one. What does the ad say, Mary? I got it right here. Get this, son. Hmm. Wanted. Japanese gardener. Preferably an ex-acrobat from Vaudeville, where Jack Benny spent many happy years before he went into radio, and is now celebrating his seventh successful season on the air. Must have references. (laughs) Well, I wanted a gardener with experience. (laughs) Look what you got at the bottom of the ad. Well. Address all replies. Jack Benny, Paramount Studio, where he is now starring in Man About Town. And bring your own lawnmower. (laughs) Look, Mary, gardeners are very hard to get, so it doesn't hurt to build yourself up a little. Anyway, I don't think you should ridicule me on my anniversary. Oh, I didn't mean anything, Jack. No. As a matter of fact, I brought your present. Well, that's different. What is it? Here you are. A pair of woolen socks, and I knitted them all by myself. Oh, well, let's see them. Well, that was sweet of you, Mary. Say, these socks are swell, but look, what's the idea of the zipper on the side? Uh, That's so you can put your money in without rolling them down. (laughs) Mary, I told you a thousand times I don't keep money in my sock. That lump is where the end of my underwear meets my ankle. (laughs) Mighty green country down there. (laughs) Well, it's wonderful for grazing if you want to go haywire. (laughs) Anyway, thanks for my gift. Only sometimes I wish that you'd... Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. Telegram? Take it, Mary. Here's a tip for you, son. Oh, Judy, a nitchel. So long. <laughs> he must have been eating some of my taffy. What does the telegram say, Mary? It's uh, from your sister Florence. Oh, uh, from Florence. Mm-hmm. She says, congratulations on reaching your seventh anniversary. And I hope that, signed Florence. That's her, all right. Ten words is her limit. <laughs> Funny, she's always been like that. Oh, hello, Kenny. Hiya, Jackson. Are you right on the beam tonight? Are you jiving, kid? <laughs> what? Are you whipping it up, Elmer? <laughs> I see. Kenny, I wish you'd stop hanging around our swing-happy maestro, Bill Harris. He's a bad influence. Oh, I don't know. Well, I do. You used to be a beautiful baby, and now you're a corny Joe. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Smell this flower in my buttonhole, and I'll squirt your eye out. (laughs) Kenny, stop that immediately. And take off that badge. You're not a chicken inspector. Hmm, chicken inspector yet. Well, Phil's got one that says, Step up, sugar, here's your honey. (laughs) Wow, I'll bet that really gets the girls. 
You know, Mary, I think it's a crime what Phil is doing to Kenny. He's making a regular smart aleck out of him. You said it. Kenny was standing in front of the drugstore this afternoon, and when I walked by, he went... I did not. I went... (laughs) Oh, you did. That's fine, Kenny, whistling at girls. Well, you do it. Listen, Kenny, I haven't whistled at a girl since the pool room burned down in Waukegan. (laughs) Now, you behave yourself, young man. Say, uh, Kenny, aren't you going to congratulate Jack? This is a big day for him, you know. Oh, Don, let's forget it. He wouldn't appreciate it anyway. Nobody does in this gang. Now, wait a minute, Jack. I can't speak for the others, but I've been loyal to you always, and you know it. Yes, you have, Don. That, I must admit. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Remember the first time I knocked at your door three years ago? Yes. You thought I was nuts, didn't you? I certainly did. Well, I'm cured now. (laughs) I can't understand that. He came in on foot. Sing, Kenny. (laughs) That was Our Love, sung by Kenny Baker. And, Kenny, you were exceptionally good tonight. That song was very well rendered. Yeah, I thought it was right in the old groove (laughs) room Isn't that awful? groove a Kenny, what does that mean? What does it mean? You don't get around much, do you, brother? <laughs> now, Kenny, for the last time, I want you to cut out that lingo and stay away from Phil Harris. I'm going to have to do something about that. Say, Jack, uh-huh. while Kenny was singing, another wire came for you. It's from Fred Allen. Oh, Fred Allen, eh? What does it say? It says, uh, Dear Jackass. <laughs> Give me that wire. Hmm. That's Dear Jack. As this is your seventh anniversary. (laughs) You gotta make it jackass. As this is your seventh anniversary, I feel that you deserve a tribute. So I raise my hand and salute you, Fred Allen. Well, there's a novelty, Allen saluting me. I bet he's doing it in a novel way, too. Never mind, I prefer to take it the sweet way. Well, here comes our musical madcap, Phil Harris. You're tardy as usual, I see. I'm sorry I'm late, Jack, but I live way out in Encino, and it takes me quite a while to get here. Oh, well, this happens to be your job, Phil, so why do you live in Encino? I like it. It's hilly there. I thought so. Well, take off that coonskin cap. You're in the city now. (laughs) Now, don't let this happen again. Okay. Hiya, Kenny. Have you been swinging out gate? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I tell you, pal, we've been cutting a rug or two, but these alligators here don't know nothing about jamming. <laughs> oh, we don't, eh? Never mind, Kenny, we'll go out later. I got a couple of jitter dolls lined up, and we'll take them out for a twirl. Okay, but I got to be home by 9 o'clock. <laughs> Phil, aren't you ashamed of what you're doing to Kenny? No, why? After all, he's just a kid. If you got a couple of jitter dolls lined up, I'll jam with you. <laughs> I'm hep. <laughs> I may not be an alligator pal, but I can jive a bit. What do you say? All right, Jack, what time do you have to be home? I can stay out as late as I want to, Smarty. My father's in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> and now, folks, as my cast is finally assembled, and they are all more or less actors, for our play this evening, we are going to present... Play nothing, didn't you tell them, kids? Well, no, Phil, I thought you wanted to surprise Jack. Surprise me with what? Well, Jack, this being your anniversary, I'm throwing a little party for you and the gang. A party? Yes, and it's all on me. Well, gee, this is a surprise. Awfully sweet of you, Phil, but where are we going? No drive-in stands now. No, sir. Huh? No, sir, I'm taking you to Slepperman's Hawaiian Nightclub. I got a table reserved and a cab waiting downstairs. Say, that's well, but what about the program? Oh, my boys can play a few numbers. Let's go. Okay, gee, I can hardly wait to see Slepperman's place. Come on, fellow. Oh, I I let's go. Oh, Jack's a jolly good fellow. 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 Which nobody can deny. Oh, Come on, gang, oh, let's go. Oh, Gee, Phil, I can't get over you throwing this party for me. Ah, forget it, pal. Anybody that's been in radio as long as you have deserves it. I do at that. Hey, Mary, what are you doing on the floor of the cab? I thought you were sitting on Don's lap. I was, but I slid off. Slid off? Whee! It's fun, too. (laughs) Kenny, stop that. That's what I say. Yeah. Oh. Hey, are we here already? Yep, this is the place. Come on, fellas. Hey, driver. 
Driver, how much the cab fare? That'll be a dollar ninety cents. Okay, I got it. Wait a minute, Phil. Let me pay for the cab. Let me pay it. I got the change right here. Uh, no, fellas, let me pay it. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> here you are, driver. You got hooked, didn't you, sporty? <laughs> None of your business. <laughs> well, here we are. Hey, Jack, look at that sign. The Hawaiian Swing Club. Hockalua Schlepperman, proprietor. Oh, yes. Look who's standing in the doorway. Hello, stranger. Schlepperman. <laughs> Welcome to Hula Land. High class food for low class people. Oh, oh, wow. Wow. Hey, Schlepp, what's the idea? What's the idea of the high hat, tuxedo, and bare feet? I'm a beachcomber that reads Esquire. Oh. Well, right here this way, everybody. Come on in, everybody. Okay. Oh, yeah. gorgeous place, isn't it, Jack? It sure is. Real tropical atmosphere. Palm trees and coconuts hanging on them. Say, Schlepp, where do we check our hats? Better keep them on. The coconuts are loose. Oh, I see. Ouch! <laughs> there goes one now. Yeah, say, we better be careful. Hey, Schlepp, where's your wife? She's in the kitchen. And, Jack, when I tell her you're here, she'll go crazy. Oh, Lotus Blossom! <laughs> but... Who do you think is here? Jack Benny. All right, so hooray. <laughs> Boy, is she thrilled. Well, sit down, everybody. Would you like a little refreshments before eating? Sure, I'll have some Hawaiian punch. I'd like some, too. Me, too. I'll let dry martini. Kenny, you'll have a glass of milk. Okay, put an olive in it. <laughs> Never mind. Well, Gringles, make yourself at home. I'll be back in a jiffy. Excuse me. See you later, Slip. Okay. Wow, this sure is a hot spot. <laughs> Kenny, wait till you get your milk. <laughs> You know, Phil Schlepp's doing a great business here, isn't he? Oh, it's packed all the time. Yeah. Come on, come on, let's have a little action around here. Where's the hula dancers? Bring on the girls! Hey, that guy seems to be a little bit under the weather. I'll say, I hope he doesn't come over here. He's waving at you, Jack. Just ignore him, he'll go away. You know, Mary, I think... Hiya, Jack, old boy, old pal. How's the kid? Ooh, my back. <laughs> See, I don't even know the guy. Am I glad I bumped into you? Say, who's got a match? Here you are, buddy. Hey, now listen, you stay out of this, tubby. I'm talking to my old pal, Jack. Gee, I don't even know the guy. Here you are, mister. Here's a match. Oh, try to get tough, huh? No, you asked for a match, and I gave it to you. A match? And I don't worry, Jack. I'll get you a match if I have to turn this place inside out. <laughs> Who's got a match for uh, my old pal, Jack? Now, who's got a match? Gee, I never saw the guy before in my life. Well, gentlemen, here's the appetizers. And in just a minute, we're going to have a floor show. Say, Schlepp, uh, there's a fellow been annoying us here. You better throw him out. Where is he? That big guy over there. I'm sorry. My wife is the bouncer. <laughs> well, something ought to be done about that guy. Uh, pardon me, Jackie. I'm going to start the show. All right, boys. Step on it. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Before starting our entertainment, I would like to announce that we have a big celebrity here tonight. None other than Jack Benny from the radio. I never heard of him. Never heard of him. There's your pal, Jack. Quiet. Come on, everybody. Let's give Jack Benny a real Hawaiian reception. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, folks. Sit down, you big ham. Sit down. Hey, what is this, anyway? Ouch, darn those coconuts. <laughs> Go ahead, Schlepp. Ladies and gentlemen, first on tonight's program, we have a little surprise for you. In honor of Jack Benny's seventh anniversary, Miss Mary Livingston and yours truly are going to sing a special Hawaiian song for their kids, assisted by the Boyle Heights Beach Boys. Oh! Now, Mary, did you frame this? Where did you hear it? Come on, come on, Mary. Go ahead, don't be bashful. All right, boys. Hello, Taluki. Home too. I want to go back to my little grass sack in Kaliakawaka High. I want to be with all the connies and wahinis that I knew long ago. And a girl, Mary! I can hear old guitars are playing on the beach at Olsen Park. I can hear those Hawaiians saying. And I just sacky, nicky, wacky, wicky, wacky, walaka hui. Won't be long till my ship will be sailing back to Cone. Cone! A grand old place that's always fair to see. 
Well, that was beautiful, Mary. Hey, folks, how would you like to hear Jack Benny play a violin solo? Oh, no, Phil. Come on, come on, Jack. Oh, no, I don't want to. Come on, Jack, old pal. Love me blue. All right, fellas, if you insist. Have you got a violin here, Schlepp? No, Jackie, I haven't got one. Oh, well, it's lucky I brought my own. I thought I might be called on. All right, boys, give me an introduction on Love and Blue. That's what we want, you morass. No, I wish they'd be quiet. All right, hit it, boys. Out of boy, Jackie O'Bow, the overrides. Oh, for heaven's sake. Isn't that awful? That's the sweetest song was ever written. I was in love once. Well, you're in gloom now, so keep still. I was in love with the sweetest little girl in the world. Agnes, come back to me. I've had enough of this. Slapperman, if you don't throw this fellow out, I will. Go ahead. The customer's always right. Here, Mary, hold my coat. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute now, Jack. Calm down. This is all a rib. A rib? Yes, I hired that guy to heckle you. <laughs> you sure <laughs> fell for it, didn't you? Oh, I get it. Well, you sure fooled me, buddy. Hey, come over and join us. Have a drink. Okay, Mr. Benny, I'll have a cherry phosphate. <laughs> Say, you certainly had me going there for a minute. Come on, let's all sit down and have a good time. <laughs> Ow! Kenny, get down out of that tree. <laughs> What an anniversary. Hey, Slap, how about the few? Come in. Come in right up. Oh, Lord, this blossom. Lord, this blossom. And we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Oh, Jack, here's another telegram just came from you, for you. Hmm? From Lloyd's of London. Lloyd's of London? What does it say? It says, congratulations on reaching your seventh year in radio, although you cost us plenty. Well, I've been fooling them for years. Good night, folks. The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. For now, ladies and gentlemen, the spring is here and well underway. Tonight, we bring you a big dose of sulfur and molasses, Jack Benny. Thank you. Thank you. Jell-O again, this is tough to take Benny coming to you, so hold your nose, folks, and swallow hard. Ain't I awful? You know, Don, we can laugh now about sulfur molasses, but when I was a kid, I hated that stuff, didn't you? Oh, I sure did. Gee, I remember every time my mother gave it to me, I used to go, ugh. Ugh? Yeah. Oh, sometimes I'd go, ish. But as a rule, I'd stick to ugh. It was a colloquial expression in Waukegan. Well, yeah. tell me, Jack, did you say ugh for cod liver oil, too? Ugh for cod liver oil? Heavens no, Don. For cod liver oil, the correct ejaculation is brrrr nagasaki. <laughs> I, uh, I remember that distinctly. Well, that's about the silliest routine I've ever heard. I'm getting out of here before the wagon pulls up. Well, you're a fine one to criticize, Mr. Harris, with that baby talk of yours. What baby talk? I heard you on the air last night singing the three little fishes. Top to the mama fitty top if you can, and the fam and the fam right over the dam. Whee! Now, wait a minute. You should have heard him, folks. Boop, boop, did him, dot him, wad him. You know, Phil, just because you drink like a fish, you don't have to act like one. <laughs> Imagine a big gawk like you singing twee itty fishies. Hmm? Well, why shouldn't I? It's a very popular song, and it's sweeping the country. It is, eh? Yes, and I get lots and lots of wee twats to think. 
Oh, who do? <laughs> well, listen, Phil, don't ting it in here if you want to keep your job. I'm getting sick and tired of you towing off all the time. Well, I don't care about my job here anyway. I'm in pictures now. I'm doing swell. And if you want to know something, I'm even trying to get rid of my orchestra. Oh, you are, eh? Well, Phil, for your information, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, do not dump orchestra in ash can until you are out of sane. <laughs> I found that in a rice cookie. So you better stick to radio, Phil, you and your twee itty fishies. Oh, cut it out. Cut it out. Cut it out yourself and cut up. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, kitties. Can an adult get in this conversation? I think so. Say, Mary, did you ever hear Phil do that baby song, Three Itty Fishies? Sure, I was over at the Wilshire Bowl the other night and saw him do it. Everybody stopped dancing to watch him. Got plenty of laughs, didn't I, Mary? Who wouldn't with those diapers you were wearing? <laughs> Oh, oh, dressing for the part, eh? Yeah, and you want to know something, Jack? What? Our maestro is knock-kneed. Knock-kneed? Hey, I didn't know that. Oh, she's ribbon, Jack. I ain't knock-kneed. Go on, you couldn't get a piece of dental floss between those knobs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. So the big movie star is knock-kneed. That's rich. Quiet, hoop legs. <laughs> Mary, we were discussing Phil. Anyway, we've got a long play to do tonight, so let's all settle down and get started. Uh, where's Kenny? Kenny, I saw him across the street in the sandwich shop. Oh. You should have seen him flirting, Jack. You know, they've got a new waitress over there. They have? Bill, come back here! <laughs> I never saw such a guy. Well, I'm hungry. If you're hungry, take a sandwich out of my bucket. <laughs> it's, under the, uh, it's under the piano, right next to my police dog. Oh, Jack, why do you have to bring that dog down here? Nobody's going to steal your lunch. Oh, no? Take a good look at those drooling, dipsy doodlers sitting there. <laughs> I need that dog all right. Say, Jack, why do you always bring your lunch to the studio anyway? Eighteen years ago, he lost a hat in a restaurant. Mary, I've been trying to forget that. So please. <laughs> Quiet, Baskerville. <laughs> Say, Mary, what were you saying before about Kenny? Well, he was in the sandwich shop trying to date up that new waitress. Uh -huh. He had three malted milks, two ice cream sodas, and a banana split before he got her first name. Ooh, goodness. How could he eat all that stuff? With a spoon! Ha ha! That's a good one. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm going home, that's all. I'm going home. Come on, Baskerville. What's the matter, Jack? I thought that was pretty quick thinking. Listen, Ezra. <laughs> I want you to cut out those ad libs. You've started more bridge games in the middle of our program than anybody on it. <laughs> you know what kills me, Don? I work and slave over a script all week long. And then on Sunday, the Maharaja walks in and with three little words puts us right back on the Chautauqua circuit. <laughs> with a spoon. Well, it just came to me and I said it. Oh, fine. So we might as well have a number. Play something, Phil. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Is Phil Harris going to sing Three Little Fishes tonight? No, and who are you? Just a hungry college boy. Goodbye. <laughs> I wonder if the CCC boys could plant something on his head. Play, Phil. <laughs> that was Rose of the Rio Grande, played by Phil Harris and his Miracle Mile music mangler. <laughs> And just to be fair about it, I must admit that that number was very good. It was swell. I didn't think it was loud enough. Not loud enough? <laughs> Why, Phil, you've got three violins in your orchestra, which I know will be startling news to our listening audience. <laughs> They're plenty loud. Not for me. i got to put more brass in my band. More brass? Phil, you've got a trumpet player alone that Gabriel will have a tough time following. <laughs> And that last number, he blew a pompadour right up the back of my neck. <laughs> Just leave well enough alone, Phil. And now, folks... Just the same, I need more sock to my music, more volume. Why don't you put in a burglar alarm? That's all he needs. And now, folks... My band may sound all right oh. to you, Jack, but as far as I'm concerned, I don't hear enough brass. Phil, just pin your curls up over your ears and everything will be ducky. <laughs> Now, let's get on with our show. Hey, Jack, look who just came in. Oh, yes, our sandwich shop, Casanova. Hello, Kenny. Hello, Jack. Boy, am I sick. Well, you should be sick. After three malted milks, two ice cream sodas, and a banana split. All of, all of that just to talk to a girl. I'm going out with her tonight if I feel better. 
Oh, you are, eh? Yeah, I got her phone number right here in this card. Gee, she's beautiful. Give me that number, Kenny. I'll hold it for you till you grow up. Come on, give it to me. I won't. You give me that or I'll tell your mother. All right. Here, you stool pigeon. It's more like it. Oh, Jack, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Mary, I only took that phone number away from Kenny because he's too young to be going out with girls. Well, you're too old, so give it a fill. <laughs> Oh, no. Come on, Jackson. Make way for tomorrow. <laughs> Phil, you're not getting her number, and neither is Kenny. You think she'd like a fat boy? <laughs> what is this, a grab bag? Now, nobody's getting this girl's number, so forget it. Looks like she's stuck with Foxy Grandpa. <laughs> Mary, I'm merely holding her phone number because Kenny is too young. Let's see this. Oxford, seven, three. Kenny, is this a three or a five? Well, I'll tell you when I grow up. <laughs> Here, you can have it back. I was only kidding. Say, Kenny, old pal, I got an idea. Why don't you bring your girlfriend over to the Wilshire Bowl tonight? I'll let you leave my van. You better hang your girl in the check room, Kenny. <laughs> you said it, Mary. And how? You know, Jack, the last time I brought a girl over to Phil's place, Phil came home with us in a cab. Well, I bet you were plenty burned up, weren't you? I'll say I had to sit up front with the driver where I couldn't hear the radio. <laughs> Oh, so Phil got your girl, eh? Yeah. Well, Kenny, for your edification, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, he who introduces girlfriend to Phil Harris had better carry spare. <laughs> and now, kiddies, let's forget our love life and get on with the program. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, yesterday marked another running of that great annual turf classic, the Kentucky Derby. So for our play tonight... We are going. Well, by the way, Jack, did you place a bet on the big race yesterday? Yes, Don. I had two dollars on the winner, Johnstown. I had a terrific hunch on him. That's Jack, all right. He throws away his money like a boomerang. <laughs> now, Mary, that horse wasn't so sure of winning. You didn't play him to win. Oh, that's right. I had him to show. <laughs> and getting now, getting back to our play, as I was saying, folks, yesterday was the running of the Great Kentucky Derby. So tonight, the Benny Perry Mutual Players will present an original play dedicated to this outstanding event. This will go on. Uh, hey, is this the Jell-O program? What? Why, Andy Devine, the old mayor of Van Nuys himself. Come on in. Hiya, bud. Well, <laughs> hey, I haven't seen him in a long time. Andy, gee, I haven't seen you in weeks. Uh, why don't you drop around once in a while? Well, I've been pretty busy on the farm, Buck. You know, it's spring, and I've been doing all the planting and plowing, and it's a lot of work. For one man. I'll bet it is. Hey, well, doesn't your paw do anything on the farm? No, Buck, he's got a system. Oh. He makes cider in the fall, bottles it in the winter, drinks it in the spring, and sleeps all summer. <laughs> well, at least he's happy. But, Andy, with all you got to do, I should think you'd try and get a little work out of your paw. Oh, I don't trust him, Buck. Last year he took a couple of snorts and plowed up Highway 99. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, well, I'm glad you found time to come down to see us. Say, Andy, uh, how's your ma? Oh, she's fine, Buck. Pa took her up to the San Francisco Fair last week. Well, that was nice. He tried to get her a job with Sally Rand, but they turned her down. They turned her down? Why? She's got your trouble, Buck. Bow legs. <laughs> now, wait a minute. The next one on this program that says I've got bow legs has got to chase a pig through them. It's a cinch. Never mind. <laughs> Say, Andy, how do you happen to be in town today? Oh, I'll come down to pick up my girl. She just got a job across the street in that sandwich shop. In the sandwich shop? Cheapers, creepers, I'm cooked. <laughs> Serves you right, Kenny. Say, Andy, I don't suppose I ought to tell you this, but Kenny happens to have your girl's phone number. Let it ring, Buck. I'll answer it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're pretty sharp. Well, now that you're here, Andy, I hope you can stick around because tonight we're doing a play about the Kentucky Derby. And I think we can find a spot in it for you. What do you say? Okay, Buck, I hope I'm a jockey. <laughs> we'll see, Andy. And now, folks, Kenny Baker, our young tenor, will sing... Uh, what are you going to sing, Kenny? Penny Serenade. It's a request. Oh, who requested it? Andy's girl. So I'm just going to sing it mediocre. Now, Kenny, you mustn't let your personal feelings influence your song. Remember, you're a trooper. You're right, Jack. I'll sing like I've never sung before. The show must go on. What a clock. You said it. Sing, Payaki. <laughs> that was Kenny Serenade, sung by Kenny Baker. 
And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we will bring you our tribute to the Kentucky Derby by presenting a little play in two scenes and three furlongs, entitled, Weather Clear, Track Fast, Fine Play, Bum Cat. <laughs> now, in this turf drama, we will all play the parts of horses. I mean, we will all play horses. Uh, pardon me, huh? This is silly. I'm not going to be a horse. Kenny, if I can get down on my hands and knees, you can. Only he can get up. Uh, I can get up, too, so don't be so smart. Well, that's settled. We're all going to be horses. I'd like to see somebody put a saddle on me. Quiet, El Chico. <laughs> and pin on your tail. I want this to be realistic. Now, before presenting this play, folks, I would like to announce that any resemblance to horses, living dead or under General Sherman... <laughs> is purely coincidental. The opening scene is the paddock at Churchill Downs, 20 minutes before the big race, where we find El Chico, Johnstown, Technician, Shaladon, Heather Broom, On Location, and all the other entries to in the fast. Curtain. Music. We're horses now, folks. Oh, Shaladon. Shaladon. Yes, Technician. <laughs> You better lay off those oats. You know, you've been putting on a lot of weight. Oh, I'm not so heavy. You're not. You're the only horse in this stable with a double chin, and you know it. <laughs> Say, Shaladon, look at El Chico over there with that curly mane of his. That's a finger wave if I ever saw one. <laughs> what are you eating, El Chico? Corn. I thought so. <laughs> hmm. I, I suppose you think you're going to win today. Why, pal, my tail will be in your face all around that track. Oh, it will, eh? Yeah. Listen, El Chico, if your tail comes anywhere near my mouth, I'll bob it. <laughs> so watch out. Oh, hello, Heather Broom. What are you reading? A letter from my brother. He's with Borden's Dairy now. Oh. <laughs> uh, isn't he pulling that ice wagon anymore? No, he got cold feet. I see. See, I hope I don't wind up on a wilt wagon. I hate those early hours. Well, Heather Broom, good luck to you today. Hey, Heather, what are you doing after the race tonight? Oh, nothing. Let's go over to the Blue Moon Livery Stable. They have a marvelous floor show. They have? Who's playing there? Pink's Mules. <laughs> oh, they're wonderful. There's a little brunette on the end. Well. How about going there with me tonight, Heather? It's a date. I've got a beautiful new blanket I'm going to wear. It's from Sac Bay Meadows. Now, wait a minute, El Chico. Heather has a date with me tonight, and I'm going to pick her up at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock? You won't be coming into the stretch till 10. I won't, eh? They clocked me this morning, brother, and I heard my trainer say, if I get on the rail at the first turn, I'll jive right in. <laughs> so there. Hey, fellas, there's Johnstown over there. Gee, he's swell-headed. Yeah, I think he's smart because he's a favorite. Look at him getting a hoof a cure <laughs> What does he think he is, anyway? Well, here comes on location. Oh, yeah. Hiya, fellas. Hello, Juan. You think you've, uh, you think you've got a chance today? I will if it's a wet track. You know, I'm a terrific mutter. You should be. You don't know enough to come in out of the rain. <laughs> now, Heather. Well, I'm 40 to 1 today, Smarty. Well, that's nothing to brag about. It ain't, huh? I'd be 60 to 1 if people knew I had that banana split. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Shaladon, I told you to lay off those oats. Well, I'm starved. I know, but passing you on the track now is practically a detour. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Darn these flies. Get away from me, old horse fly. I want Shaladon. There's meat on him. <laughs> Cat, shoot. Well, fellas, we still got a few minutes to kill before the race. What do we do? How about pitching a game of horseshoes? Oh, I don't want to take them off just for that. <laughs> Say, who's that new white horse in the stall across the way? They just unloaded him this morning. Haven't you heard? That's Abdul the Third, an Arabian horse. Oh, an Arabian, eh? I must get acquainted. Hello, Abdul. Hello, stranger. <laughs> uh, my name is Technician. Uh, where are you from? I mean, what's your lineage? Are you alluding to me? Yes, where are you from? I'm out of the filter girl by Bagel Boy. <laughs> oh, yes, I read about your family in the Breeder's Digest. Uh, you come from very good stock. Why, certainly. You ain't talking to our club, you know. Well, I appreciate that. By the way, Abdul, why aren't you in the big race today? I should get high blood pressure for a bag of oats. 
Oh, come on, run in the race. No, not me, partner. Oh, come on, don't be so stubborn. I can't help it. I got mule blood in me. Well, <laughs> you'd never know it. Hey, that's for us, fellas. We better get going. So long, Abdo. Good luck, technician. Gee, I'm nervous. Darn it, I can't find my blinkers. Guys, my mane looks beautiful. I bet I get a big hand. El Chico, put down that mirror. You're a fine three-year-old. Look at those bags under your eyes. <laughs> now, come on, tails up, everybody. We're off to the race. Gee, hey, look at that crowd. We're sure packing them in today, huh? Well, folks, here come the horses up to the barrier, ready for the big race. Oh, it's a lovely day here at Churchill Downs. I wish you could see these beautiful bang tails prancing up to the post. Bang tails, I hate that word. <laughs> They're lining up, folks. There's John Sound, the favorite, Sheladon, Heather Broom, El Chico, and on location. You didn't even mention me. Hey, move over, El Chico. You want the whole track? Quiet, you old gray mare. <laughs> I'm not a mare. Then take your hoof off your hip. <laughs> That's where the fly bit me. There's a little trouble down there, folks. Technician is glaring at El Chico. You're darn right I am. And now Heather Broom is acting up. Seems to be quite temperamental. What's the matter with you, Heather? Stop fidgeting. Well, my girdle's too tight. <laughs> That's a saddle. And how are you going to run in those high-heeled shoes? Who's your blacksmith, anyway? I'm Miller. Oh. I know him. He used to shoe my mother when she ran at Saratoga. The horses are calming down now. They're all lined up, uh, all except one who's facing the wrong way. That's me, folks. Wouldn't you know it? <laughs> yes, turn around. On location, it's back in line now, and it looks like we're going to have... Yikes! We're off! And there they go! They broke clean and fast, and Johnstown takes the lead, followed closely by El Chico. T.M. Dorset is third. Then comes Heather Broom, this county, on location, and Shaladon. Hey, what am I, an orphan? And oh, yes, there's Technician, puffing hard. I am not. Oh, folks, what a race. Johnstown is still in the lead by two lengths. El Chico second, Heather Broom third, and Technician is doing the best he can with those bow legs. I'd like to kick him right in the face. They're rounding the far turn now, folks, and coming into the stretch, Johnstown is leading by three miles. Don't exaggerate. Saladon and Heather Broom are moving up. Looks like they're going to finish in the money. I'm going to finish in the money, too. You wouldn't if you ever spent any. <laughs> oh, yeah? Wow, look at that Johnstown run. He's still way in the lead. And look, folks, here comes Malicious on the outside. Malicious? He isn't even running. Quiet! They're nearing the finish line, folks. Here they come. They're crossing the wire. And here are the winners. John Stout first by eight miles and six lengths. Galadon second by a length and a half. Heather Broom third by a half. Technician fifth by a no. I was robbed. And on location last by courtesy of Mervyn Leroy. <laughs> Gee, I'm all in. And here's the winner, Johnstown, coming up to the microphone. Say something, Johnstown. Put the oats on, Ma. I'll be right home. <laughs> oh, what a race. Play, El Chico. And we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time when we will present our version of Pandro S. Berman's great RKO production, Gunga Dean. Don't miss it, folks. India, elephants, camels, soldiers, drums, bugles, and I will be Gunga Dean. You got nice legs for it. Quiet. Good night, folks. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this being Mother's Day, we bring you that little old lady, Jack Benny. <laughs> Thank you. Hello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And before going any further, I wish mothers everywhere a happy holiday. You know, Don, I thought that was cute. You're calling me a little old lady, although I didn't quite get the inference. Well, Jack, I meant that as a compliment. Oh. You're always so neat and meticulous. Every little detail must be perfect. Everything you do must be just so. In other words, Don, I'm a fuss budget. Exactly. <laughs> Don, I may run my finger across the piano keys to see if they're dusty. And I may spank my cat for joining a lonesome club. <laughs> but I'm not a fuss budget. 
Am I, Mary? Not much. What about that sign you got on the front door of your house? What sign? Please take shower before entering. <laughs> Mary, that's Rochester's fault. It should be by my swimming pool. Anyway, that still doesn't justify Don's introduction. I'm not an old lady. Go on. I saw you crossing Hollywood Boulevard yesterday, and a Boy Scout was helping you. <laughs> well, it was the rush hour. <laughs> You know, Phil, Hollywood Boulevard is a pretty busy street. It's quite dangerous crossing it. Well, why don't you wait for the lights? If he could see the lights, he wouldn't need a Boy Scout. <laughs> Never mind. I think the Boy Scout movement is a great institution. In fact, I used to be one myself. I belonged to the Panther Patrol in Waukegan. Oh, so you were a Boy Scout, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, Jack, when I was a kid, I belonged to the Beaver Patrol in Denver. No kidding. Say, Phil, were you ever a Boy Scout? No, I went right from the cradle into the Elks. <laughs> I believe you. You know, Phil, you haven't got near the sentiment that Don has, or I have, or the rest of the gang. Oh, I don't know. Well, I bet you didn't even send a present today to your sweet old mother down in Tennessee. He did, too, Jack. I was in the store with him when he bought it. You're darn right. Well, that's a surprise. What did he get for his mother, Mary? A brand new corn cob pipe. <laughs> hmm. She'll love it. Well, I guess they're all the rage in the hills. <laughs> Say, Phil, do your folks still live in Possum Junction? No, they moved to Grub Hollow for the feudin season. <laughs> oh, it's lovely there, then, with the shotguns all in bloom and the mountain dew behind every stump. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, cut it out, Jack. You're making me homesick. I'm sorry, Phil. Anyway, I'm very happy that you remembered your mother today. Say, Jack, you know, I sent my mother a present, too. A lovely bottle of perfume. Perfume, huh? Yeah, it's called L'Amour Tijour Ocean Park. Oh Phil says it's great stuff Phil, what's he got to do with it? His guitar player makes it <laughs> Oh, he does <laughs> You know, Phil, you've got the only musicians in the world That could go into some other business tomorrow And I wish they would <laughs> <laughs> Well, fellas, let's get down to work We've got a long play to do tonight And I think we better get Hello, going. Jack. What are you talking about? Well, what do you think I'll be talking about, Kenny, today of all days? Your new picture. I was I was not. I'm surprised at you, Kenny. Don't you know what day this is? Oh, why don't you give him a hint, Jack? This is a tough one. Tough one? Why, everybody should know who we're dedicating this day to, especially a young fellow like him. Kenny, who made you wash behind your ears when you were a kid? Nobody. I had curls. <laughs> There you are. Look, Kenny, it's somebody's day today. Now, who do you go to when you're in trouble and everybody else has failed you? Who do you go to? Oh, I know. Mervyn Leroy. <laughs> well, I give up. Try and give that kid a hint. And now, folks, Kenny Baker will sing. What do you want to sing, Kenny? For my mother, which I prepared especially for this occasion. Go ahead. Hey, wait a minute. If you had a song prepared for your mother, how could you walk in here not knowing what day this is? I didn't walk. I skipped in. <laughs> oh, that explains it. Sing, Kenny. <laughs> that was For My Mother, sung by Kenny Baker. That was a beautiful number, Kenny, and a sweet thought. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as we announced last week, for our feature attraction tonight and our bid for the Academy Award, <laughs> we bring you our version of Mr. Pandro S. Berman's great RKO Super Spectacle. A drama based on that immortal classic, an inspiring masterpiece dedicated to that brave and fearless hero, Gunga Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Berman. Uh, this story is about a boy called Gunga Dean who went through life wearing nothing but a loincloth. Say, Jack, what's a loincloth? A loincloth, Kenny, is a sarong with an inferiority complex. <laughs> Now, our play opens in the thriving little town of East Cobra, India, which is just three wiggles and a hiss from Calcutta. <laughs> I will play the part of Gunga Dean, that heroic young Hindu lad, that heroic young Hindu lad who saved his regiment. Phil, I wish you'd tell your piano player to stop using that electric razor while I'm talking. <laughs> It's 
very annoying. Well, he needs a shave. Oh, he does. Well, he, why doesn't he shave at home? He hasn't been home in three weeks. <laughs> oh. Anyway, I will be that heroic lad who served his regiment at the cost of his life. My in laws in town. Phil, I'm announcing <laughs> our play. <laughs> now, this will go on. Say, Jack, am I going to be in it? Yes, Mary. You're going to be the entire spirit and mood of our story. You will interpret the action of the play as it goes on by reciting that famous poem by Rudyard Kipling. What poem? Oh, Mary, you remember. You're a better man than I am. Who is that? Anybody. <laughs> it is not. It's Gunga Dean. And you're going to recite it for us. Gee, then I better start writing it. You don't have to write it. Oh, it's Kipling. Hold tight and go back to sleep. <laughs> So in our play tonight, folks, we will take you to India, the land of mystery and enchantment, where moonlight spreads a silvery glow over the Ganges, where in solitary splendor stands the incomparable Taj Mahal. <laughs> what was that? The piano player just talked himself into a shampoo. <laughs> Phil, Phil, why don't your boys clean up on their own time? Well, they're busy, Jack. Don't forget, we had a rehearse before the program. Rehearse? Oh, yes, I saw your boys here this morning. And, Phil, it would be a grand idea if they rehearsed with their instruments. I think your theory of shadow boxing and music is entirely wrong. <laughs> now, where was I? Oh, yes, the time of our drama is the year 1900 or thereabouts. Oh, uh, Jack, have you got a part for me in this play? Well, Don, I didn't know just what to do with you. We need animals, but you're, you're too small for an elephant and too big for a mongoose. Quite a problem. Gee, I, I'd love to be in it. Couldn't I be a hippopotamus? Well, Don, you're hippie enough, and you certainly have a large potamus. <laughs> oh, uh, we'll, find, uh, we'll find something for you. Now, the scene of our drama is the home of Mrs. Dean, where she lives with her three sons, Dizzy, Daffy, and Gunga. The Dean family. What's the matter with Sar? Sar? Yes, Sar Dean. <laughs> Harris scores again. Oh, Phil, look. Isn't that awful, Sar Dean? Phil, the next time you pull an ad lib like that, I'm going to put maple syrup in your hair curler. What a gag. Listen, Jack, I pull that kind of stuff all the time at the Wilshire Bowl. I know. That's why they took off the cover shop. <laughs> Mary, did you ever go to the bowl and hear Phil pull those gags of his? Yeah, the waiters all wear earmuffs. Well, I don't blame them. The customers ought to wear earmuffs, too. And now, folks... Is it cold in there? Oh, quiet. <laughs> Now, our play, Gunga Dean, will go on immediately after a selection by the orchestra. Hey, Phil, play something apropos, you know, something that'll put us in the right spirit for India. Okay, how about uh, Scheherazade by Rimsky-Korsakov? Phil, just play Tiger Rag. I'm in no mood to gamble. <laughs> Look who wants to play Scheherazade by Rimsky-Korsakov. Well, he certainly surprised me. Surprise you, I didn't even play it. No, but he pronounced it. it was quite a feat. I bet he doesn't even know the first eight bars of it. I don't, eh? Get this, Jackson. Shaharazada, Shaharazada, Zada, Zada, Zing, Zing, Zing. There you are. Did you hear that, Mary? I didn't think he knew it. Oh. Let's forget it. Anyway, Phil, go ahead with whatever you're going to play. Okay. Hold it a minute. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bennett. This is Rochester. Rochester, we're just starting our play, so call me back later. I won't be here later. Oh, what's the matter now? Is it Carmichael again? Boss, I don't mind making your bed and pressing your pants, but when you expect me to teach that polar bear to roller skate, I quit. Well, you got to teach him to skate. I'm going to be off the air this summer, and that's part of our vaudeville act. 
Folks, Benny and Carmichael, humor on wheels. <laughs> now, look, Rochester, it's very simple. The first step with Carmichael is to strap the skates on him. Uh-huh. The second step is to give him a little push. Uh-huh. And the third step is to get out of town before it's too late. <laughs> oh, Rochester, what's the matter with you? Carmichael is very good at tricks. You taught him to bring in the mail, didn't you? Yeah, but this morning he brought in the mailman. <laughs> The mailman, I choose to believe it. Wait till you see the news, are you? Well, I'll apologize to Mr. Jensen when I see him. I'll be home right after the broadcast, Rochester. So long. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss, I forgot to tell you, Carmichael's been after the goldfish again. I caught him this morning with his paws in the bowl. And he was after the goldfish? He wasn't waiting for a manicure. <laughs> well, don't worry about it. He was just playing with the fish. He won't eat them. I don't know about that. He had a napkin around his neck. All right. Now, don't bother me anymore, Rochester. We've got an important sketch to do. Meanwhile, try and get along with Carmichael. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'm going to get myself a good lawyer and bump that animal off. Oh, hang up. More trouble getting my act ready. I'll teach that bear to roller skate or my name ain't Tony Pasquale. Pay fair. That, uh, that was Tiger Rag, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado... That was not Tiger Rag. That was Hindustan. Oh, yeah? Well, I'll leave it to our studio audience. <laughs> They've all gone home. Hmm. I told the man to lock the door. Well, anyway, here we go with our sensational and thrilling melodrama, Gunga Dean. The locale, as I said before, is the little town of East Cobra, India. Curtain. Music. <laughs> Take it, Mary. Now, in India's sunny clime, where I used to spend my time, I knew a Hindu boy called Gunga Dean. His figure was appalling. He had arches that had fallen, and a face that looked just like a soup tureen. Hmm. It was Dean, Dean, Dean. Take it, Jack, and see you keep it clean. I will. Scene one, the home of Mrs. Dean. <laughs> My goodness, it's seven o'clock already. Why doesn't that boy get up? Oh, Gunga! Gunga! Yes, Ma, what do you want, Gunga? Come downstairs and eat your breakfast. Now hurry. I'm coming. Darn that crocodile. I'm always stumbling over. Go away, Fido. Say, Ma, how do you like my new loincloth? Now, Gunga, who ever heard of wearing suspenders with a loincloth? Well, I don't trust my fraternity pin. <laughs> you know me. Well, you can't wear them. People will laugh at you when you entertain in the marketplace today. Let them laugh. I'm tired of being a Hindu faker anyway. Walking on hot coals is all right, but there's no future in it. Never mind, my son. Being a magician is a very good trade. Oh, yeah? Look what happened to Papa. He climbed up a rope one day. That's the last anybody ever saw of <laughs> him. I didn't mind that so much, but there was a blonde with him. That's Papa, all right. Well, I guess I'll eat my breakfast. Oh, there's the phone. Hello? Hello, Gunga. Rasta Mayan Bohat Kush Leia Rana. Yeldi Aksha Boot Tem Karo Wally? Chukoreka. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> Who is that? Papa, he wants some more rope. <laughs> I'll bring it to him later. Now, down. I need your round glass before it gets cold. Ground glass again. Every morning for breakfast, it's ground glass. Why can't I swallow a sword once in a while? You're too bent over. Well, I could straighten up for a nice, juicy sword. Oh, stop complaining. What's the matter with you anyway? You might as well know it, Ma. I'm not going to be a magician any longer. I'm going to join the Army. The Army? Yes, I enlisted yesterday in the Bengal Lancer. <gasps> Why, Gunga, how can you get in the army? You've got flat feet, and your chest is a little floy floy too. Well, I don't have to be strong. I'm going to be a bugler. I bought a horn the other day. Listen to this. Yeah. There, how's that? Hadassah Boga. 
It's a good thing you said that in Hindu. <laughs> well, if you want to know something, I played my bugle on Major Gandhi's amateur hour last night. Well, how did you make out, Gunga? He got the gonga. You're not in this. Oh. Well, Ma, I'm legal now. I'm off to join the regiment. And someday you're going to be proud of me. So long, Ma. So long, Gunga. So Gunga left his mommy and went to join the army. A servant of Her Majesty the Queen. Now we find him in the Lancers without his coat and cancers. And his bright new bugle slowly turning green. <laughs> Burns me up. I got a guarantee with it. It was green, green, green. You're in the army now, you jelly bean. Hmm. Scene two, the barracks of the seventh Bengal Lancers. <laughs> Seventh Lancers, Captain Harris speaking. Hello, Harris. This is Major Wilson. What's on your mind, Mage? Ah, look here, Harris. Every day the native bandits are out killing and plundering, and you're not doing a thing about it. You got to put a stop to this immediately, or I'll send you back to Grub Hollow. Well, tell me, Mage, where I find them bandits? Well, uh, somebody may be listening, so I'll give it to you in code now. Have you got that? Yeah. Then carry on. Goodbye. <laughs> Hey, Dean. Dean. Yes, Captain Harris. Stop jamming and come in here. <laughs> okay. I want to see you too, Private Baker. Aye, aye, sir. And don't say aye, aye. You're not in the Navy, you know. Well, then why am I wearing your sailor suit? Because you're just gobs of fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gun, gun. <laughs> well, I can't help it. Corn is catching. Why'd you send for us, Captain? Now, listen, boys. The mage just gave me a buzz, and he was hotter than a torch. He said them bandits are jiving again. Jiving? Yeah, and they've been cutting a rug once too often. Well, gee, Cap, can't we get them in the group? Ah, they're half, bud. <laughs> but if we can get them on the downbeat, they'll take it on the lamb, and we'll be right back on the beam. Hmm. I don't even understand that, and I'm a Hindu. <laughs> What are you getting at, Captain? Just this, Gunga. I want you and Baker to cross the desert, go up in the mountains, and see if you can locate the hideout of the bandits. Yes, yes, sir. And remember, fellas, if you succeed, I'll give you a medal. Just like the one I'm wearing right here. Oh, boy! Fine medal. Gene Autry Fan Club. <laughs> well, all right, Captain. We'll go now. Come on, Baker. We gotta cross that desert. Okay, you take the high road, and I'll take the bus. <laughs> we gotta travel together and on foot. Follow me, Baker, and we'll find the hideout of those bandits or perish in the attempt. So long, Captain. So long, suckers. Hmm, fine encouragement. So Gunga left with Baker. Gosh, how their feet will ache her on that hot and burning sand so far away. I'll bet you that their bunions will be crying just like onions before they reach the bandits' hideaway. Oh, I'll make it. For it's Dean, 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 with buzzers flying high above your beam. With your courage and your daring, and that smile you're always wearing, you're a better man than I am, Bobby Breen. <laughs> what? It was Breen, Breen, Breen. That's enough. St. Breen, the desert, five days later. Five days in this infernal desert. Five days without water. Mm. Five long, blistering days. It's pretty hot at night, too. <laughs> I can't stand it, Baker. I'm going crazy. Crazy, I tell you. I'm going mad. Me, too. Mm. Water. Water. Here, have some of my potato chips. I don't want any potato chips. My throat is parched. I want water. Water, I tell you, water. I don't think I can go on much longer. Hey, Gunga, our troubles are over. Look at that sign. Where? Right there. Palm Springs, 9,000 miles. <laughs> We'll never make it. Oh, this heat. This relentless burning heat. Well, it never ends. I can't walk, Baker. Each step is torture. 
Water. I don't think I can go on much longer. You said that already. No. What are we going to do, Baker? What are we going to do? Oh, wait. Look. Look up ahead. There's an oasis. That's Oasis. <laughs> but you're right. Come on, let's make one last desperate effort to get there. Okay. Drink. Drink, drink. That's what I want. Lemonade. Get your ice cold lemonade here. <laughs> ice cold lemonade. You hear that, Baker? Oh, boy. Get your ice cold lemonade. I'll have a glass, buddy. How much is it? Nothing. I'm a mirage. <laughs> It's the first mirage I ever saw with a door. <laughs> Let's stagger on, Baker. Look. Look at those buzzards circling overhead. They're waiting for us, Baker. They're waiting for us, I tell you. Yes, but they'll never get us. Come on, Gunga, keep your chin up. Remember, we're Bengal Lancers. I'll try. I'll try. If I don't go crazy first. <laughs> you see, Baker, I'm going mad. Me too. <laughs> Don't enjoy it so much. Hey, look, what's that coming towards us? Where? Right there. Why, it's a polar bear, and he's on roller skates. Looks like Carmichael. I knew I was going crazy. I'm delirious. Delirious. It's another mirage. Mirage nothing, Bob. He's got me down to the loin cloth, too. Oh, my goodness. They get married. So we leave them on the desert till next week on Sunday night. Will they reach their destination? Will they die without a fight? Well, tune in next Sunday evening, and you'll find out, I hope, that Gunga is a hero and that Baker is a dope. That's right. So it's dope, dope, dope. Never mind. Play, Phil. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. For now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you our own movie star who has just finished another epic at Paramount and is nervously awaiting the preview, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, I'm not a bit worried about the outcome of my latest screen triumph. But you're wrong about one thing. The picture isn't finished yet. Oh, it isn't? No, we have another week to go. You see, I've been having some story trouble. And I don't want to mention any names, but after all, I'm the star of the picture, and there's a certain party that's having a little too much to do in it. <laughs> and if this certain party... Well, our maestro isn't here yet, so if you're talking about Phil Harris, why don't you come out and say so? Because he's got 18 stool pigeons sitting right in back of me, and you know it. <laughs> They're disguised as musicians. <laughs> uh, look, Don, the way the picture ends now, Phil Harris wins the girl and marries her. Now, as long as I'm the star, don't you think I ought to win the girl? Well, Jack, there are several angles to consider. Now, in the first place, Phil is much younger than you are. That's just the point. He's in no rush. <laughs> <laughs> But but I got to get rolling before it's too late, my dear. <laughs> and another thing has come up. Mr. Hornblow, the producer, wants to use Rochester in the picture. Imagine Rochester, my butler and actor. That's all I need. But well, Jack, I think it's a grand idea. I know, Don, but what'll they pay Rochester? Maybe $50 a week. And by the time he gets 25 and I get 25, it's not worth it to me. <laughs> What does it amount to? Well, uh, tell me, Jack, does Rochester know about this offer yet? I think so. Yesterday he went out and made a down payment on a gold tooth. <laughs> Not only that, he's so lazy, he just had a sidecar built on the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> anyway. Oh, hello, Kenny. Hello. What's the matter with you? Darn that apple machine out in the hall. What's wrong with the apple machine? Oh, I just put a nickel in and a worm came out. <laughs> Oh, that's too bad. Somebody's going to hear about this outrage, believe me. Oh, Kenny, what's a nickel? Don't be such a little tightwad. Look who's talking. <laughs> mm, 
Uh, where were we, Don, before this big problem came up? Well, uh, you were complaining about Phil getting the girl at the finish of your picture. Oh, yes. Well, that's what's holding up the story, and now I'm trying to get it changed. Trying to get what changed? Oh, hello, Mary. Say, Mary, you were over at Paramount when we rehearsed the ending of our picture. Do you think it's right for Phil to marry, to marry the girl when I'm the star? Of course not. You see? Phil ought to be the star. <laughs> I don't mean that. Imagine Phil winning the girl. Why, he's not the marrying kind. Oh, I don't know about that. Why, Mary, you know very well that Phil is the type of fella that plays with a woman's emotions, toys with her affections, breaks her heart, and then when he's through, discards her like an old shoe. You know the way that kind of a guy treats women. Yes, and we love it. <laughs> I know you do. That's the trouble with women. They don't appreciate a good man. I'm the rat type myself. <laughs> Oh, sure, sure, a fine rodent. Huh? <laughs> anyway, getting back to my picture, the more I think about that ending, Don, the more I... Come in. Special delivery for Mary Livingston. Uh, here, boy. Thanks. Hmm. Oh, Jack, this letter's from Mama. How do you know? The man on the stamp is laughing. <laughs> oh. Read us your mother's letter, Mary. Yeah, I'll bet there's some hot news in it. What's the Ouija board of Plainfield got to say? <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Oh. Uh, Plainfield, New Jersey, May 19th. My dear daughter, Mary. My, it's a scream already. <laughs> Continue. Uh, just a few lines to thank you for your nice letter and the big bottle of perfume which you sent me on Mother's Day. It's lovely and I smell like anything. <laughs> she would pour the whole bottle on. Uh, Father's Day will be here in a couple of weeks, and Papa wants me to remind you that he needs a right sock. A right sock? Doesn't he need a left one, too? Yeah, but Papa hates to impose on me. Oh, oh. that's very sweet of him. Your sister Ethel and her husband are back from their honeymoon, but we think she needs new glasses, as we are quite positive this is not the same man she left with. <laughs> My goodness, they ought to find out. Don't you think so? The happy couple are going to live with us until your brother-in-law can find a job. This may take some time, as he is an Indian scout by trade. <laughs> Fine prospects there. Oh, I must tell you, we went to New York the other day to see the World's Fair, and was it crowded. Oh. I lost your father in Japan and found him in General Motors. <laughs> Well, that was quite a trip there. The attractions are simply marvelous. They have a big water show there with a hundred beautiful bathing girls. So I lost your father again. Well, I don't blame him. Quiet. Oh. Uh, no other news at present except your Uncle Herman, who was learning to fly, dropped in the house the other day. Hmm. We'll write you again next week. Meanwhile, if this letter is a smash hit, please have Jack send me a check. <laughs> Mary, I don't ask you to read them. Uh, regards to all, your loving mother, on the beam, Livingston. She always has to get cute when she signs her name. <laughs> well, let's get on with the program. Hey, Kenny, if you can forget about your great financial loss in the apple machine, how about doing a song? Don't get fresh or I won't sing at all. <laughs> what? What did you say? I said, if you want a nice, fresh song, I'll sing it all. Oh, I misunderstood you. Go ahead. <laughs> that, uh, that was Little Skipper, sung by Kenny Baker, which he did very well. That was really excellent. Darn that apple machine. <laughs> Kenny, stop worrying about it. If it'll make you any happier, I'll take a nickel out of my pocket and give it to you right now. Shall I phone the newsreels? <laughs> That won't be necessary. I just hate to see a kid like that be so cheap. Well, you're as bad as he is. Every time you give a waitress a little dime tip, you hold her hand for half an hour. Now, wait a minute, Mary. Now, wait a minute. Let me ask you something. Did you personally ever see me hold a waitress's hand? Yes. And now, folks, for our feature attraction tonight... <laughs> uh, we will continue with... Yes, I did. All right, you answered me. <laughs> For our feature attraction tonight, we will continue with the second and final episode of... Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Were you worried about me? 
Well, I wasn't exactly worried, Phil, but I thought it'd be kind of nice if you dropped in sometime during our program and made a stab at earning your salary. <laughs> Of course, I realize now that you're in the cinema, your radio career means very little to you. Are you still beefing about the picture? No, I'm not beefing. Why, Jack, I wouldn't even be in the picture if it weren't for you. You asked me to be in it. Phil, I asked you to be in one short scene at the opening. I didn't expect you to stay for eight reels. <laughs> you move in like a relative. <laughs> oh, I haven't got so much to do in the picture. You haven't? Why, even in that big fog scene in London where you're not supposed to see anybody, you have to walk around wearing a neon hat. <laughs> but you know what really kills me? Here, I'm the star, and my stooge marries Dorothy L'Amour. It doesn't make sense. But, Jack, Dorothy wanted it that way. What do you mean? She said she doesn't like to do love scenes with you. Oh, she doesn't, eh? No, she claims you're too masculine. You're too rough. She says you're the brute type. Brute? No kidding? <laughs> you mean... You mean Dorothy said that? Why, sure. She says that when it comes to love scenes, you're a regular caveman. Oh, I... She said that? <laughs> uh, are you sure? Absolutely. Why, man, when you've got a girl in your arms, you don't know your own strength. Well, I... I have been eating my steaks pretty rare lately. I, <laughs> and I guess that medicine ball hasn't hurt me any, but I... Oh, so I'm a brood, eh? Some caveman, you couldn't find a muscle in a shore dinner. <laughs> oh, yes, I could. Well, thanks for the information, Phil. Now I know I can change the finish of the picture. All I have to do is tell Dorothy that I'll watch myself a little. Well, let's get on with our show. As I said before, folks, we're going to continue with the second episode of our stirring drama. Gee, I can't get over Dorothy being afraid of me like that. <laughs> the, uh, the second episode of our... Gee, I must remember that women are fragile and delicate. And... The second episode of our... Oh, yes, yes. The second episode of our stirring drama of military life in faraway India. That sensational RKO screen achievement, Gunga Dean. <laughs> Thank you, Mouse Face. <laughs> now, as last week, as last week, I will be Gunga Dean, Kenny will be Private Baker, and Mary, you will be sort of a Kipling again this week and recite the poem. Okay, Hercules. Hmm. Now, this will go on immediately after a number by... Uh, see who it is, Mary. Oh, hello. Well, gee whiz, how are you? So nice of you to call. What's new, kid? Yes? Yes? Who is it, Mary? Mr. Hornblow, it's for you. <laughs> Give me that poem. What's new, kid? To my producer. Uh, hello, Mr. Hornblow. Yes? Well, uh... Well, look, Mr. Hornblow... I've been thinking about that Rochester matter, and I don't see how I can allow him to go in the picture. Uh, well, well, sure, he'd be very good, but... I know, but... Now, look, Mr. Hornblow. I know, but... 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 Now, I'll, uh... I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. Hornblow. You can have Rochester in the picture on one condition. You've got to change the script so that I marry Dorothy L'Amour. What? Oh, Mr. Hornblow, I realize that, but I won't get her all black and blue. <laughs> See, I'm an actor. I can restrain myself. Is it a deal? Okay, then Rochester goes in the picture. Goodbye. Can you imagine that fellow Dorothy told Mr. Hornblow that I'm a caveman, too? Gee, it's all over the lot, you know? <laughs> well, Phil, old boy, how about playing a number so we can get on with our sketch? I'll do nothing of the kind. Imagine taking me out of the finish of the picture. Fine pal. Now, don't worry. You'll be in that wedding scene, Phil. I'll fix it so you're a flower girl. <laughs> now, play before I slug you. You know my strength. Oh, that's right. Hit it, boy. <laughs> that was The Ladies in Love, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And now, for Wait a minute, Jack. Wait. How'd you like it? Well, Phil, if I say it was good, it'll go to your head. And if I 
say it was bad, it'll start a routine, so let's just forget it. <laughs> oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, in our play tonight, you're going to be the head of the Hindu bandits. In fact, you're a cutthroat, so just play it straight. You know? Okay. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, for the final installment of Gunga Dean. As you may remember, last week, Gunga and Private Baker were sent to discover the hideout of the Hindu bandits. And as the scene ended, we left them both on the desert without food or water. Curtain. Music. <laughs> Take it, Mary. Now, in India's desert land, where there's nothing but hot sand, we find our punch-drunk hero, Gunga Dean. Private Baker is there with him. They ain't got water. They ain't got rhythm. And the buzzards up above them sure look mean. So it's Dean, Dean, Dean. Take it, Jack. I'm running out of steam. Oh. Oh, I don't think I can go on much longer, Baker. The desert's got me this time. Fourteen days on this burning sand without water. Fourteen days. You hear that, Baker? Fourteen days without water. What's the record? <laughs> Nine days. It's held by a camel in Egypt. <laughs> but we must carry on, Baker. We must carry on. Uh, two weeks without food or drink. Two weeks, uh, weeks on this infernal desert. Fourteen days under this burning, blistering sun. Well, we got a nice tan. <laughs> I don't need a tan. I'm a Hindu. What a desolate place this desert is. How far away from everything. I'll bet even Mrs. Roosevelt has never been here. <laughs> well, come on, Baker. Let's make for those mountains right ahead of us. Chin up. Remember, we're Bengal Lancers. Hey, Baker, look. Here comes a camel with a man and a girl on it. Oh, yes. And look at that sign. Just married. Whoa. Hello there. Hey, buddy, how far is it to Niagara Falls? 12,000 miles straight ahead. Well, we better hurry. Giddy up, Abdul. <laughs> oh, so they're going to Niagara Falls, eh? Water. Water. That's what I want, water. Hmm, there are those buzzards again. They're after us, Baker. They're after us. Yes, we must not let them get us. We've got a duty to perform, and by heaven, we're going to do it. We must find a hot eye of those bandits or die, die like rats in this forsaken desert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I knew I should have taken that line <laughs> Look, look, Baker Here we are at the foot of the mountains I wonder if I wonder if Listen What do you make of that, Baker? Catchy little thing, ain't it? <laughs> well, you know what that means? We finally reached the hideout of the bandits now be quiet, and we'll sneak up on them. So they reach the place at last, down by the mountain pass, where the bandits are a lurking. Oh, what thugs. So let's listen to their boss, which is played by Phil Herr Ross. Herr Ross? As he tells his natives how to cut a rug. So it's rug, rug, rug. Take it, chief, you corny jitterbug. Now listen, men. We're going to calabadaz, booga gooba, koosh, harani. Is that clear? Shukaraka. You hear that, Baker? Shukaraka. That means they're going to attack the Bengal Lancers at dawn. Gee, I thought I meant long time no see. That's Shukarika. <laughs> now be quiet. Listen, men, and get this straight. So guy. So guy. So guy. So guy. <laughs> Want some Lancers, mommy? <laughs> Yeah? Well, I never attack our regiment. Remember what the captain told me to do, Baker? Yeah, you're supposed to blow your bugle as a warning. And that's just what I'm going to do. Get hot, Gunga. One, two. <laughs> did you hear that, man? Where did that bugle come from? She's no back, $1.98. Baker! Baker! There they are, man. Grab them. Yikes! We're captured. All right.
right, quit jiving, man. I'll take care of these guys. Now, look here, Chief. We're not the fellas you want. You speak English, don't you? Sure, I'm half. <laughs> well, look, Bob. We're just a couple of wandering, harmless Hindus. A couple of magazine salesmen working our way through the desert. Please give us food and drink, and we'll be on our way. Wait a minute. If you're a magazine salesman, why have you got that horn around your neck? All right, then. I sell fish. <laughs> Come on, Baker, let's go. Ain't we going to spy on the bandits first? Baker! Spies, eh? I knew it. Take them to my temple, man. Your temple? Yes, there it is. That big white building over there. Some temple. Wiltshire Bowl, no cover charge. <laughs> let's run, Baker. Yeah. Grab them, man. All right, all right. Now drag them inside. Mm, it's a fine way to get customers. <laughs> Okay, we're coming. So they captured Gung and Baker and dragged them in the bowl. They couldn't see the floor show because they sat behind a pole. Now, Gunger is from Hunger, and his tongues are hanging out, and Baker's sitting with him. What will happen? Let's find out. Oh, water. Water. Where's a waiter? Well, how about it, Gunger? You might as well come clean. Are you going to tell us where your regiment is or not? No. No. I don't care what you do to me. I'm a Bengal Lancer, and I'll never tell. Never. Ah, oh, yeah. You talk, brother. Where's your regiment? I won't tell. I won't tell. Torture me. Kill me. But my lips are sealed. Mine are chapped. <laughs> I don't want to die, Chief. I don't want to die. Give me some water. No, no. Not until you talk. I won't talk. I won't. All right. Then I'm going to torture you as a human being has never been tortured before. What? You'll suffer. You'll squirm. You'll die a thousand deaths before I'm through. Oh, my goodness. Come on, men. Let's give it to him. We'll see whether he talks or not. Down in the meddy in the it's a bitty pool. Fem fee, it's a bitty. And a mama bitty. Not that. Fem not that. Mama bitty, fem a good dad. And a fem. No, no. Grind me with a hot iron. Throw me in the plate. Beat me with a crocodile. Come on, man. The free it's a bitty. Water. Water. That's what I want. Water. 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 Boop, boop. Did him, dot him, water. Water. That's what I want. Boop, did him, dot him, water. Oh, I can't you tell you. Boop, 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 did I'm him, down him, down him. I'll tell. And they bam, I'll tell. and they bam. Stop I'll do the feed. I'll tell. <laughs> I'll tell. All right, Gunga. Give us the information we want and you can go free. Okay, Chief. Our regiment is located about three miles <laughs> south of Calcutta. Who can't miss it. Come on, Baker. Wet's dough. Nothing doing. Nothing doing. I just ordered a twimp cocktail. Oh, I'll have one, too. Take it, Mary. So it's dween, dween, dween. Those itty-bitty fitties make who scream. So we belted oo and fade oo. I can hardly blame oo. Oo's a better man than I am, and I'm a girl. <laughs> Is that so? Play, Phil. <laughs> and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Mmm, water. Water. That's what I want. Water. You could use some soap and towels, too. Good night, folks. <laughs> the Jello program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you Hollywood's newest glamour boy, Jack Benny. <laughs> Thank you. Jello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And Don, I appreciate your calling me a glamour boy, but really that's not quite my classification. Oh, it isn't? No, Don. According to the latest publicity from Paramount, I'm the oomph man. <laughs> oomph. Yeah. The oomph man? Yeah, you see, Don, a glamour boy is merely good looking. But when a star has, in addition to that, a certain charm and appeal to women, then he becomes an oomph man. Which is me. You better stay out of the hot sun, brother. <laughs> oh, you're here already. Listen, Phil, I'm not a fortune teller and I'm not psychic. But I see you soon scattering your brilliant remarks in greener pastures. And hello. <laughs> you know, Don, ever since we switched the ending of the picture, uh, Man About Town, and I Marry Dorothy L'Amour, Phil has been a wreck. 
so jealous because I'm a ladies' man. Me jealous? Why, every girl you go out with regards you as a big brother. Well, that's part of my technique. I sneak up on them. <laughs> so don't be so sour grapesy. Oh, uh, <laughs> by the way, Jack, last week you had an argument with the studio about Rochester. Are you going to let him be in the picture? Rochester? Oh, he's in it already, Don, and am I having trouble with him at the house? The airs he's been putting on. Oh, getting ritzy, huh? Ritzy? He bought a sport coat yesterday with three belts in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, it's getting so he won't wear anything but silk underwear. Well, it's all right for him to wear silk underwear, isn't it? Not when the monogram says J.B. <laughs> no, sir. Jack, I can't understand why you keep Rochester when he causes you so much trouble. Why don't you fire him? Oh, I can't. You see, he found the treasure map of my backyard and won't give it back. <laughs> but I'll get him in time. Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. Say, Mary, have you heard the latest? They changed the ending of the picture, and instead of Phil getting Dorothy L'Amour, I'm the one that marries her. Yes, I know. She's sick about it. <laughs> She's nothing of the kind. You're just making that up because Dorothy happens to be very fond of me. In fact, the other day, she gave me an autograph, Sarong. <laughs> How do you look in it? Gorgeous. <laughs> Are you surprised? Oh, Mary, Jack's got to do it. He says that everybody at Paramount's calling him the oomph man. Yeah, but did Jack tell you how he got the title? Quiet. The director punched him in the stomach and he went oomph. <laughs> That's not the reason at all. They call me the oomph man because in this picture I'm virile and rugged. Oh, yeah? <laughs> tell him what happened when you shot the wedding scene yesterday afternoon. Oh, well, that was just a novelty, that's all. Something different. What was it, Mary? Yeah, tell him. Oh. <laughs> well... <laughs> After Jack marries Dorothy, he's supposed to pick her up in his arms and carry her across the threshold. Mary. Well, Jack tried and tried, but he couldn't lift her. <laughs> and what happened? <laughs> she carried him across. <laughs> Mary, I told you it was just a novelty, something original. Well, say, Jack, did you feel kind of silly being carried in a girl's arms? Well, I didn't mind being in her arms, Don, but when she started to rock me, I thought that was going to... <laughs> Anyway, let's drop the whole thing because we've got an important sketch to do tonight. Where's Kenny? Hey, Kenny? Kenny? What? It's time for your song. Well, wait till I get through. The drummer's teaching me how to play poker. Now, tell him to give you your shirt back and come over here. <laughs> okay. Phil, I wish you'd tell your boys not to take advantage of Kenny. He's too young to gamble. Oh, yeah? I got over a thousand marbles hid under my mattress. <laughs> I don't care what you've got. I don't want you learning how to play cards. Hmm, I got a fine chance to grow up around here. Never mind. I don't want any more gambling. Now go ahead, young man, and sing your song. I will not. You will, too. I'll tell you what. I'll match you two songs or nothing. <laughs> We've got to play to do it. Sing, Kenny. <laughs> Very good. That was Melancholy Mood, sung by Kenny Baker. And, Kenny, that was a swell song, a natural for you. I threw a seven, huh? Kenny. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a great treat in store for you. Last week, the Benny Gypsies gave you their interpretation of Gunga Dean, which took place in faraway India. And tonight, to show you that we get around, uh, we take you to Boston, Massachusetts and present our version of Daryl F. Zanuck's outstanding 20th Century Fox production, that grand tribute to a great man and famous scientist, Alexander Graham Bell. <laughs> hmm. Thank you. Can I go home now, Mr. Benny? I'm all in. <laughs> uh, not yet, Jojo. <laughs> Now, as you all know, uh, Don Amici portrayed the famous inventor in the picture. So in our version, I will naturally play the title role. May I ask why? Certainly. Now, this picture also featured... <laughs> I said, why should you be Alexander Graham Bell? Well, for one thing, Phil, the part fits me. I used to be an inventor myself. Wasn't I, Mary? Oh, Jack, you weren't the first one to think of putting a mouse trap in a wallet. <laughs> I don't mean that. Years ago, when I was in the Navy, I invented a chin rest for portholes. <laughs> they went over very big. Now, getting back to our play, Mary, you will be my wife, as portrayed on the screen by that sweet, gorgeous, beautiful, and talented young actress, lovely Loretta Young. 
Well, if you think she's so good, why didn't you get her? Don't think I didn't try. <laughs> we we're quite good friends, you know, but she had a previous <laughs> engagement. Listen, Dreamer, you're not even acquainted with Loretta Young. I'm not, eh? It might interest you to know, Phil, that I've got Loretta's address right in my little book. What book? Guide to the Movie Star's Home. <laughs> I mean, my little red book. Now, Kenny... Yes, Jack? Uh, Kenny, when the play opens, I'm a poor, struggling inventor, and you're a wealthy businessman who finances my experiments. Uh, do you think you can handle it? I'll lay you three to one, I can. Now, Kenny... <laughs> for the last time, I don't want to hear another word about gambling. You're too young. Anyway, you're going to be my backer. And as I was saying, Mary, you're going to be my patient, loyal wife. We've had a hard struggle. I'm trying to invent the telephone, and everybody thinks I'm a madman. They think I'm eccentric. They think I'm crazy. But you, my little wife, what do you think? What do you think? <laughs> Mary, will you please get in the mood for Pete's sake? <laughs> huh? Now, the, uh, the locale... Hey, Alexander, am I going to be in this? Yes, Phil, you're going to be my assistant who helps me invent the telephone. But, Jack, I'm a musician, not a mechanic. Listen, Phil, I'd rather have you tinker with my toaster than tamper with Tannhauser. <laughs> Any day. Now, our dramatic offering will go on immediately after a number by... Oh, come in. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, Rochester. What do you want? Say, boss, are you in a pleasant frame of mind this evening, or are you cloaked in gloom? <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling very good, Rochester. Why? Well, I got some news that may turn your damper down. What? What are you talking about? Boss, remember when you and I were driving down to the studio in your car tonight? Yes. And when the motor kept stalling, you got mad and said... You wish somebody would steal this thing? Yes. Well, hallelujah, you're a pedestrian. <laughs> a pedestrian? That's from the Latin. I know where it's from. <laughs> you mean to say somebody stole my car? Well, all I know is I parked the car in front of the studio and went across the street to buy a cigar. Uh huh. And when I got back, there was nothing there but the anchor. <laughs> oh, that's awful. Now, who, who would want to steal my car? Somebody that goes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't be funny. <laughs> my car's been stolen, and it's nothing to clown about. Tell me, Jack, did you have any insurance on it? Only tornado. <laughs> Ding the luck. Rochester, this is all your fault. I'm sorry, boss. Well, it's too late now to be sorry. Now, I want you to go right down to the police station and report the loss. Hurry up. I ain't going near that police station. Why not? I'm behind in my alimony. <laughs> alimony? Why, Rochester, I didn't know you'd been married. Oh, boss, repeatedly. <laughs> Well, that's your business. Now, get going. Okay, goodbye. So long. Oh, say, Rochester, I see you're playing a part in our picture. Yeah, that's right. How are you coming along? Mr. Harris, I'm in the groove on the beam and dark victory. So long. <laughs> hmm. He's the biggest ham I ever saw. Uh, the biggest, Jack? Yes, the biggest. <laughs> and I'm going to get out that car back if I have to offer a reward. Play, Phil. Now, where would I go if I were a Maxwell? <laughs> That, uh, that was snug as a bug in a rug, played by a mug and his lugs. <laughs> How was that, Phil? Thanks for the plug, slug. Mm. <laughs> going from that neat bit of comedy to our dramatic <laughs> highlight of the season, we are now going to offer our contribution to the annals of scientific progress, that epic of American ingenuity, Alexander Graham... <laughs> Bell, wait for me. <laughs> Now, the locale of our play is Boston, Massachusetts, in the year 1870. The scene is the little attic laboratory where we find Professor Bell and his assistant, Mr. Harris, working feverishly on their great invention, the telephone. Mrs. Bell has just entered the room. Curtain. Music. <laughs> I'll take it. 
Hello? Alexander Graham Bell's residence. What? No, you can't talk to him. He's busy inventing the telephone. Goodbye. <laughs> I'll say I am. Oh, Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Yes, Professor Bell. I think I've got something here. Hand me that duplex circuit repeater and the multiple induction coil. I'll attach them to the supervisory electromagnetic oscillator. You're kidding. <laughs> I am not. Now, give me a hand. <laughs> give me a hand with this quadruplex frictional deflector. Okay, here's the metallic cylindrical felicitator. <laughs> What's that? The screwdriver. <laughs> oh, trying to chop me, eh? <laughs> Wait a minute. I'll use this little hammer. There, that's coming along all right. Say, Alex, I wish you'd hurry up and invent this telephone. The blonde gave me your number this morning, and I want to call her up. Has she got a friend? Oh, and she's gorgeous. <laughs> oh, what am I rushing for? I'm married. <laughs> I'm so absent-minded. But I'll tell you one thing, Harris. We've got to work fast if we expect any more help from our financial baker, Mr. Backer. I mean, our financial backer, Mr. Baker. Now, help me with this vacuum generator. Oh, darling, you look tired. You're working too hard, Alex. Much too hard. I am? Yeah, look at those bags under Harris's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, he got those on his own time. <laughs> but, darling, I must work hard. I know it's a mad dream. I know it sounds impossible. But I'm going to invent the telephone, or my name ain't Alexander Graham Bell. Come on, Harris. Let's get to work. Come in. Well, what's this? This is the... This is the laboratory. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> Darn these interruptions. Harris. Mr. Harris. <laughs> Mr. Harris, hand me that annunciator, Magneto. Here you are. Hello? Oh, hello, Barbara. Now, hand me that vibrator. Okay, Alex. Did you have a good time last night? Who was there? Oh, it still won't regenerate. They were? Hand me some more of that copper wire. Here you are, Professor. Well, look, Barbara, we'd love to come over, but Alex is still working on that invention of his. How's it coming, Professor? I'm afraid it won't work, Harris. I'm afraid it's a failure. Oh, it's some gadget he calls a telephone, but it'll never be a success. I got another idea, Harris. Hand me that real stat. All right, Barbara. I'll call you later. Goodbye. I don't know, Harris. The more I work on this, the tougher it seems to get. Sometimes I get so discouraged. Don't give up, Prof. I won't. Come in. Well, hello, Mr. Baker. Hello, Alex. How's everything coming along? I'm making great progress, Mr. Baker. Great progress. You see, it's my theory that if I could make a current of electricity vary in intensity precisely as the air varies in density during the production of multiple sounds, I should be able to transmit speech electromagnetically. Oh, you can talk plainer, Nat. <laughs> hmm. But unfortunately, Mr. Baker, my financial resources are depleted. And before I can continue with my experiment, I must have additional monetary aid. You mean more cash -a <laughs> That's a bullseye if I ever heard one. Well, how much do you want? Four million dollars. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I know that sounds like a lot. But you've already given me thirty-two dollars. What's four million dollars? <laughs> what do you say? Why don't you gamble with me? You said I was too young. <laughs> That was in the first routine. <laughs> oh, Mr. Baker, if I don't get the money from you, where else can I get it? You mean I'm the only sucker in the world? <laughs> yes. All right, then, Alex. I'll give it to you. Hooray! Did you hear that, darling? Did you hear that, Harris? He's going to give us four million dollars. Here you are, Professor. One dollar, two dollars, three dollars, four dollars, five dollars, six dollars, ten dollars. Two years later. One million nine hundred and ninety-three dollars. One million nine hundred and ninety-four dollars. One million nine hundred and ninety-five dollars. One million nine hundred and ninety-four dollars. Four years later. Three million nine hundred and ninety-nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-eight dollars. Yes. Three million nine hundred and ninety-nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine dollars. Yes, yes. And forty cents. I don't think I can make it. <laughs> Well, that's 
close enough. Thanks. Well, I gotta go now. Goodbye. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Baker. Where can I reach you in case I need you again? In the poorhouse. So long. <laughs> oh, boy. Four million dollars. I wonder how he could carry so much money in his pockets. He's got two pair of pants. Oh. Well, Harris, we've got the money. You know what that means? You know what all this money means to us? Yes, I can tie a can to my orchestra. Yes, thank heaven. <laughs> and it also means that I can finish my work, complete my invention. The telephone must and will be perfected. Let's go. <laughs> March 10th, 1876, in a public auditorium in Boston, Massachusetts, the first telephone, a crude instrument, stands on the desk before Professor Bell. For the first time in history, he is about to transmit the human voice. Quiet, gentlemen, please. Now, gentlemen, all I ask of you is to have patience. You are about to witness the most amazing demonstration of our time. Oh, gentlemen, you. please. Bring it on. What are you stalling for? Yippee! Young man, I'm introducing a telephone, not a fan dancer. <laughs> now, gentlemen, in just a moment, I will transmit my voice by wire to Professor Homer J. Osgood, who is waiting on the other end of this line in Baltimore, 500 miles away. Oh, oh, I don't know. Silence, please. All right, gentlemen, the experiment begins. Mr. Harris, lift the receiver. Yes, Professor. <laughs> hello. Hello, Baltimore. Baltimore, hello. Hmm. Hello, Baltimore. Hello, Baltimore. This will work. This must work. Hello, Baltimore. Baltimore, hello. Did you put a nickel in? Quiet. Gentlemen, please. Please, give me a chance. Hello. Hello, Baltimore. Baltimore, hello. Boston Meat Market, your order, please. Get off the line. I want Baltimore. Don't worry, gentlemen, I'll get it. Hello. Hello, Baltimore. Hello. Don't get disgusted, gentlemen. This will work. This must work. Hello. Hello, Baltimore. Baltimore, hello. Baltimore, hello. 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 Hello, friends. Hello. <laughs> at last, at last. Professor Osgood, can you hear me? What? I said, can you hear me? Am I coming over? Don't come over this week. We got relatives. <laughs> I mean... Am I coming over the wire? Can you hear my voice? What? My voice, my voice. Oh, my voice, fine. He's in college. No, 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 not your voice, my voice. Sound, sound. That's what I said, my son's in college. Look, Professor Osgood, this is Alexander Graham Bell talking. This is important. This is for the advancement of science. Now, if you can hear me, repeat this sentence. I hear you clearly. Have you got that? I hear you clearly. I love you dearly. Hooray! There you are, gentlemen. The telephone is a success. Hooray! Ah, what a triumph. What a dramatic situation. What a picture this would make. I'll buy it. Thank you, Mr. Zanuck. Play, Phil. <laughs> then we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Now, come on with me, Mary. I'm going over to the police station to get a squad of men to go out and look for my car. J. Edgar Hoover's in town. Why don't you get him, too? He's just the man I need. Good night, folks. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may I present our versatile master of ceremonies, a comedian who, with one subtle gesture, one wistful look, can plumb the depths of your emotions. I get right down there. Why, only two weeks ago, he was Gunga Dean in a loincloth, lost on the desert. Water. Water, that's what I want. Water. And last week, he was Alexander Graham Bell, inventing the telephone. Operate. Operate. That's what I want. Operate. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we bring you the Paul Muni of radio, Jack Benny. Thank you. Hello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And, Don, I appreciate that lovely introduction you gave me. I'll admit I have done some fairly dramatic things in radio, but you really shouldn't compare me to Paul Muni. He's a great artist. But, Jack, look at the way you handled the role of Gunga Dean two weeks ago. Who else could have given it such a vivid characterization? <laughs> oh, Don. <laughs> and last week, when you portrayed Alexander Graham Bell, who else could have brought to life that great scientist and inventor? Who else? I'm thinking, Don. 
We don't grow on bushes, you know. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello. Why, Jack, do you realize that an artist like you is only born once in a hundred years? Now, wait a minute, Don. I appreciate that, but really, I'm... I'm not the actor I think I am. I mean, I'm not the actor you think I am. <laughs> You're the actor I think you are. Mary, I'm talking to Don. Uh, what were you saying, Don? We were talking about the big opening of the Hollywood racetrack last Tuesday. We were not. <laughs> now, get back in them green pastures. Yeah, sir. Oh, yes, pardon me. I was comparing you to Paul Muni. Yes. Oh, Jack, I you think you want to get off that subject. My goodness, haven't you any modesty? Well, it isn't a case of modesty, Mary. I just want to get this thing settled one way or the other. Either I'm as good as Paul Muni or I'm not. Personally, I don't think so. You can be sold. <laughs> not so easy, Mary. I never swell up without a struggle. You know that. Go on. You're the only guy I ever saw that gets mumps above the ears. <laughs> Is that so? You're certainly a smarty pants today, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Say, Jack. Yes, Phil. This may be a surprise coming from me, but the dramatic stuff you've been doing on our program lately has been terrific. No kidding? Why, there isn't one person who comes into the Wiltshire Bowl and has a marvelous dinner for a dollar and a half and no cover charge that doesn't say Jack Benny sensation. <laughs> well, thanks, Phil. I know that comes right from the heart. <laughs> I may rib you a lot, Jack, but as far as I'm concerned, you're as good an actor as Paul Muni any day, and I know what I'm talking about. Well, I... Phil, if you're kidding me, I'll kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jack, I'm on the level. <laughs> me too. <laughs> oh, I see. I get it. So you guys thought you were fooling me, eh? Thought you were putting something over on me. Well, the joke's on you because I went right along with you. Yep, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Why, Mary, you don't think for one minute that those guys had me going, did you? I was just stringing them along. You were? Certainly. Imagine comparing me to Paul Muni as though I'd fall for that. Why, as an actor, he makes me look like a nickel. You got change coming, brother. <laughs> Thanks. And congratulations to all of you. You were very clever. But you know what kills me? What? You guys can always think up silly gags to pull on me. But last week, my car was stolen right in front of the studio, and not one of you had the decency to ask me if I'd found it or what happened to it or anything. Fine bunch of pals. Oh, that's right, Jack, and I'm sorry I forgot about it. Nobody cares what happens to me. My car can be stolen, my house could burn down. Well, I could come down here next week in a wheelchair, and none of you would be surprised. Well, you're about to. <laughs> I am, eh? Yeah, you don't look so hot right now. Well, there's a reason for that, Phil. I was up all night trying to find a loophole in your contract. <laughs> That's why. Uh, did you have a lawyer with you? It wasn't the Sandman. <laughs> so Phil better keep his fingers crossed. Oh, hello, Kenny. Hello, Jack. Did you just get in? Yeah. Say, Jack, I want to tell you something before I forget it. I think you're a better actor than Paul Muni any day. Oh, fine. And that comes right from the heart. Skip it, Kenny. Skip it. It's all over. You should have got here earlier. Oh, darn it. I miss all the fun. <laughs> oh, so you were in on that little plot, too, eh, Kenny? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I was wise to the whole thing. It was a very obvious gag. Oh, I brought that up at the meeting, but no one agreed with me. The meeting? Oh, so you fellas have a club now for your little conspiracies against me. Uh, do you belong to it, Mary? Oh, sure. I'm a member of the BBUTHD. BBUTHD? What's that? Uh, Bill Benny up and tear him down. Well. Incorporated. That's quite a little organization you got there. Who's president? Roosevelt. I mean of your club. <laughs> Who's ahead of it? I'm the exalted high supreme knight from the backer. Well, I should have known that. Imagine a club devoted to the principle of making my life miserable. And now, folks, going from the secrets of this sinister organization to our solo of the evening, we will have a song by our mystic young tenor, Kenny Baker. This is a brand new number that will soon sweep the country and come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I've been listening to your program, and I think you're as good an actor as Paul Muni and Spencer Tracy put together. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. I wish somebody put me together. Goodbye. (laughs) 
I'd like to have his head on the end of my cane and sing him. That was New Moon and an Old Serenade, sung by a young punk. But uh, I want to tell you something, Kenny. That, that was very good. good. Now, how'd you know I was going to say that? You say the same thing every week. Well? You're in a rut, Pappy. <laughs> All right, sonny boy, if you want to get cute, next week I'll just ignore your song. I won't say a word about it. You do, and I'll tell Mervyn on you. <laughs> oh, stop going off just because you got a manager. I got a manager, too. Some manager. I saw him out in the hall a little while ago passing out cards. For what? Just any comedian. Available for weddings, smokers, and weenie bakes. Well? If he don't make you laugh, you only pay half. Well, that's only fair. But don't run down my manager. He keeps me busy as a bee. While last night, I was master of ceremonies at the world premiere of that new meat market in Santa Monica. <laughs> I went over very big. Uh, did you bring home the bacon? I got paid in cash. It wasn't a barter deal. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... Say, Jack, uh, I can't understand why a guy like you that's supposed to be a big shot plays all those cheap dates. Cheap dates? You're a fine one to talk. When I found you, Phil, you and your boys were playing in the rose room of a livery stable. <laughs> Bill Harris and his feed bag, nine. Remember? Them were the happy days. Yeah, they certainly were. By the way, Jack, what were you doing in the livery stable? He was in there picking. <laughs> all right, Mary, all right. Let's reminisce some other time. And speaking of jobs, Mary, I wish I had a nickel for every tray you juggle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she knows I'm not kidding. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I try to announce, next Sunday night, as a super special offering, the Flying Bennies will present, for your entertainment, one of the... Open up! You've got company! Come on in, Andy. Hiya, bud! Well, Andy, long time no see. Say, what are you doing in town? Uh, Buck, I came down to invite you and the gang over to the house next Thursday night. We're going to have big doings. Oh, what's going on, Andy? Well, Ma and Pa are celebrating their golden wedding anniversary. Golden wedding? No kidding. Gee, it doesn't seem possible that your folks have been married for 50 years. Well, Pa's still trying to get it a no. Ah, <laughs> oh, don't give me that stuff. Gee whiz, 50 years. That's a long time ago. He sure is. When they went on their honeymoon, Buck Niagara Falls was just dripping. <laughs> And look at it now. Well, we'll all be at the party, eh, fellas? Oh, yes, sir. I wouldn't miss that for anything, Andy. You going to have any entertainment there? Oh, yes, sir. We're going to have an orchestra, square dancing, and everything. Well, well. <laughs> and for the main event, Ma and Pa are going to put the gloves on for ten rounds. Oh, boxing, eh? Yeah, you ought to see Ma on those purple sights. <laughs> What do you think will win, Andy? Well, around Van Nuys, the odds are five to one on Paul. I see. But confidentially, Buck, if the fight goes over three rounds, Ma will pulverize him. Well, that sounds like there ought to be plenty of excitement. Huh? Say, Jack, don't you think we ought to chip in and buy the old folks something for their anniversary? Why, certainly. What can we buy for your Ma, Andy? Oh, anything, Buck. She'd be tickled to death if you got her a pair of gold earrings or something like that. Well, we'll make her happy. And, oh, yes, what does your Pa want for his golden wedding? Just golden wedding. <laughs> well, I don't blame him. He's got a right to celebrate. Well, Andy, you can bank on us. We'll all be there next Thursday. I don't think I can make it. I got a date to take my girl to a movie Thursday night. Why don't you take her out Friday night? I can't. She's our maid. <laughs> Well, bring her along to the party. The more, the merrier. He'll be there, Andy, and so will I. I'm counting on you. Say, Buck, I meant to tell you. I was awful sorry you you, you heard. That's all right, Andy. <laughs> Take it easy. Take it easy, Andy. <laughs> but while you're taking it easy, this isn't an hour program. I mean to... <laughs> Buck, really and truly, I was awful sorry when I heard your car was stolen. Are you going to buy another one? 
I will if I don't get my Maxwell back. You know, Andy, I hate to lose that car. It isn't the value of it, but it's a matter of sense. Well, that car is part of me. I don't know, just like a child of mine. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You need new seat covers. <laughs> Wait till I get it back. And incidentally, Mary, did you put that ad in the paper like I told you to? Yes, and I put in about the reward, too. Seventy-five dollars. Seventy-five dollars? I never mentioned any reward. Don't worry. When they see your name, they won't believe it anyway. I won't be too sure. I doubt that I'll ever get that car back. Well, why don't you buy a new one, Buck? Oh, I don't know. I might. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear it. Come on in. Happy. <laughs> How do you do, Mr. Benny? I can't guarantee immediate delivery, but don't worry, you get it just as soon as it comes from the factory. Here you are, sign right here. Wait a minute, what is this? Uh, uh, Buck, this is a friend of mine, Happy Callahan. He's an automobile salesman. Well, Andy, I don't... told me half. Now, look, Mr. Benny, you're a busy man, and the only car in the world for you right now is a Comet 6. A Comet 6? Never heard of it. What? You never heard of the zippiest, cuttiest, slickest little car on the market today? Well, half. Why, I... this job is everything. People miss transmission, automatic clutch, a duty, radio hot, and cold running water. What are you talking about? You want a car, don't you? Well, well I... do you do, and this is a lucky day for you. With every comic six this week and this week only, we're giving away absolutely free a bag of peanuts. Listen, mister, if you think I'm going to eat peanut cells all over my new car, you're crazy. Why, this is a marvelous fine, Mr. Penny. It costs only $1,200 FOB Shanghai, China. China? Yes, you know, you know, you know, you know, put some cookie out there. Go put some... What? What did you say? And besides that, you can save $200 if you drive the car home from the pack rack. Well, how am I going to drive a car from Shanghai to Los Angeles? Why, the roads are marvelous. You don't hit a stop late for 5,000 miles. <laughs> well, of course not. That's the Pacific Ocean. All right, a little water ain't going to hurt you. <laughs> Now, listen, mister, I don't want to rush into this thing. I want to give it some thought. And as soon as I decide, I'll let you know. Okay, bud, no hard feelings. See you later. Remember, those peanuts are going like hot cakes. Come on. Well, there's a go-getter if I ever saw one. Is he really a friend of yours, Andy? Sure, he's going to be at the party Thursday night, so watch out. Thanks for the warning. Oh, say, Phil, how about a number while I recover from that human tornado that blew in there? All set. What are you going to play? Wait, Tex, I'm going to play one of the zippiest, peppiest, liveliest little numbers you ever heard. It's got class, it's got Sam, it's got Sam, Wham, Sam. Oh, just play it. Don't tell it. What a night. <laughs> that was uh, My Heart Stood Still, played by Phil Harris and his internationally famous orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Internationally famous? Yes, by that, Phil, I mean you're just as well known in Tijuana as you are in San Diego. <laughs> and now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I have tried to announce several times this evening, next Sunday night, in response to requests from two great Danes, an Irish setter and numerous other dogs, we are going to present our version of 20th century's current film success, The Hound of the Baskerville. In fact, I have before me right now a letter which I received from a dog in Fireplug, Nebraska. <laughs> Especially requesting this play. May I quote from this letter? Dear Mr. Benny. <laughs> Sincerely yours, Priscilla St. Bernard. <laughs> Now, uh, as we have gone to a great deal of trouble and expense preparing this Mastiff piece, tonight, uh, hmm, <laughs> tonight we are going to give you a preview of some of the highlights of this, uh, shall I say, canine epic? Sure. Okay. That's all right with me. Me too. Oh, quiet. Now, Andy. Yes, Buck? I'm glad you stayed a while because you're going to play the leading role. That is, you're going to be the hound, a vicious, snarling beast with sharp teeth and long claws. Do I have fleas, too? No, you don't have fleas. Then what good are the long claws? Never mind. Now, in our previous... I wish you'd have had fleas after that gag. <laughs> now, in our preview, Andy... <laughs> now, in our preview, Andy, you just howl when you're supposed to. Well, what am I going to be, Jack? I'm not sure, Kenny, but I think Andy bites you in the first scene. Oh, then I guess <laughs> I better wear my old suit. I would, yeah. And, Don, I want you to announce our trailer tonight. You know, make it sound like the <laughs> march of time, as only you can do it. Okay, Jack, I'll be right up on my toes. Yes. Thanks, Don, but I doubt that they can take it. <laughs> now, everybody ready for the preview? One, two, three. Oh, for crying out loud. I'll answer it. Hello? 
Hello. Hello, boss. This is Rochester. I know who it is. What do you want? This will only take a minute. All right. What is it? Well, I don't want to appear mercenary, but you know that check you left for me this morning for my weekly salary. Yes? What about it? Well, it seems to be $2 south of the stipulated amount. <laughs> Oh, well, I meant to explain that to you, Rochester. You see, you're supposed to be my butler, my valet, and my chauffeur. Uh-huh. And inasmuch as my car was stolen last week, you're no longer a chauffeur. Uh-huh. So I'm uh, deducting $2 from your check on a technicality. A technicality? Yes. Well, boss, I'm going to get myself a pen and some ink and overrule you. <laughs> you know what? Don't you dare tamper with that check. As soon as the car's found, you'll get your full salary and not before. My full salary is only ten dollars. Well, sure it is, but you get your room and board, don't you? I can get that in jail. <laughs> oh, you can. And more of it. <laughs> That's a fine way to talk, Rochester. Why, you've gained twenty pounds since you started to work for me, and you can't deny it. I can't explain it either. <laughs> Oh, you can. Now, look, Rochester, I don't want to argue with you any longer and forget about the $2. And incidentally, you're very lucky I didn't take more out of your salary after what you did this morning. What do you mean, boy? I don't care how hot it is, you had no excuse for shaving all the fur off of Carmichael. He looks like nothing now. I told you to clip him. If I don't get that $2, I'm going to peel him. You leave, you leave that polar bear alone, and I'll talk to you when I get home. Goodbye. So long. Oh, boss. What? I forgot to tell you, your manager called. Oh, what does he want? He says there's a new driving stand opening at 10 o'clock tonight, and you got to be there in full dress. Oh, okay, I'll be there. Put on some cork. I'm working with you. Oh, no, you're not, and goodbye. Huh. None of that Sambo and Sambo stuff for me. I'm doing a monologue. All right, fellas, time is getting short, so let's get ahead with our preview. Are you ready, Don? All set, Jack. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for a few of the highlights from next week's sensational attraction, The Hound of the Baskerville. <laughs> Drama. Oh, Sherlock. Sherlock Holmes. Yes, Watson. This man is dead. Dead? How do you know? I shook hands with him and he wouldn't let go. That's elementary, Watson. Elementary. Mystery. Now, listen to me, Lady Darrell. I want the truth. Did you kill Sir Hugo? No, I didn't. You're too cruel. Too, too beastly. Rally, you are. Rally, rally, rally. And who did kill Sir Hugo? Sir Hugo was killed by... <laughs> What was that? Andy Devine. <laughs> That's elementary, Watson. Elementary. Action! Which way did he go? That way. No, this way. No, no, the other way. Which way? Anyway. Look, there he is now. I'll get him. Those are just a few of the thrills that are in store for you next Sunday night. So be sure and tune in. Pay folks! Don, we're through. Pay play, Phil. We're a little late, so good night, folks. The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Hollywood. In just a moment, you will hear from your Hollywood reporter with his frank comments about motion pictures, radio, and their glamorous stars. A man who will startle you with his sensational scoops. And here he is, folks, that human dynamo, Jimmy Fiddler Benny. Hello again, this is Jimmy Benny the Fiddler, coming to you from Hollywood. Hollywood, that small body of land entirely surrounded by racetracks. And here we go with our news bulletin. Exclusive. 
Now that Robert Taylor and Barbara Stanwyck are married, and Tyrone Power has recently wed Annabella, who will be next? Gossips have it that May Robeson and Mickey Rooney have been seen dining and dancing together in the late night spot. <laughs> but take it from me, they are just good friends. <laughs> Attention, New York reporters. Eddie Cantor, comedian noted for his five daughters, is in your town celebrating his 25th wedding anniversary. On their way back to California, Eddie and his wife, Ida, will spend a week at Sun Valley. Watch this column. Watch this column for further development. Back to Hollywood. Movie stars seen recently in Ruby Pooh's Chinese restaurant ordering their specialty Egg Pooh Young were Robert Young, Loretta Young, Roland Young, Victor Young, Clara Kimball Young, and Young Dr. Kildare. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, a special scoop. Hello, Jack. What are you doing? Quiet, Mary. More Hollywood news. Miss Ginger Fisdale, new child singing discovery, who is destined to become a great star, will be professionally known as Gin Fizz. She is three years old, and in her first screen effort, Bobby Green will play the part of her father. More Hollywood news. Oh, Jack, let me do one. All right. I have it on good authority that the Paramount Studio is planning to build Jack Benny's next picture around him. That's right. As soon as he is completely hidden, they will release it. <laughs> Quit making things up and give me that. Intimate notes from my little black book. Observed recently coming out of Maisie's fashionable beauty parlor in Beverly Hills were Joan Bennett, Myrna Loy, Carol Lombard, Hedy Lamar, and Phil Harris. <laughs> Uh, when confronted, the popular band leader claimed he made a mistake. The sign said Maisie's Salon, but he thought it was Muzzy's Saloon. <laughs> open letter. Open letter to Fred Allen. Dear Mr. Allen, I understand you are going off the air shortly for a well-deserved vacation in the rock-bound state of Maine. You've earned that vacation, Fred, and you need it. Boy, how you need it. <laughs> but before you go, Fred, may I give you this friendly bit of advice? Instead of coming back on the air next fall, get out those Indian clubs and that green wig and go back to Vaudeville. <laughs> Believe me, I'm speaking as your affectionate friend, Jimmy Fiddler Benny. Previews of the new picture. The first picture I recommend tonight is the Jones family in a gopher hole. <laughs> This is a two-bell picture. Now this three-bell picture <laughs> is good, clean fun for the entire family. The next picture I recommend is Charlie Chan in St. Paul or Mr. Moto in Minneapolis. <laughs> this mystery gets three and a half bells. The plot is fascinating. It is about three smart girls who grow up in Dodge City. And the high spot of the picture is when the Cisco kid falls off of Wuthering Heights. Oh, don't miss it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to recommend wholeheartedly, with no reservations whatsoever, Paramount's latest comedy triumph, Man About Town, starring Jack Benny. I give this picture... <laughs> Don't miss this picture, folks. It has plenty on the bell. Well, it's about all the news for tonight, folks. But before I go, I want to leave you with this thought. When you've reached the top of the ladder of success, don't forget your friends. And your relatives won't forget you. <laughs> so until we meet again, this is Jimmy Fiddler Benny saying goodnight to you. And I do mean yahoo! <laughs> Take it, my folks. That was Hooray for Spinach, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And, Phil, that was the best number you've done this season. You know, there wasn't one sour note in the whole thing. Not one. Some shock, eh, kid? You said it. Say, Phil, how'd you like my little takeoff on Jimmy Fiddler? I had some pretty hot news there, didn't I? Hot news? Nothing. I haven't been to Macy's Beauty Parlor in two weeks. You haven't? Why, Phil Harris, I saw you in there last Thursday getting a permanent wave. Oh, then I was right about that little item. Imagine a man sitting in a beauty parlor having his hair curled. 
Why don't you send yours over sometime? <laughs> Never mind my hair. Say, where's Kenny? I've got another big scoop that I've been saving, and I want everybody to hear it. Hey, Kenny. Here I am, Jack. I was up on the roof taking a sun bath. Oh, up on the roof, eh? Gee, I got a headache. Well, naturally, you stayed out in the hot sun too long. Well, it wasn't that. I fell down the elevator shaft. Oh, my goodness. Why don't you look where you're going? Gee whiz, Jack, it was the funniest feeling. What do you mean? I stepped in and said, main floor, please, and I got it right in the kisser. <laughs> For heaven's sake, watch yourself from now on. What's all the news you're going to tell us, Jack? Oh, yes. Now, listen carefully, everybody, and this is on the level. You know, two weeks from tonight, we do our last broadcast of the season. And we're going to do it from Waukegan, Illinois. Waukegan? Oh, 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 yes, sir. And the same night, we're going to have the world premiere of uh, Man About Town. No kidding, Jack. Are we really going to walk in? Yep. Two weeks from today, we'll be in my little hometown. Boy, what a hot time we'll have. We'll have to have it before 9 p.m. <laughs> Bill, they've abolished that curfew. There's plenty of excitement there now. Well, I was there last summer, and they rang that bell right on the stroke of nine. That wasn't a bell. They were kicking the gong around. <laughs> They'll show you a thing or two, brother. Well, I'm wide open, sister. Don't worry, Phil. You'll be able to keep those bags under your eyes. You won't lose them. And now, ladies and gentlemen... See, if we're going to walk, he can, i got to get some new clothes. And now, gen ladies and gentlemen, as I announced last Me week... Me too. As I announced last week, tonight the Benny Two Tickets for the Price of One Players will present their version of the... I need a new evening gown. Will present their version of Daryl F. Zanuck... I need some white flannels. Of Daryl F. Zanuck's thrilling white flannels. Or murder mystery. <laughs> will you kids be quiet? We've got a whole week to get ready. Uh, their murder mystery, The Hound of the Baskerville. Now, in this gripping drama... I need a new grip, too. Kenny. <laughs> I will play the part of Sherlock Holmes, the internationally famous detective. Penny Baker will be my assistant, Dr. Watson. And Andy Devine, where's Andy? Here I am, Bob! Gee, came in like China across the bay, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> now, Andy, you'll play the part of the vicious, snarling, murderous hound. Do you think you can do it? <laughs> Perfect. Now, this play will go on... Say, Buck, am I going to walk Keegan with you? You certainly are, Andy. Then I better put my shoes on. Yeah, you'll never regret it. You'll have the time of your life. Now, our play will go on immediately after... I'll take it. Hello? Who? Plainfield, New Jersey? That must be for you, Mary. Oh, gee, I'll bet it's Mama. Yes, Tugboat Annie is on the wire. <laughs> Hello? Oh, hello, Mama. Gee, this is a surprise. What? You've been listening to the program? How is it? Oh, it does? <laughs> she should be so critical. What, Mama? She was thrown out of the floor door at Sextet for wearing red bloomers. <laughs> yes, we're going to walk Keegan at Jack's hometown. Yes, he was born there right above a clothing store. <laughs> Oh, Mom, are you corny? What'd she say? Suits and clucks. Hmm. That's about her speed. Well, look, Mama, I got a great idea. Why don't you and Papa come to visit me in Waukegan? We can spend a few days together and you can see Jack's new picture. Oh, I don't know. I'll find out. Say, Jack, are they going? No, certainly not. No, Mama, no free dishes. <laughs> Tell her to stay home, Mary. I'll be busy enough that week. Well, I gotta hang up now. I'll write you later. Goodbye, Mama. Goodbye. Oh, Jack, hasn't Mama got the most wonderful sense of humor? Oh, she's a gem. <laughs> now, where were we? Oh, yes. Our play, The Hound of the Baskervilles, will go on right after Kenny Baker's song. Go ahead, Kenny. Okay. Say, Jack. What? You know any dames in Waukegan? I certainly do. Are they good looking? They certainly are. Can you get me a date with one of them? He certainly can. <laughs> Don't worry now, Kenny. We'll be all fixed up. Go ahead with your song. All right, Andy. Excuse me, fellas. I got to take Andy out for a walk. (laughs) 
That was And the Angels Sing, sung by Kenny Baker, the little devil of the Jello program. And now for our feature attraction, that thrilling detective mystery, The Hound of the Baskerville, or The Mayor of Van Nuys. <laughs> Say, Andy, I think you ought to try that howl just once more. It's very important to our plot. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Now, the opening scene of our play is the residence of Sherlock Holmes in London, England. As the curtain rises, we find Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson in the library. Curtain. Music. Excuse me, Watson. Hello? Sherlock Holmes on this end. Are you on your end? <laughs> Oh, it's, uh, it's you, Lord Trickletot. What, your son has run away with a chorus girl? Well, why worry about it? Oh, you saw her first. <laughs> Very well, I'll get on the trail immediately. Toodaloo. The son is always up to something or other. Dr. Watson. Watson, what are you doing there? I'm looking over the mail. Anything important? I'll say you got a postcard from Paris. Well, put down that magnifying glass and give it to me. <laughs> okay. I say, this is from Fifi, the little dancer I met at the Polly's de Jure. She says, Dear Sherlock, Qu'est-ce qu'il sait, voulez-vous? Venez, elle dit quoi, très chaud. What does that mean? Long time, no see. <laughs> I think I'll run over to Paris and visit her. But what about your work here, Sherlock? After all, you're a detective. Well, I got a cherche la femme, don't I? <laughs> I tell you, Watson is so dull around here. The cases I've been getting lately are ridiculously simple. They're not baffling enough. There's no excitement. <coughs> what was that? It's 12.30. <laughs> oh, yes. You know, Watson, if there isn't... If there isn't any more action around here, I'm going to take a vacation. Hmm, there's someone at the door. I wonder who it is, Sherlock. It's a young lady about 23 years of age with beautiful blonde hair, blue eyes, and a divine figure. Why, that's amazing. How do you know? Well, to tell the truth, Watson, I'm just hoping... Come in. Hello. Oh, shucks, it's Mary. Quiet, Watson. <laughs> How do you do, madam? How do you do? Oh, Mr. Holmes, you must help me. You must, you must. What seems to be the trouble, young lady? Well, you see, Mr. Holmes, I'm engaged to Philip Baskerville, the son of Sir Hugo Baskerville. Oh, Sir Hugo, I know him well. He's quite a lively old boy. Well, he's calmed down considerably. He was murdered last night. <laughs> Well, that'll do it every time. <laughs> now, are you sure Sir Hugo is dead? I'm positive. How do you know? He doesn't giggle when we dust him off. <laughs> then he is dead. Uh, continue, my dear. Well, according to the legend of the Baskervilles, Sir Philip, my fiancé, is the next one marked for death. Amazing. The first Baskerville was killed. So was the second. Then the third and the fourth. I see. And Sir Philip is next? Yes. When they get him, it's bingo. <laughs> hmm, it's a very interesting case. Now tell me, Miss... Uh... Lady Barrow. Lady Barrow. Is there any clue to these murders? Only one. Before each death, we always hear the howling of a dog on the lonely moor outside the castle. Oh, it's ghastly. Oh, a dog, eh? Then we have a clue already. Lady Barrow, I'll be glad to take the case. My fee, of course, will be $1,000. You won't get it, of course. Of course. Make a note of that, Watson. Okay. No sale. <laughs> uh, you may go now, Lady Barrow. Dr. Watson and I will follow immediately. Thank you. Oh, tell me. I've never been to Baskerville Castle. How will I find it? Very drafty. Goodbye. <laughs> well, at last, Watson, we've got a case worthy of my merit. Let's hurry. We haven't a moment to lose. <laughs> Scene two, three hours later, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have just crossed the dark and desolate moor and are approaching Baskerville Castle. What a night. Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson, is that you behind me? Yeah. Stick close to me. Gee, I can't see a thing. It sure is dark tonight. I'll say it's dark. I just saw an owl with a lantern. 
<laughs> Look, Watson, do you see that light up ahead? Yes, that must be the place. I'm positive. Let's hurry. This is the castle, all right. Look at that coat of arms on the door. It says Baskerville Hall. In hope signum, multum paro. What does that mean? No cover charge. <laughs> If this is the Wilshire Bowl, I'll kill myself. <laughs> Ring the bell, Watson. Okay. Hmm, cheerful little spot. How do you do, gentlemen? Is this uh, Baskerville Castle? Yes. Whom shall I say is calling? <laughs> Uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. <laughs> Smarty. Gee, I wish I could do that. You fall down that elevator shaft a couple of more times and you'll be all set. Where's Lady Barrow? Follow me, gentlemen. Lady Barrow, the detectives have arrived. Thank you, Butch. You may go. I'll go. I'll go, but watch your step, Mr. Holmes. You may be next. Now, Lady Barrow... Wait a minute. I'm not through. <laughs> Silly boy. Now, Lady Barrow, I want to meet your guests and question them. Very well. First, I'd like you to meet my fiancé, Sir Philip Baskerville. Hello, Sir Philip. How do you do, Mr. Holmes? Weren't you once the house detective at the Savoy Ritz? No, that was my brother that used to throw you out. <laughs> He's not there anymore. Oh, goody. And now, Mr. Holmes, may I present Madame Zarathi, the famous psychic. She has supernatural power. Ah, good evening, Madame Zarathi. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. And that's Sir Hugo lying across the table. Oh, the victim. Well, that's the first time I ever saw Sir Hugo on top of a table. <laughs> well, now that I've met everyone, I've got to get to work and solve this case. Hmm, the victim looks as though he met a violent death. Look at the way his clothes are torn. And those long scratches on his throat. I didn't do it. I didn't do it, I tell you. I didn't do it. I swear it wasn't me. We know it wasn't you, Dr. Watson. Don't be too sure. <laughs> Quiet. Sir Philip. Yes, Mr. Holmes? You inherit a lot of money by Sir Hugo's death. Tell me, where were you at the time of the murder? You can't pin this on me. I've got an ironclad alibi. Oh, you have, eh? Well, just answer my question. Where were you at the time of the murder? In Maisie's beauty parlor, and you know it. <laughs> Well, somebody committed this crime, and I'm going to find out who it is. Maybe I can help you, Mr. Holmes. Help me? How, Madame Zarecki? Sir Hugo himself will tell me. Well, Sir Hugo is dead. I know, but I will talk to his spirit in the great beyond. Why, that's impossible. Oh, she's very good. She got South America this morning. <laughs> Why, this is ridiculous. But we'll try it. Now will you all please sit around in a circle and hold hands. Oh, all right. Come on, everybody. Oh, oh I think I'll hold it. Now turn off the light. Quiet, everybody. Now concentrate. Concentrate on Sir Hugo. Sir Hugo. Sir Hugo, are you there? Hmm, this is silly. Sir Hugo, if you are there, answer me. Bosh, it'll never work. Yeah, bosh. Quiet, Watson. Sir Hugo, we are calling you. If you hear my voice, answer me. Answer me. Oh, I hear you, madam. What? Did you hear that, Watson? Yeah. Madam Zarecki, can I speak to him now? Yes, but don't lose the contact. I won't. Sir Hugo, do you hear me? Yes. Then tell me, how were you killed? Well, I was out walking on the moor last night. Yes. And just as I got to the garden wall, I saw a huge tribe of seal across me. All of a sudden, I started for it and he grabbed me by the tribe of seal across me. I couldn't give my son all that fire sort of oh. But that didn't kill me. It should have. Why? But, Sir Hugo, if that didn't kill you, what did? Well, I picked myself up and ran toward the house. Uh huh. And just as I got there, there was a huge horn for the first time. And he bring his back to solve it. You know that purpose? Yes. Well, the whole time I see the frozen seed is painted, and there I am on the table. <laughs> but, sir, Hugo, you still haven't told us. Who committed this crime? Who murdered you? 
Very well. I was killed by... Put in a nickel, please, for five more minutes. Get off the line, Aubrey. <laughs> Continue, sir, you go. Your murder must be avenged. I was killed by... Stop! Stop! I can't stand it any longer. I confess I did it. I did it. I killed him. Ha-ha! <laughs> 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 I knew it all the time. I don't know why I did it. I must have been mad, crazy, delirious. <laughs> Black the handcuffs on him, Watson. The case of the Baskervilles is solved. Hey, Sherlock, what about me? Oh, my goodness, I forgot all about the hound. I'm sorry, Andy. Play, Bill. And we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And, Andy, I'm awfully sorry I overlooked you in our play. I don't know how I ever happened to forget about the hound. Oh, that's all right, Buck. You want to howl now? Was that a dog? Sounded like the 515. It sure did. Good night, folks. <laughs> the Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Confidentially. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this being Father's Day, we bring you a man who is daddy to a polar bear, Jack Benny. <laughs> Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, you're right. I do take rather a paternal attitude toward Carmichael. You know, that animal is like a child of mine. He's so affectionate. You're really very fond of him, aren't you, Jack? I certainly am. Believe me, we're going to have a lot of fun this summer on our trip to Alaska. Oh, are you taking Carmichael to Alaska? Yes, he has relatives in Skagway. (laughs) (laughs) Two uncles and a sister-in-law, I believe. (laughs) By the way, Don, uh, what are you going to do on your vacation? Well, I haven't planned very much, Jack, but let me tell you something. When you see me next season, you're due for a big surprise. What do you mean? Well, I'm going on a diet this summer and take off ten pounds. My, my. You'll never know me. Don, you could take ten pounds off your lower lip and nobody would know me. (laughs) Now, when you go on a diet, you ought to try and take off about 50 or 60 pounds while you'd even feel better. Jack, this may surprise you, but I'm not as fat as you think. What oh. appears to be fat is really muscle. Oh, oh. My stomach, for instance, is as solid as the Rock of Gibraltar. Oh, it is. Well, Don, I saw you playing golf the other day in nothing but a pair of shorts, and Gibraltar was out of bounds. <laughs> What a physique. Say, Jack. Yes, Phil? I wouldn't talk about Don's figure if I were you. I've seen you around your swimming pool, and you're no Adonis in a bathing suit. Oh, I'm not, eh? Your chest caves in, your stomach sticks out, and your legs look like they were tired of it all. (laughs) Well, Phil, you don't even have to get undressed to lose a beauty contest. You know, your nose looks like a pack mule with those bags hanging down each side. And by the way, have you got your other bag packed for Waukegan? You know, uh, we're leaving tonight uh, right after the broadcast. I'm all set, Jackson. Yeah, I can hardly wait to see all my old friends and pals. Yeah, I'm excited as a kid all week thinking about it. I can imagine. Where are we going to live when we get there, Jack? Well, you fellas are going to stay at the hotel Waukegan. So you, uh, you stopped there last summer, didn't you, Phil? Yeah. Oh, you'll love it, Don. It's a swell hotel. Very modern. Go on, they got a house detective there with a bow and arrow. <laughs> Is that so? And if you're not downstairs by 7 a.m., they send a maid up to see if you're dead. <laughs> well, that's because Waukegan is a wide-awake town. Everybody gets up early. Are you going to live at the hotel, Jack? Well, I'm not sure, Don. I'll probably stay with relatives. I don't know whether to live at Aunt Clara's or Aunt Molly's or Cousin Sudie's. They're all so anxious to entertain me. Well, uh, which one is the closest to town? Aunt Molly. She lives right over the elite Turkish bath. <laughs> As a matter of fact, she's a rubber there, right? <laughs> oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Oh, say, Jack, I just got a wire from Mom, and she won't be able to meet us in Waukegan. Well, I'm just sick about that. <laughs> what does your mother say? She says that, dear Mary, we'll be unable to take the train to Waukegan as your grandfather, who is off the beam again, cut paper dolls out of a ticket. <laughs> No. 
Well, maybe you can go to Plainfield afterwards and visit your mother and father. By the way, Mary, this is Father's Day. Did you send your dad anything? I sure did. I sent Papa some cufflinks and studs for his dress shirt. Dress shirt? Well, your father never wore a full dress suit in his life. He does now. I got a job with an escort service. Oh, fine. Now when he takes Mom to the movies, he charges her 60 cents an hour. Well, it's worth it to go out with her. Anyway, Mary, I'm glad you remembered your father. That was a sweet thought. Not only that, I sent him the cutest card with it, and I made up the words myself. You did? What was it? Oh, Daddy dear, oh, Daddy dear, I send you cufflinks with good cheer. And when you hawk them, which you'll do, if you can't get five, go ahead, take two. <laughs> Well, that's a lovely sentiment. He'll probably take advantage of it. Say, Jack, I sent a present to my father down in Tennessee that he'll be crazy about. I sent him a vacation outfit. A vacation outfit? Yeah, a hammock, a jug, and a fly swatter. <laughs> well, he's all set for the summer. What does your father do in the winter, Phil? Same thing, only we give him a blanket. <laughs> Well, that's, that's the life, I suppose. Take it easy and don't worry about anything. You know, it's kind of nice that Dad gets a break once a year. I sent my father a pair of leggings. Oh, is he still with Western Union? No. <laughs> he wears them when he goes horseback riding. Hello, Jack. Oh, hiya, Kenny. Say, Kenny, are you all set to leave for Walk Keegan? You know, we're going, we're going right after the broadcast. Oh, sure. I got my suitcase downstairs on the sidewalk. On the sidewalk? Well, for heaven's sake, bring it in. Somebody's liable to steal it. Well, don't worry. Nobody will touch my suitcase. How do you know? I printed J. Edgar Hooper on it. Well, that's very clever, Kenny. How'd you ever happen to figure that? Oh, Kid Baker has a flash once in a while. <laughs> you have it there. Now, Kenny, when we get to Walk Keegan... I want you to be on your best behavior and make a good impression. You know, I don't want you whistling at the girls like you do here. Can I wink at them? No. You can't whistle and you can't wink, so watch yourself. And now, folks... Can I wiggle my ears? No. <laughs> you won't show off at all. I want everybody in Waukegan to say, now there's a nice boy. And now, folks... I'd rather have him run me out of town. <laughs> Penny. I don't want to hear another word about it. And now, folks, we will have a song by our fresh young tenor who's going to get his canoe paddled if he doesn't watch out. <laughs> now, uh, go ahead. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I just dropped in to wish you a very pleasant trip to Waukegan and to tell you that I'll miss you while you're gone. Well, thanks very much. Well, what are you standing there for? Ain't you going to kiss me goodbye? <laughs> no, I'm not. Get out of here. <laughs> He's the most affectionate lunatic I ever met. Sing, Kenny. There we go. That was Don't Worry About Me, sung by Kenny Baker. And, Kenny, before I forget, I uh, saw your picture, the Mikado, last night, and I thought you were swelling it. You look great in Technicolor. Oh, I thought I was too darn pretty. <laughs> well, that oughtn't to worry you. Good looks never hurt anybody. At least it's never hurt me. Can I say something, Jack? No. <laughs> anyway, the Mikado was a swell picture, Kenny, and you were grand in it. The Mikado? Say, that's a Western, ain't it? That was our... <laughs> that was our musical director, folks. Phil, for your information, the Mikado is one of the most famous operettas ever written. No kidding. You're a fine musician, Phil. For you to pick up a baton and lead an orchestra is perjury. <laughs> Why, Jack Benny, you didn't know what the Mikado was yourself until you saw the picture. I didn't know what the Mikado was? Why, Mary Livingston, before we went into the theater, I told you it was an Oriental story. You told me Charlie Chan was in it, too. <laughs> All right, so I made one little mistake. <laughs> But Phil has no excuse. He's supposed to have studied music. That studying don't mean nothing. Why, some of our greatest musical geniuses never studied music. Name one. Abe Lyman. Oh, fine. <laughs> Lyman is worse than you are. He directs his boys with a rawhide whip. You know, funny thing about you and Lyman, Phil, you both started out as drummers, and now you both have your own orchestras. Proving what? Proving hooray for the red, white, and blue. It could only happen here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what. Oh, Jack, why do you criticize other musicians? You took violin lessons for 12 years, and all you can play is Love and Bloom. All I can play is Love and Bloom? What's the matter with Thanks for the Memory? What's the matter with Deep Purple? Nothing until you start sawing on them. <laughs> 
Listen, Mary, your opinion doesn't matter very much. If you want to know something, I've been complimented by Heifetz. Heifetz? Why, Heifetz doesn't even know you're alive. He does, too, because he tried to shoot me once. <laughs> It was at the Penn Theater in Wilkes-Barre. So don't be so smart. You know, I don't like to pat myself on the back all the time, but there's one instrument I've really mastered. Well, I can make a violin talk. You certainly can, Jack. Thanks, Don. And now, ladies and gentlemen, going from my talking violin to our last play of the season, tonight, the Benny Run Do Not Walk to the Nearest Exit Players will present for your amusement, approval, and edification that stirring melodrama of the gay 90s, Lavender and Old Louse. Now, I will play Lavender, and our maestro will be the rest of the title. <laughs> now, in this play... I'll take it. Hello? Hello, boss. This is Rochester. All right. What do you want? Well, I just finished pressing your clothes for the trip, and I don't think you ought to take your white flannel with you. Why not? Well, you know that trouble I had with the toast every morning. Yes. Well, the same thing happened to your flannel, only I had <laughs> Rochester, did you burn a hole in my new white flannels? It ain't my fault, boss. It's that cheap material. <laughs> cheap material? What are you talking about? I paid $45 for those pants. $45? Yes. Is this you, boss? Yes, it's me. <laughs> you don't act so surprised. By the way, is Carmichael already? I think you're making a mistake taking that polar bear to walk even. Well, I'm going to leave him. I'm not going to leave him in the house by himself for two weeks. He'll get lonely. Why don't you rug him? <laughs> rug him, Rochester. I'm getting tired of these constant threats against Carmichael. Now put him in that big packing box and take him to the station. I can't put him in that box, boss. Why not? I'm talking from there now. <laughs> You're in the packing case? Well, for heaven's sake, where's Carmichael? He's sitting on the lid. Oh, my goodness. If I had a long pin, I'd dethrone him. <laughs> oh, stop playing with that animal and finish packing. And by the way, Rochester, I'm taking my violin with me, so don't forget it. Doggone, I looked high and low for that fiddle, and I can't find it nowhere. Oh, well, I suppose it never occurred to you to look in my violin case. I did, boss. Well... There ain't nothing there but four strings and a fat termite. <laughs> now, don't give me that. The violin is around someplace. Now, get everything together. My trunks, bags, Carmichael, violin, and hurry down to the station. Okay. Can I take a taxi? What's the matter? Have the buses stopped running? <laughs> now, hang up and get going. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Doggone, if I could get three dollars a head, I'd quit this job. What? What did you say? Didn't I hang up? No, you didn't. <laughs> well, here goes. So long, boss. The guy is always complaining. <laughs> Never thought such a guy. Now he wants to ride in taxi cab. Oh, well. Getting back to our play, the opening scene... Say, Jack, I don't think we're going to be able to do our play tonight. Look what time it is. Oh, yes. The train leaves in about 40 minutes, and we've got to get downtown. Where do we leave from? The New Union Station. Phil, have you got your car here? Yeah, I'll have my guitar player run us down. Oh, you mean Happy Bolivar? <laughs> <laughs> That's well. Come on, Mary. We'll be late. Wait a minute. i got to kiss the orchestra goodbye. Put down that piano player and come on. <laughs> so long, boy. See you at the station. So long. So long, Jack. So long. So long. Hit it, man. <laughs> Now, stick close to me, everybody. I don't want anyone missing the train. I'll call the roll. Don Wilson? Here. Mary Livingston? Oh, Jack, stop acting like a scout master. Well, I'm trying to be systematic. Hey, Kenny, get a load of that blonde. Wow, what a doll. Ain't she something? Hiya, babe. Hello, Kenny. Why, Kenny, do you know her? Yeah, that's my Aunt Rosie. Well, she ain't my aunt. Wait a minute, Rosie. <laughs> Bill, come back here. You'll miss the train. Oh, Don, take a look around. See if you can find Andy in Rochester. Okay, Jack. I don't know where they are. All aboard! Train leaving on track three for Santa Monica, Santa Clara, Santa Anita, Santa Barbara, and Santa present to your dad is Father's Day. <laughs> All aboard! <laughs> well, he's a topical announcer, I'll say that. Hey, Kenny, Kenny, where's your suitcase? Somebody stole it! 
Somebody stole it. Well, that's awful. What are you going to wear on the train tonight? You haven't got pajamas or anything. I'll lend him a pair of my pajamas, Jack. Just give him the uppers, Don. He can use it for a nightgown. <laughs> and tie a bell around his neck. He might get lost. Yeah. Oh, this is too complicated. I'll sleep raw. <laughs> Leave any way you want to. I don't care. Say, Mary, I'm going over and buy the tickets. I haven't got them yet. Okay, Jack. I'm going to get some magazines. Meet me here. All right. Well, let's see. Where's the ticket window? Oh, here it is. Pardon me. I'd like to buy seven tickets to Walt Keegan. Walt Keegan. Uh, that's an Asia Minor, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's an Illinois. I want seven round-trip tickets to Walt Keegan, Illinois. Why don't you buy one way? You might like it there. I know I like it there. It's my hometown. But I gotta come back here. I'm in pictures. So is I. And look at me now. <laughs> well, that's your tough luck. Now hurry up. I gotta make a train. Okay, here you are. And oh yes, I want berths. I want four uppers and three lowers. Well, you know the lowers are higher than the uppers. I know. I did that in Bordeaux twenty years ago. <laughs> so don't start that routine. Just give me the berth. Here you are. Thanks. Gee, what a guy. Have a nice trip, Dead Pan. <laughs> Deadpan, he wants me to laugh yet. Mm-hmm. All aboard! Train leaving on track 16 for Louisville and Bowling Green. Nashville, Knoxville, Vicksburg 2, and all points out on the choo choo choo. <laughs> That guy has more fun than the Ritz brothers. <laughs> now, let's see. Where's the magazine stand? Oh, there's Mary now. Hey, Mary. Yeah? Uh, did you get your magazine? Uh-huh. I got look, pick, click, and cluck. <laughs> oh, cluck. That's that new one, isn't it? Yeah, it's got Kenny Baker's picture on the cover. Well, that ought to sell a million copies. Come on back there with me, Mary. I want to get a book. Okay. I want to get something you like. A good mystery or something. Uh, why don't you get Ferdinand the Bull? Ferdinand the Bull isn't a mystery. He is to the other bulls. <laughs> now, I'll pick out my own book. Now, here we are. How do you do, sir? Now, how do you do? I'd like to get a book, please. A real good mystery story. Yes, sir. Have you read Phil Harris and his gang or Murder at the Wilshire Bowl? <laughs> no, but I get what you mean. Say, Jack, huh. here's a swell book, and it's a special. A special? What is it? The rain came and an umbrella for two fifty. Oh, that's by Lewis Bromfield. He's a little too deep for me. Say, buddy, what's your best seller here? Well, our most popular book is Twenty Four Fifty Ugin Fifty Fifty by Francis Fisher Jr. <laughs> Funny, I never heard of that. Why, it's very popular. He also wrote Twenty Four Wilson Fifty Fifty and the Life of Amos and Rufus. <laughs> No, never mind. Come on, Mary. Wait a minute. Why don't you take this one, Jack? What's that? Ralph Ram did it by George P. Swanfum. Don't you start that stuff. Hey, buddy, just give me a Saturday evening pose. There you are. Come on, Mary, let's go. Goodbye, any kind of pose. Oh, please, (laughs) sir. I meet the most unusual people. I wish Rochester would get here. He's making me very nervous. There's Don Wilson. Oh, Don. That's the information booth. I mean next to us. Uh, pardon me, mister. No, now what? Can you tell me what time the airplane leaves here for San Francisco? Airplane? I'm afraid you're going to have a little trouble, buddy. Airplanes don't leave from a railroad station. Oh, you're one of those wise guys that knows everything. I'm not a wise guy, but I know you can't take an airplane from a railroad station. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Ward, airplane leaving on track eight. <laughs> Salinas, Oakland, and San Francisco. Board! What? You see, you big smarty. Oh, go pin your hair up. <laughs> Fresh guy. Well, Jack, I found Andy. Here he is. Hiya, bud. Well, Andy, I was worried about you. <laughs> Gee, you got a lot of friends at the station. <laughs> Are you all excited about going to Walt Keegan with us? Yeah, but gee, I'm scared. I've never been on a train before. Well, you'll get a big kick out of it. You bring your pajamas? Pajamas? Oh, gone. Can you sleep on a train? Why, of course. Certainly. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. Can you eat, too? Yeah, Jack brought sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> One more crack and you won't get any. Where am I? Oh. Now, let's get over <laughs> to miss my place at a station. Now, let's get over to the gate. Uh, how long does it take to go to Waukegan anyway? Well, Andy, we'll be on the train for two whole days and two nights. We will? Yep. 
for three bucks, do they have Yes, it? yes, don't worry. <laughs> be all right. Well, what are we going to Waukegan for anyway? Well, Andy, we're going to do our last broadcast in there. And besides, we're going to have the premiere of that new Paramount picture, Man About Town. Starring Jack Benny. Get it all in. Never mind. Hey, Phil. Phil, stick around here, will you? I don't want to have to look for you. Okay, Papa. Yeah, I wish Rochester would get here. The train will be pulling out in a few minutes. Well, it's your own fault, making him look all over the house for that violin. Why do you want to take it to Waukegan anyway? Because my old violin teacher, Charlie Lindsay, will be at the premiere. And I want to show everybody in Waukegan what he's done for me. Well, that's the dirtiest trick I ever heard of. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I'm going to practice every day on the train. Oh, Greyhound, where is thy depot? <laughs> Bill, if you don't like it, you can stay home. All aboard. Train leaving on track seven for Grub Hollow, Possum Junction, Squirrel Center, Beaver Creek, Mud City, and Waukegan. Aboard. Oh, my goodness, there's our train in Rochester. is isn't here yet. Yeah, I am, boy. Well, it's about time. You got all the stuff with you? Yep. Trump, bag, violin, and everything. Good. Where's Carmichael? He's buying the tickets. I bought the tickets already. <laughs> Carmichael, come here. Come on, gang. Let's go. Okay, <laughs> Say, Rochester, I'm afraid to put Carmichael in the baggage car. He'll have to share a compartment with you. I don't want that animal in with me. He snores. Oh, what's the difference? You're only going to be on the train two nights. Well, if he snows the first night, the second night you can get a piece of him in the dining car. <laughs> you lay a hand on him and I'll... Hurry up, Jack. The train's waiting. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> We'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time, broadcasting from my hometown, Waukegan, Illinois. Well, Andy, are you thrilled being on a train for the first time? I sure am, but say, Buck, ain't it dangerous going through that Indian country? Oh, no, Andy. I've been through it a hundred times, and I haven't been scalped once. You'd never know it. Is that so? Good night, folks. The Jell-O Program, coming to you from Waukegan, Illinois, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Waukegan. Our last broadcast of the season is coming to you from the stage of the Genesee Theater in Waukegan, Illinois. Yes, sir. Jell-O again, folks. Please, Jack, wait till I introduce you. Oh, pardon me, I'm nervous. On a certain Valentine's Day many years ago, a stork flew over this fair city and dropped a little bundle of joy. And who do you think this bundle was? Uh, Jello again. This Jack, is ja will you please wait a minute? Don, who was born here, you or me? <laughs> For heaven's sake. So without further ado, I bring you that local boy who surprised everybody by making good, Jack Benny. Thank you. Hello again. This is Bundle Benny talking. And it's about time. Gosh, Don, I've been so thrilled and excited the last few days that, well, really, I don't know where I'm at or what I'm doing. Well, I can certainly appreciate that. <laughs> you look it. <laughs> well, you know, Don, I spent the last four days just renewing old acquaintances and visiting all my old hangouts. What a time I've been having. Well, who'd you see, Jack? Oh, everybody. Ollie Eimerman, Stubb Wilbur, Cliff Gordon. And yesterday, I dropped into Bobby O'Farrell's pool room. I haven't seen Bobby in 15 years. Hey, I'll bet he was thrilled to death. Was he? Why, the minute I walked in, he said to me, Jack, will you ever forget the day you were showing off and you ripped a hole in the cloth on the billiard table? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I sure do, Bobby. And he said, that'll be $3. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was just tickled to death. <laughs> and how? Oh, uh, by the way, Jack, did you see that pal of yours that you're always talking about, uh... Oh, you know, the fellow that runs the clothing store. Oh, you mean Julius. Julius Seneca. That's the fellow. Was he glad to see you? Glad to see me. Don, when I walked into his store, there were tears in his eyes as he jumped over the counter, threw his arms around me and said, Yes, sir, what can I do for you? <laughs> Before I got out of there, I had three Palm Beach suits and a raccoon coat. <laughs> he must have been kidding, you know. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. How's the Waukegan kid? Oh, I'm swell, Phil. Have you been having a good time? I'll say, but you know what happened last night, Jack? No, what? Well, a bunch of us fellas were sitting up in my hotel room, just sitting in my room, and we were singing and laughing, and 
making a lot of noise, and the first thing you know, a couple of cops came up and took us to the Who's Gal. Took you to the Who's Gal? Wait a minute, Phil. You mean to say they put you in jail? Those weren't candy bars I was looking through. <laughs> well, for heaven's sake, why didn't you call me? I'd have had the mayor, Bitey Talcott, fix it up. He could have taken care of that. He could, eh? He was with us. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I should have warned him about you. So you and the mayor have been palling around together, eh? Yeah, he thinks I'm a riot. Yeah. Listen, Phil, I know Bitey Talcott pretty well. He isn't going to fall for that corny chatter of yours. Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. How are you? <laughs> well, Mary, here we are in my hometown. Are you enjoying yourself? Am I? Gee, everybody's been so wonderful to me. I've been out sightseeing every day. Hey, you don't have to get nervous. This is my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mary, there's plenty to see here, too. Huh? You know, Jack, I even saw the house you were born in. No kidding. It's a fish market now. <laughs> a fish market? Well, of all things. But they haven't forgotten you, Jack. They haven't, eh? No, they got a big sign there that says, Jack Benny born here. Fresh mackerel daily. <laughs> well, naturally, they have to advertise what they're selling. What else did you do, Mary? Well, I went over to the City Hall Park to see that elm tree they planted in your honor. Oh, yes. You see that elm tree? I'll say. <laughs> What are you laughing at? There was a squirrel in it signing autographs. <laughs> that was my uncle, Tarzan Benny. Yeah. But say, fellas, you ever notice uh, what a, for a town this size how many pretty girls there are here? You're right, Jack. The girls are beautiful. How they go for me. Oh, sure. Why, they're always staring at me. Well, Phil, Marcel hair for men is a novelty around here. <laughs> You know, so uh, stop taking bows. Say, Jack, uh, you told me that you used to be quite a ladies' man in this town. Have you seen any of your old girlfriends? Have I? Why, Don, only this morning I was walking down Washington Street, and who did I run into but Vivian Thompson? You know, when we were kids, she and I were kind of stuck on each other. You know, I used to write her notes, and we used to give each other presents. In fact, I still have a lock of her hair. You ought to paste it on, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind that. Vivian and I had quite a romance. Was she thrilled seeing you again? Well done. She, uh... Did she kiss you? I didn't put this lipstick on my forehead myself. You know, to tell you the truth, I think she's still crazy about me. Well, if she's so crazy about you, why did she kiss you on the forehead? <laughs> because she's taller than I am. <laughs> That's why. What do you want me to do, carry a box to stand on? <laughs> anyway, let's not get into an argument here. I'm feeling too good. Me too. And I'm so grateful the way people here have treated me that I wrote a poem all about Waukegan. Well, that's a fine way to pay him back. <laughs> now, go ahead. Let's hear it. Well, Jack, I'm going out in the hall for a glass of water. I'm going with you, and I never touch it. Come back here, both of you. <laughs> if I can take it, you can. Now, go ahead with your poem, Mary. What, uh, what's the title of it? Uh, to Waukegan, where Jack Benny was born in the year Never 18... mind, never mind. Read the poem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> Go ahead. Oh, Waukegan, oh, Waukegan, on the shores of Lake Michigan. Michigan? Jack was born here in this place. He was very pretty, except his face. I was pretty all over. Well, go ahead. Once you were a little village, Indians roamed here to and fro. But now you are a great big city, and you gotta buy beads in the ten cent store. Ten cent store? True enough, honey. Well, we certainly got to Alabama fast. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> Continue, Mary. <laughs> I like your parks. I like your streets. I like your homes. They are so neat. I like your lake. I like your boat. Your sailors really know no their own. <laughs> so, oh, Waukegan, oh, Waukegan, we'll be sad when we are leaving. But before I go, this kiss I give... To one and all, from Mary Live, the end. Well, it's about time. Mm -hmm. Now, Mary, that was simply wonderful. Oh, Phil, do you think you can follow that with a number? Sure, Jack, I'll follow anything. I know, I've seen you on the street. <laughs> now, go ahead. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes. Oh, Waukegan, here am I. Did I walk or did I fly? Is this just a dream for a chance? Oh, gee whiz, I forgot my pants. Woo! <laughs> well, I'm going to shoot him during the quail season, folks. Play, Phil. 
That was Rose of Washington Square, played by Phil Harrison's orchestra. And I'm not saying this because it's our last program of the season, Phil, but on the level, that number was really swell. Thanks, Jack. Now, if your boys played like that every week, I'd be proud that I was a member of the Musicians' Union. I thought they threw you out. They did not. I'll show you my membership card. I got it right here in my wallet. Oh, don't take off the barbed wire just for that. (laughs) That's a fine way to talk, Mary, after the way I've been spending money on you. I took you to Nolan's restaurant every single night this week for dinner. Yes, and I know why we always went to Nolan's. Never mind. Why, Mary? Fifteen years ago, Jack bought a meal ticket there, and he had eight punches left. (laughs) Well, I can't carry it around with me forever. I'd like to take one of those punches and give it right to you, right in the nose. (laughs) Oh! Smart on the last program, huh? (laughs) And now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a special announcement to make this evening. As you all know, tonight, immediately after our broadcast, we are having the world premiere of Paramount's new picture, Man About Town. And there are a lot of Hollywood celebrities here in our audience. There's Mark Sandwich, the director, Dorothy Lamour, Hedda Hopper, myself. Phil Harris. Yes, we know you're here, Phil. And incidentally, when your face appears on the screen, just applaud. Don't stamp and whistle. <laughs> you know, you're not the only one in the picture. I'm the only one with sex appeal. Well, if that isn't the hammiest remark, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Listen, brother, I got more appeal than you any day, and I'll leave it to Mary. You better not. (laughs) Well, then you'll just have to take my word for it, Phil. Now, let's see, where were we? Oh, yes, in addition to our Hollywood celebrities, we also have with us several distinguished guests from Waukegan. And I'd like to present to you now an old school chum of mine who, through hard work and diligent perseverance, has gone far in the field of politics. Here he is, folks, the Honorable Mansell Bidey Talcott, Mayor of Waukegan. Well, well, well. Hello, Bidey. Welcome to the Jell-O program. Hiya, Jackson. Are you in the groove? (laughs) What? What's that? Are you diving, kid? Oh, you've been around with Harris, all right. Well, anyway, Bidey, it's sure good to see you again, and you're certainly looking fine. How do you feel? Swell, Jack. I'm right on the boom. That's on the beam. (laughs) On the beam, Bidey. Well, this stuff is new to me. Oh. It's new to everybody but Phil. Say, Mayor, why don't you give out with a couple of those gags I told you? Okay, Twitch. The fine mayor. I couldn't even be alderman in this town. <laughs> Let's see, where am I? Huh? Oh, here. Now, wait a minute, buddy. I'm afraid we haven't time for any of Phil's gags, but I do want to tell you how much I appreciate your coming up here tonight to take a bow. And for the hospitality you've shown the gang and myself all week. I'll never forget it. You're welcome, Jack. And believe me, that goes for the whole town. See you later. Okay, buddy. Well, so long, buddy. So long, Jack. Well, Phil, see you later. And we'll go out and cut a rug. Okay, man. <laughs> well, that body called up. He sure is a nice guy. He gave me nine keys to the city already. He carries them around like lifesavers. And now, folks, as Kenny Baker, our young tenor, was called back to Hollywood, uh, he will not be with us tonight. So for the vocal highlight of the evening, Mr. Phil Harris, the Nightingale of the South, and Miss Mary Livingston, the Plainfield Thrush, <laughs> will blend their voices in a popular little number called, uh... That must be Bidey again. Is that you, Mayor? It sure is, Buck. Open up! Well, the Mayor of Van Nuys... <laughs> Well, Andy, I thought you'd never get here. What delayed you? I couldn't find the theater. Why, anybody could have told you where the Genesee Theater is. All you had to do was ask them. Well, I ask a lot of people, Buck, but every time I open my mouth, they just looked in. (laughs) 
Well, your tonsils are intriguing. Uh, you know, Andy, uh, you should have been here a few minutes ago. You being the mayor of Van Nuys, I could have introduced you to the mayor of Waukegan. Oh, I know, buddy. I was over at the city hall with him all morning. Yeah, what were you doing? Oh, we just sat around and hammered with our gavels. <laughs> Say, hey, I'll bet that was a lot of fun. Huh? Hey, Andy, have you been down to Chicago yet? There's a town you ought to see. Chicago? Where's that? Oh, Andy, you know, it's that big city with the tall buildings. You know where we change trains. Is that Chicago? Certainly. Well, doggone, Bitey told me that was South Waukegan. <laughs> He would. You better be careful, Andy. The first thing you know, he'll try and sell it to you. It's too late now, Buck. I bought it. <laughs> well, you got a marvelous buy. Well, Andy, now that you're here, stick around because uh, Mary and Phil are going to sing a duet. You might as well hear it. No, I guess I'll go back to the hotel. I like to ride up and down in the elevator. Them things fascinate me. So long, Buck. So long, Andy. <laughs> You know, folks, Andy's getting a terrific kick out of this trip. He's never been east before. He's never even been in a hotel before. How do you know, Phil? I walked in his room this morning, and he was making the bed. <laughs> oh, he'll get by all right. Well, how about that number, kids? Are you ready? I am. Me too. Then swing it and be good now. I want them, I want to be proud of you tonight. Hit it. <laughs> that was The Ladies in Love, sung by Kenny Baker, and very good Kenny. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Hey, wait a minute. Phil and I sang that number. Oh, yes. I'm so nervous. Mary, do I know what I'm doing today? No. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) That no wasn't in the script, folks. (laughs) And now, ladies and gentlemen, in a few more minutes, our little gang will bid you all adieu until next October. Say, Don. Oh, yes, Jack. Just imagine we'll all have 14 whole weeks of rest. Fourteen weeks of nice, carefree relaxation. And fourteen weeks without getting paid. Yay! <laughs> oh, I never thought of that. Say, Jack, I'm getting a little bit jumpy, are you? You mean on account of the premiere of the picture? No, Phil, I'm sure it'll go over big. Why, look at all my friends sitting out in the audience. Sid Block, Ward, Just, Mr. and Mrs. Pritchard, and there's my dad and sister. Don, look at that big smile on my father's face. Yeah, he's sure thrilled. He certainly is. I don't see him. Which one is your dad? The one in Jack's blue suit. <laughs> That's him. I wish he couldn't put on both pair of pants, though. It's warm here. <laughs> Say, Don, you know what I ought to do tonight as long as we're here in Waukegan? What's that, Jack? Well, after all, this is where I started on my musical career, and I think it's no more than right that I play a violin solo. You know. <laughs> you know, my old violin teacher, Charlie Lindsay, is sitting in our audience, and right there in the front row. He just moved to the back row. He did not. <laughs> And now that Charlie is here, I think I ought to play the first number he ever taught me, The Glow Worm. Oh, my goodness, I'm getting out of here. Charlie, come back here. He always was a great kidder, folks. Say, Phil, let me have a violin, will you? Okay. Here you are, Jack. It goes under your chin. I know where it goes. Well, I better tune this fiddle up. Give me an A, boys, will you? Oh, just when I wanted to show off a little. I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Oh, fine. Rochester, how many times do I have to tell you not to interrupt me in the middle of the program? Now, what do you want? Well, boss, I'm tired of being cooped up in this hotel room with Carmichael. Oh, you are, eh? I want to get out in the sun. I'm losing my tan. <laughs> Listen, Rochester. Roger, you'll just have to stay with that polar bear. He's homesick. By the way, is he standing the heat all right? Yeah, but I think you ought to feed him more. All he had for breakfast was three fish, two eggs, and a bottle of milk. Well, my goodness, isn't that enough? I don't think so. I caught him putting marmalade on the bellboy. <laughs> oh, he was just clowning. He was drooling, too. <laughs> Never mind. Now, Rochester, before I forget it, I want you to pack my bags because we're leaving for New York tomorrow. I'm going to see the Louis Galento fight. You won't get shiny pants watching that. <laughs> Oh, so you're still bragging about Joe Lewis, eh? Well, let me tell you something, Rochester. They don't call Galento the Iron Man for nothing. Why, he's got a chin like an anvil. An anvil? Yes. Well, Brother Lewis is going to play the course on it. (laughs) Oh, he is. Well, we'll find out. 
Now get going, and I'll see you right after the premiere. All right. By the way, boss, how am I in the picture? You're very good, Rochester. You'll be a big hit. Now go ahead and pack my bag. Okay, boss, I'll put a man on it right away. <laughs> You'll pack him yourself. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, Mr. Benny. Now what? I meant to ask you something. When we start on our vacation, does that mean I'm off salary for 14 weeks? It certainly does. You're just like me, Rochester. When I don't get it, you don't get it. When you get it, I don't get it. (laughs) Now, Rochester, I don't want to hear another word about it. You'll just have to take care of... Carmichael! Carmichael! What's the matter? I gotta hang up now, boss. Here comes a fat (laughs) bellboy. Between Rochester and Carmichael, I sure have my hands full. Now, let's see. Where was I? You were just about to play a violin solo, Jack. You traitor. Why'd you tell him? Mary. All right, boys, the glow worm. You know, I haven't had much time to rehearse it, folks, but I hope all my Waukegan friends will remember and recognize it. Well, I just tune up a little here. Hmm? All right, boys, give me an introduction to the glow worm, will you? Plink, plink. <laughs> plink, plink. We'll never get back in this town again. All quiet. <laughs> plink, plink. Plink, plink. You can talk plainer than that, brother. <laughs> well. Isn't that awful? Well, thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, I could have done better if I had my own violin. And now for an encore, I will Hey, play... Jack, you haven't got time to play anything. Your picture goes on just a few minutes. What time is it? Oh, yes, you'll have to excuse me, folks. Come on, gang, let's all hurry out in the audience and see it. Gee, I'm excited. Oh, boy, wait till I get a load of me. You, 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 that's all you think of. Oh, stop arguing. Hurry up or we'll miss the picture. Don't worry, they won't start it without me. Where are we going to sit, Jack? Don, where do you generally sit? Come on, kids, let's go, will you? All on, right, buddy. And we'll be back on the air again, the whole gang and myself, next October the 8th. We have just a few minutes before the picture starts, so in the meantime, I'd like to thank my listeners for their fine support during the year, my cast for their splendid cooperation, and I'd also like to thank my authors, Bill Morrow and Ed Beloyne, who worked with me in the preparation of my material. Oh, Jack, can I have a bag of popcorn to eat during the show? Now, Mary, there'll be no crunching during my picture. This is a talkie, not an eating. Good night, folks. Thanks again, and see you next October. (laughs) 